Welcome back to Composite Two Star Recruits, a USC recruiting podcast where a couple of one-star hosts talk about five, four, and three-star prospects and everything in between. I am your one-star host, Chris Trevino, and as always, I'm joined by my podcasting partner in crime, Hurricane Martinez, and you are watching us live. Yes, this is the second live stream of the Composite Two Star Recruits. It was so much fun. Last time for the December signing period, we decided let's run it back for February National Signing Day. Now, it's not as sexy as the December signing period, but we're still going to have some fun. Gerard, we are a little bit late, but that's okay. You are here. You are in studio, and we have a lot of excited people in the chat tuning up to watch us live for who knows how many hours. Who knows? I don't know if five hours really does it for a day where USC only had one commitment, but we do have to review the transfers. We do have to review what's gone on with recruiting, modern day recruiting. I think we have to look at signing day maybe in a different way than we have in the past. So we do have things to talk about. So we'll let that take us where it leads us. I'm trying to get a hold of everything. We're trying to settle in. I know a lot of people are like, you guys are late. Is it like the 15 minute rule in college? If they don't show up, we all get to leave. No. This isn't this is a thing you want to watch. This isn't, you know, a boring economics class. You don't want to be there. This is something you want to watch. So stick around. We are sorry we are late, but we are here. Uh and someone commented, I can't find it now. I got to get used to this. Uh Dennis Cox, Dennis Cox, yes said, "Oh my gosh, I can't remember how to do this." He said, did you remember to hit record? That's not the – I picked the wrong comment. Is Trevino <laughs> looking like he's ready for Big Bear? Yes, thank you for commenting on this. This is way too big for me. But it, it was so golden. It was sitting here on the desk, and I was like, I don't want to wear my blue one. I want to wear this golden thing, this shirt. And I knew Gerard would probably be in his red. So Cardinal and Gold, Cilantro Boys – you know, I, I, I like the way it's going already. <laughs> but someone asked, did I put up the recording? Because I forgot to record. Here it is. I got it working. Dennis Cox said, do you remember to hit press record? Yes. We are recording on Audacity, so the full podcast will be live. I apologize to people that missed the stream last time and were not able to listen to the full thing. I believe we, we I missed about 40 to 30 minutes, so I apologize. But this will be the full recording. This will be the full recording. And, yeah, we might have a special guest. Ryan Abraham might stop by. I think he's running the chat room right now. Um, yeah, I, I'm just excited, Gerard. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen tonight. It looks like you're, you're trying to stir up trouble. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried. No, I, I just <laughs> – we had no idea what to expect for the first show. We went four yeah. hours. It was super fun. We had – so many donations that it blew my mind. We had no idea what to do with it all. We it, it was just we were flabbergasted. We all sent night. Jared to Hawaii. That's what we, we did. Said, we sent <laughs> Jared to Hawaii. Five stars only. Jared Perez. Five stars only. Five stars only. Let's get it correct. CT got his shirt from the year two thousand. That is absolutely correct. This has a very two thousands feel to it. But God damn it, if I don't love it. Um, so I'm gonna be putting up your comments all night. And, you know, shouting out people that if we do get donations, I will be shouting them out. Well, shout out to JP first because he's sick right now. He got sick from probably his Hawaii trip and uh, probably has strep throat right now. So hope you're feeling better. I know that the uh, past couple of days haven't been very good for you. So uh, hopefully least, he's watching. At least it's not COVID, right? I, I guess. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe it feels worse than that. So uh, hopefully he starts feeling better a little bit and we could get him out there to uh, interview only five stars, only five stars. 
That's that's his that's his slogan. That's his motto. That's his nickname, and that's his his way of life. If you if you think about it, <laughs> Gerard, I got an early question for you. Best cheesecake. Oh, best. Cheesecake. You are the one too. Ask Gerard. Best cheesecake. It's so random. I just had to ask you at the top of the show. I have no idea. I I tell you. Um, yeah, I don't know. Che- any cheesecake? <laughs> Is there a bad cheesecake? <laughs> I don't think I there's mean, a bad cheesecake. I don't think there's a a terrible cheesecake like from cheesecake factory i don't know i haven't had a cheesecake factory cheesecake in a long time i think i used to get the banana foster cheesecake i can't remember off the top of my head but um yeah i'm sitting here waiting for the cold open i'm waiting for us to start talking about some football and some recruiting i didn't show up to the beach from the ie and the Santa Ana winds to talk about cheesecake let's go Okay, but before we get into that, we have three donations already off. The <laughs> oh gosh! Shout, shout out to Connor <laughs> Cervantes, ninety nine cents. I love it. Starting <laughs> off ninety nine cents, and then yeah. Moneybags Manford Uh-oh, he's is back. in the he's, building. He's back. The man who should be running USC's NIL collective strategy <laughs> is here. Uh, Manford, can you ask Ryan what the split will be tonight? The oh, Manford my Collective. <laughs> Whatever the split will be, I know that. Uh, YouTube will take 30% of it. That's the only split I know. <laughs> yeah. I have another one from Nate Torres, $4.99. I didn't say Moneybags dropped $4.99 for his first question. Lemon character and baby lemon jumping in the air to do a high five. There you go. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I honestly don't know what that it means. It means thank you guys for showing up. Thank you guys for the support. Uh, it's always appreciated. Uh, just the interest uh, in the site. And hopefully, uh, like Chris said, it's a... Uh, it's a show that uh, we, we were able to give some insight, maybe some entertainment. Uh, we'll have some laughs and maybe we'll shed some tears as well. Uh, and before we get into all that, I know I have to do a couple quick things. First off, thank you to the sponsor of the Parasol Podcast and the whole hub of where our podcasts are hub. That is Trader Joe's. Absolutely. Gerard actually got a $50 gift card to Trader Joe's waiting on his section of the studio when he walked in here today. So, Gerard, oh, I know. I didn't see it. Oh, you didn't see it? I, I thought I said that. But you have to spend <laughs> that wisely. I spent my $50. Well, I just went in there, walked in there, and just tried everything that I ever wanted to try in a Trader Joe's. I got a bunch of raviolis. I got mm. some chicken meatballs. I got some of that delicious pasta sauce. Uh, my girlfriend made her buy her a bottle of wine, uh, apparently, because Trader Joe's has their own wine. They have whatever they want. So, I just went and and I felt like a badass just going in there, just dropping the <laughs> dropping the $50? gift cards. Yeah, just dropping the fifty dollars. You know so what you Ryan, have that. you know what Ryan turned me on to was, and this is great for the Salanto Bros, is the Trader Joe's tamales. Trader Joe's tamales are pretty good. They're they're not traditional. They're very light, but the cheese, uh, I think it's chili verde, very good. Uh, uh, surprisingly good. Um, and, and a little two pack. Throw them in a microwave. I know people are going to say, oh, man, you're one of those guys who eats canned menudo. Yeah, I am. I eat Juanitas. I grew up on it. Sorry. Can't make, you know, menudo from from scratch. Can't make tamales from scratch all the time. If you've got a hankering, uh, they're very good. Very good. Well, there you go. A plug from a cilantro boy for uh, the Trader Joe's uh, tamales. Yeah. We have a you are the one to brought up Trader Joe's gift card giveaway Right now, look, that's above my pay grade, so Ryan is listening <laughs> right now. Ryan, if you got a gift card that we can give away tonight, let's let's do that. You hear me. I know you're listening. I know you're in the chat. So if you can hear us, mm-hmm. let's do a gift card giveaway to Trader Joe's, the uh, the official sponsor of the Parastyle Podcast and the Hub. But you know, Gerard, while we love Trader Joe's, <laughs> there is only one official sponsor to the composite two-star recruits. And if you're a listener of our podcast, our lovely little podcast, you know who the official sponsor is of the composite two-star recruits. Yes, that is the one and only Meredith Schlosser. I have a fancy graphic up on. I finally, you know, I, 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 I'm looking like I know what I'm talking about today. I have a great production going on. Meredith Schlosser and her team. This is the team right here that I always mention in my my reads. Jeremy Hensley? Are we actually seeing yes, Jeremy Hensley Yes, he is right on now? the screen. The oh house god, gosh. Jeremy himself. He helped me move into the house that I <laughs> am in right now. 
top 1.5% of agents in the country by the Wall Street Journal. That is the country, not the West Coast, not California, not LA. That is the country. Over $600 million in total sales, over 200 five-star reviews. Yes, Meredith is the real estate to the stars like Jeannie Buss and to a one-star like myself. So you can literally be have the realtor of Jeannie Buss, president of the LA Lakers, and myself, 10K Chris Trevino. You can literally just say, 10K sent me, and they're going to hook you up. They are so relentless, so tireless at what they do. I literally had my first meeting with Jeremy, and he was like, all right, this is what you want. Within 24 hours, I had a bunch of houses in front of me, and one of those houses I got on the first day was the house I'm living in now. That's how quickly these people can move. So if you're looking to rent, buy, or sell in 2023, you have to go with Meredith Schlosser and her team. I'm going to put their beautiful faces back up on the screen one more time. You have the website right there, MeredithSchlosser.com, and her business Instagram, at Meredith Real Estate. I'm going to be showing this graphic at the top of every every hour as we go through this show. So let's see how many hours we can knock off. Now, Gerard, those were our reads. So you know what time it is. It's time for the cold open. And today's cold open, you know, we could start with the loss that USC took. But I feel like we wanted to start with a good note. I wanted to start with the win that USC took. And that would be USC's pickup of the day. That is four-star Folsom tight end Walker Lions, who USC was big for in the beginning when they got him on campus over the summer for that big golden hour official visit. And the 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 crystal balls, not necessarily the crystal balls, but the the momentum was flowing for USC. We felt very strongly that USC was in a great position for Mr. Walker Lyons, six foot four, two hundred and thirty pounds, consensus four star prospect. But then Stanford came in, made a late push, and they were able to grab his commitment. And obviously, we know what happened with the Cardinal and their program. David Shaw resigning from his position. Walker Lyons decided to resign from his commitment from Stanford and look around again. Georgia was in the mix. Utah was in the mix. USC back in the mix. They made their push down the end. And they were able to get Walker Lyons committed and signed today. He was the first bit of good news that hit the cycle this morning when he dropped his commitment edit online. And USC gets a really nice tight end pickup. The catch is, though, Gerard, is that he is not going to be on the team for next season. There's always a catch. There's always a catch these days. <laughs> and he is going to be taking a Mormon mission out in Norway. Going to Norway. Which, I mean, I've seen people take missions in Michigan and Virginia. But to go to Norway, that's, that's pretty cool. So he's going all the way out there in Europe. And he is expected, though, to be back and en enroll for fall of 2024. So he's only been away from the program for one year. You know, Mormon missions are usually two years, but I think people were saying that because of COVID, they they altered it a little bit uh, in, the, in, in post COVID. So he will be back for the fall of 2024. So they will not have him for one year. It'd be technically be a 2024 uh, prospect. That's when he will enroll, but a very nice pickup for the USC, a future pickup, something they'll have in the back pocket. And Obviously, things could change when he comes back from Norway. We'll see what happens. but Yeah, he can be re-recruited. He can be re-recruited. That happens all the times with Mormon Mission uh, kids. So we'll see what happens after that. But for the most part, a nice little win on signing day for the Trojans, Gerard. Give me your breakdown of Mr. Walker Lyons. Yeah, we felt like this was a coin flip. And some of it did depend on five-star tight end Deuce Robinson and sort of what he was going to do. So originally, we thought that Walker Lyons was going to wait, and he wasn't going to actually announce on signing day. So picking USC wasn't so much of a surprise as that he actually decided to commit today and get it over with. And so, you know, like you said, Chris, committed to Stanford over the summer. He was a part of the big Golden Hour weekend that USC had over the summer in June, that second week in June. And it was interesting because coming away from that official visit, I think I posted something about USC running more 13 personnel in the future, and meaning that they would be running maybe three tight end sets because you already have um, uh, Kate Eldridge, the uh, 6'4", 235-pound uh, tight end athlete slash running back 
uh, from Washington. You know, he committed that first week of June and the first slot of official visits that USC had. He looks like he's going to be a really good H-back pro prospect for USC. USC likes to have the more inline traditional tight end, and then they like to have that guy that's really more of a lead blocker. It's kind of modern-day college football's fullback, uh, but a guy that can also be pretty good in the passing game. So Kate Eldridge played running back in high school uh, at, a, at a small high school in Washington, but um, I think he's, we've talked about before, a very interesting, unique fit. It's sort of uh, a good example of when you've got a three-star or a four-star or five-star, but you look at those rankings and those rankings are made in a vacuum. When you start to look at fit and you start to look at personnel and the playbook and how that particular prospect fits in with that scheme, you look at Kate Eldridge, you go, this guy's a four-star. I mean, this is a guy who can actually run the ball uh, as a potential tight end slash halfback. So he's a very interesting fit, and you pair him now with Walker Lyons. Walker Lyons is more of the traditional inline tight end. You can split him out in the Y. He's used a lot in the Y in the slot in, at Folsom and is a very, very good receiver. Uh, big kid, you know, 6'4", 240. And after that Golden Hour weekend, I posted something on the Peristyle about USC running that 13 personnel because we were hearing that Kate Eldridge, Walker Lyons, and Deuce Robinson were all – Pretty good to go for USC. It sounded very positive for USC. There was a lot of optimism. So USC now, two guys there. I mean, we have two out of three, and Deuce Robinson has yet to make his decision. It would be very ironic if, you know, it came full circle and all those three actually ended up at USC. And here we were talking about USC and that prolific offense that they had last season, but not an offense that utilized the tight end very much, at least not traditionally. So we'll see how that changes. Obviously, USC doesn't have a whole lot of big tight ends, uh, or I should say they don't have a lot of big receivers. They have uh, some good tight ends that didn't get targeted very much, but I think with Walker Lyons, and particularly with Juice Robinson, USC's pitch for them was, we're not just going to use you as a traditional tight end. We're going to put you out there as a receiver. And both these guys, like I said, can split wide. Deuce Robinson's been split wide. Walker Lyons gets split wide. So both of them are more than just your you know, traditional hand in the ground type of tight end. So, um, you know, this came down to USC and Utah. And, you know, Utah obviously has used the tight end very well. They beat USC uh, last year in the first game, basically just throwing to the tight end in the fourth quarter. Uh, so this is a big win for USC. Yes, he's not going to be on campus right away, uh, but you get somebody who is um, going to be here in a year. And I think, you know, from the standpoint of how does the offense sort of change over that year? Uh, you know, is there more uh, evolution using the tight end? It, Lincoln Riley's used the tight end before. Mark Andrews is very successful in his offense at Oklahoma. So it's not like Lincoln Riley doesn't know how to use the tight end position. It's just one of those things that last year, I think, with all the receivers that they had, particularly with Jordan Addison, trying to keep him at a level that's Blitnikoff level. And I think there was a lot of pressure there. And hopefully going forward, there's maybe less pressure, maybe less pressure even on Caleb Williams. Having already won the Heisman Trophy, it's not like, hey, we have to get you the Heisman Trophy and we want to throw the ball. I felt like it was maybe a little forced offensively, some of the play calling, throwing the ball a little more um, downfield uh, and, and trying to use those wide receivers on the edges. So, you know, we're going to see what happens here uh, as, as, as things progress. And Walker Lyons is going to be able to watch it from Norway. He's going to be able to watch USD on TV. And, and like we said, you know, if he has a change of heart, he can actually get out of that commitment. So um, it's, a, it's a good commitment, but it is one of those things that you kind of have to put an asterisk on a little bit. We have a question from Ernesto Gutierrez. Does that comment, does that commitment, excuse me, count for 2023 or when he gets back in two years? That's a good question. Um, I, I think th it does technically count for this year because he signs it, this year. It does initially, and I think that unless something changes, it counts for this year. So it doesn't get counted twice. So it's it really it's it's a moot point in, in terms of that. But um, yeah, I think it would only change if he changed schools in 2024. I think it counts for USC as if uh, he was a part of the 2023 class. For sure. And I did want to note something I forgot to, to mention in my uh, speech about Walker Lyons is that he did miss the basically all of his senior year because he did suffer a season-ending leg injury. I don't know if it was the season opener or the second week or something like that, but he suffered, I believe, a broken leg in a game. So he was pretty much out the entire year. So he was casted up and looks like he's going to be healthy again. Obviously, you know, uh, an injury like that is, is, a, is a broken bone. Those those are much easier to heal and yeah. come back from than, say, uh, but it, it obviously opens up 
the potential of him redshirting anyways. So, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, we're not going to try to compare a redshirt where you're practicing with the team and you're rehabbing uh, with going to Norway. Obviously, he's going to be away from football quite a bit. He's going to try to train a little bit. I mean, at least he's going to Norway and not like a third world country where, you know, you're not necessarily going to have uh, weight room facilities and athletic facilities. People in, um, you know, that part of the world are, are pretty fit, actually. So he might be out there, um, you know, running with uh, some logs on his back or something or doing some, uh, you know, reindeer hunting. I, I don't know what they do in Norway. Hopefully he's not fighting Russians at that point. That's that's uh, we'll cross our fingers with that one. Norway, I feel like every time I randomly stumble upon, you know, those strongman competitions. Yeah. A lot of those guys are from Norway, so I don't know. Maybe he'll come back looking like that. But <laughs> all I'm saying is Norway is a pretty cool place to to land for a Mormon mission. And I had a, I had a question here. Oh, here we go. Uh, Matt Bowman asked, this is just a general question for this show. That is not the question I wanted. I am still trying to get a hold of this. No, come up on the screen. Anyway, I'm just going to read it straight up here. Are you taking questions yes matt we are taking questions <laughs> in general if i see a question that jumps out to me question like I, about taking questions a question about taking questions we are taking questions people have been sending donations to get questions up at the top you don't have to do that but if you donate and ask a question your question is guaranteed to be answered but i also just pull things out that i think are interesting that i would like to ask gerard or if i see a lot of people asking the same question i'll grab it and throw it up there so i hope that answers your question anything else you want to talk about with walker lions or is it time to get into the painful part of the show <laughs> the, the, the one that everyone is just like really getting into the chat with right now i think we kind of have to transition to that part i don't know I, walker lions <clears throat> excuse me good um cmo you break it up <laughs> we're not even an hour in man <laughs> tighten up Walker Lions, good get. Uh, as we say, it's got a little bit of an asterisk to it, but um, I think that time is 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 good for him, and it's good for USC, you know, uh, to 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 get him to heal uh, the injury, and for USC to kind of figure out what they want to do with the tight end position uh, this coming season. I think that um, that uh, the evolution of the offense, you know, we've talked about it before. It's it's going to have to change because Pac-12 defenses are going to kind of figure out a little bit of the tendencies with Caleb Williams. They're going to figure out the tendencies with just the offense in general, and you're going to have to just be good at executing certain things. You're not going to be able to fool people uh, as much. The more you, te you play teams, the more their defenses are going to catch up. So I do think that going, you know, down the line here, as we, we see USC's offense, you're going to have to see different personnel used different ways. And so I, I think this, um, you know, getting a tight end is, is a big deal. And, and like we said, I mean, they could end up, if they get three tight ends, it's this kind of ironic thing in terms of need and what they use and, and what the offense and what the defense really uh, was looking for in this cycle um, compared to, you know, the interior <laughs> defensive linemen and that franchise offensive tackle out of high school that USC just can't seem to land. Uh, but, you know, they don't throw them the tight end, but then they get three tight ends. It would be ironic. It would be ironic indeed. So let's move into the big elephant in the room, the gray cloud hanging over USC fans on national It was a day. beautiful day today. It was a beautiful day. Beautiful I was out day. in the world. I went to Sarah High School. You touched grass today. I touched grass today. And where I touched grass the most was at Sarah High School when I went for Mr. Roderick Pleasant's signing day event, which was in his home gym at Sarah High School and broadcasted live on ESPN. And there was a bunch of people there, a bunch of students, a bunch of reporters. Everyone wanted to know where was Roderick Pleasant going, four-star cornerback, top 10 cornerback prospect in the 2023 class. One of USC's big remaining fish out there and someone they had been working on for a long, long time. If you recall, Roderick was one of those prospects that Lincoln Riley brought in early for that small, intimate, uh, elite uh a prospect day when he first got on campus, he, there were about 12 guys. Roderick Pleasant was one of those. We saw Roderick Pleasant take multiple unofficial visits to campus. He's obviously an elite track prospect, so track was also going to play heavy into his decision. We know USC has a really good men's uh, program, top sprinters. So, you know, on paper, everything was great. USC was in a great position when you're looking at it from Roderick Pleasant's point of view, but obviously there were other schools that wanted Roderick Pleasant as well. The final five came down to USC. 
UCLA, Boston College, and Oregon and Cal. Did I forget Cal? Cal, Cal in there as well. And but for the for the most part, this felt really like USC and Oregon. That was the two main contenders here in the very end. UCLA in there a little bit, but it came down to these Pac-12 rivals. And in the end, the Ducks beat the Trojans out again on a national signing day, giving shades of Mateo Uyunglele. I nailed it that time. There you go. Nailed it that time. And, yeah, it's another loss to the Ducks. Roderick Pleasant was someone that a lot of USC fans would have loved to have in terms of, you know, a dynamic cornerback out of Sarah High School, USC Pipeline School, Need more speed on the defense. Would have brought that in droves. And here we are talking about a, a loss. And I had a, a $1.99 donation from Nate Torres. Where did we go wrong with Pleasant? And that's sort of a big picture question, philosophical question that I'm just going to throw Gerard on the bus and throw it to him. <laughs> Where did we go wrong? Johnny Cochran Gerard. Uh, <laughs> to the rescue. Hey, no. Don't worry, I have experience with this through the Clay Helton era. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting because there was a little bit of a theme for some of these prospects in this cycle where USC had garnered an early lead over the summer and then seemed to lose that lead despite an 11 win season. So I think we got to look at bigger picture here again. Signing day is different because of the transfer portal. Okay, so that's one of the big things. It, it, you're supplementing so much of the additions to your team each cycle with transfers. And those transfers, nine times out of ten, are looked at as immediate impact players more so than the guys that you get out of high school. Roger Pleasant is a good cornerback. He definitely is raw. He's definitely got to develop more. Um, but, you know, he's he's – playing two different sports and he's going to continue to play two different sports in college so when you're going to split your time like that it's it's difficult you know to sort of hone in on your craft a little bit at some point in time he's going to have to make that decision am i a sprinter am i going the track route or am i a football player now to be clear he is a good football player he's not just a track guy uh, he definitely is physical. You know, he always came to play. He was always involved, whether he played offense or defense for Sarah. So it wasn't necessarily one of those things that, you know, he's a track guy that just plays football. But in terms of the development, he's going to have less time to be able to develop. And he needs that development as a football player going forward. Uh, I think, it, you know, for USC, it was interesting because – they did lose out on some of those players, and we talked about the 11 win season and how sometimes recruiting lags a year behind results on the field. And so we talked about this, I think, on the last live show when we were talking about the early signing period, and, and USC loses out on Mateo Ungalale, and we're wondering, okay, so like is signing day just not a thing for USC anymore, or is this something else that's going on with the with the recruiting staff? Or is it something in terms of just that everybody talks about recruiting lagging a little bit be behind the production on the field? And I think with the production on the field, it's the first 11-win season USC has had in a very long time, basically a decade. Uh, it's the only time that they've really been um, nationally even in the conversation about possibly being in the college football championship. Um, you have to go back to that Rose Bowl in 2016. And even then, USC sort of backed into that Rose Bowl. They had a great season after starting out one and three. So this was a very different year for USC. And I think that a lot of these kids locally, uh, they've been hearing all about Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. Oregon's been more successful over that period of time. You know, coming away from the Chip Kelly era and then, you know, transitioning into Mario Cristobal. You know, they haven't always been the most dominant team in the Pac-12. But overall, I think in that, 10 year span, uh, they've probably been the best team in the Pac-12. So, you know, between Nike sort of using Oregon as as their, you know, their their display case and and all of that money that gets poured in there by by Nike, um, I think, you know, with NIL and everything else going on, this is basically the results that you're seeing. You're seeing that kids that grew up in that era and started following college football don't necessarily know and see USC for what it used to be, but rather for what it was, you know, just a few years ago. And so I think USC is still battling that, but it also opens up the question of, you know, with just the cornerback position uh, where USC is, because obviously, you know, we've known, we've talked about Dante Williams being an elite recruiter 
you know, year in and year out. And every stop he's been at, whether it's Nebraska or Arizona, it doesn't matter. He's been an elite recruiter. And at some point during the end of last year, you know, he took some interviews and he took a job interview with UNLV. And people go, okay, well, I mean, of course, you know, he wants to be a head coach, so he's going to take those job interviews. But now it starts to become a little more of a question again is, you know, what's his future with the coaching staff? Because you had Warren Roberson. They also missed out on him today, uh, the six foot, 195-pound uh, cornerback slash safety from Red Oak uh, High School in Texas. And he didn't actually announce – I shouldn't say that. I mean, he actually didn't announce – um, we think he's probably going to end up at Texas. I guess technically right now he's still committed to TCU. Has he actually publicly decommitted from TCU, Chris? I don't I think don't, so. I don't believe that has yeah. happened. He's so still floating out there. They had, <laughs> they had a snow day. They had a snow day. In Texas. In, in Texas. So they canceled school today. Um, the expectation was that he was going to announce for Texas today. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the gods are smiling on USC and, and they get a, 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 a uh, a stay of execution here and, and are able to do something because they lost out on Roderick Pleasant. But the expectation was another guy that USC over the summer had a lead for and, you know, we're very confident for, but we're not able to like close the deal with him. You know, it, it became from what I understand a little bit behind the scenes. Uh, mom was just really hesitant about him going out of state. And so TCU had a great run, had a great season. They're local. It just kind of added up for him. Um, but then, you know, TCU has, I think, four guys that are uh, committed uh, that are safeties. From what I understand, USC has always looked at him as more of a boundary corner, maybe a nickelback. So I don't know that TCU was recruiting him strictly as a safety either, but they did actually already sign four other guys in that class. And I think, you know, that 65 <laughs> point pacing that they got from Georgia, those type of games really hurt you. When you go in front of a national television audience and you know, you're TCU and you're introducing yourself to a lot of the casual football fans, a lot of casual sports fans, and you go out there and you get absolutely rinsed by Georgia, and that hurts your recruiting. I it, mean, it's like it erases some of the great things that you did during the season. You don't want to lose late in the season. That is another thing for USC, that this is a kind of a weird season for them in that they win 11 games, but for the first time in I can't remember how long, they lost their last two games. Usually when USC has a double-digit win season, it's because they, they finish strong. You know, maybe they, they have a couple bumps in the road. Mid-season, you know, they'll lose a weird game to Cal or Oregon State, uh, or they start off the season slow. But with this season, it was like, you know, they got going, and all of a sudden they lose their last two games. And obviously they the last They should have won game, the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so that's also something that you have to think about a little bit with USC. They didn't necessarily on the field have all that – momentum you know that that translates into recruiting but I think they are still sort of a year behind and getting those kids to buy in early and a lot of the kids you know locally like I said have been thinking about Oregon and Oregon being like the premier school and certainly you know as I already talked about a little bit with with Nike and how they're supplementing Oregon USC has to figure out their NIL situation because we've seen them go through the boulevard phase and you know we're not sure how that's going to work going forward but we know there's going to be some pretty big changes here, and that's already in the process, and I, I don't want to get too much into that because I think that's still, you know, being worked it, worked out, but, you know, that, that, that speaks for itself. It's, it's still being worked out, and um, that's going to be something that we have to see how that affects the recruiting process going forward. So there's a lot of things to kind of talk about, uh, you know, bigger picture, and, and, and again, I think the thing with Dante Williams is a bit of a question because, I mean, he has been so good. He himself has been so successful. He's created expectations with the fan base that, you know, they're going to get their guys at defensive back. But, you know, they went through um, Braxton Myers. And I know people are going to say Braxton Myers, that's a safety. And he's Alex Grinch's recruit. But, you know, he had a really good relationship with Dante Williams. Roberson has a really good relationship with Dante Williams. And it was, you know, Tyler Scott and all these guys. So, yeah, that's that's something that came up, I think, in the early signing period. And it's something that's going to be talked about, I think, going forward. Um, they did get out of the porthole Christian Roland Wallace. So, I mean, that was a big get. And, and we know he had a, a pretty good relationship with Dante Williams. So, you know, I, I'm not here to tell you what's happening. I'm just saying that there's speculation there. And that speculation is going to continue uh, because of, you know, uh, losing a guy like Roderick Pleasant who, I mean, if you would have told me 10 months ago, USC wins 11 games and they lose Roderick Pleasant, I would have said no way. I would have laughed and said that that's the last guy that I think they would have would have lost. Uh, but we know that, you know, in the last few weeks, 
it's been pretty tight with Oregon. You know, it was it was definitely we. I think I gave them a sixty percent chance to As USC, I. and I, I I just felt like you know through it all, he has so many people close to him that are uh, USC alums, uh, influences that are very pro USC. I think that it's going to end up being USC. I think he's going to go back and forth, and I've heard you know a lot of things from different people that it could be Oregon, could be USC. I just kind of thought that it would end up USC because of how far back you know he goes with USC, but you know it didn't happen. So it is one of those things where you know um, USC's kind of have to look at this uh, in all these different ways. There's various different aspects of this when you talk about NIL and you talk about the recruiting leg, and then you talk about. Um, you know, if there's anything, you know, changing with the coaching staff going forward. Before we jump back into Roger Pleasant, we continue this conversation. I have several donations that I need to get to throw these up on the screen. I have a dollar donation from, if I can uh, figure out how to do this. I had a dollar donation from Roman 388 and then Roman 38 also donated 149 and it just says purple cat. And then I realized that that is actually an animated GIF on the back end. So the lemon thing I read earlier, that was a, it describes what the the little fun GIF is. That's why I look crazy reading that. But in the back end, it's a, so in the back end, I can see a little purple cat. So Gerard's looking at me okay. like I'm crazy. Yeah, you, you, I don't know. You don't know. Thank you, Roman. <laughs> well, yes, thank you, Roman. I have a super donation from Silver Shadow 48 donated Four ninety nine. Thank you so much, Silver Shadow. No comment. Just wanted to donate. Uh, I got another drop here from Moneybags uh, Manford. Uh, no question. I just appreciate the show. I haven't missed one episode. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you, Moneybags Manford. And then finally, right now, I have one from James Holguin. I hope I said that right. Uh, donated ten dollars nine ninety nine. Uh, it's a cilantro party. And that's all he wanted to say. So, yes, it is certainly a cilantro party when the cilantro boys are in the house. Thank you so much it's for Paris all. Style Pol- uh, Pizzoli party? Pizzoli party? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, just, just keep them coming for all these uh, Mexican bits that we can do. We have over 500 people watching, so thank you so much. If you're there, please hit that like button. We have 92 likes right now. My goal was 150. Uh, I feel like we can get 150. So I, I'd be really appreciated if you could hit us a like. Help the help the channel grow a little bit. So only like it if you like it. Sure, but don't why, let why Chris. <laughs> don't let me peer pressure you. <laughs> I'm not peer pressure. I just I just want them to like it. You're just begging. I just want them Please to like it. Please like us. Speaking of begging, going back to to Roderick Pleasant, <laughs> when I was sitting, you could tell because I was there as I mentioned. You could tell it was a very awkward. Maybe not awkward, no. but it was a very Contentious? Uh, not contentious. It was just a very difficult decision. He looked very stressed yeah. when he was up there. And we see that sometimes. You know, sometimes a kid looks super carefree when he goes up there. It's like, yep, I know what I'm doing. And Roderick looked very te- uh, stressed or anxious. Like, this was definitely weighing on him. And I happened to be sitting with a couple of what I assumed I believe were family members, extended family members, family members not up at the table with him on ESPN sitting in the stands and they were talking about how, you know, Roderick was very stressed about this decision, you know, going into last night and there was a lot of back and forth and yeah. people calling people as late as 1 a.m. to be like, he he's stressed out, doesn't really know what's what's going to happen. And that's was one of those recruitments that really came down to the end with USC and Oregon. So a tough loss. But Gerard, I just wanted to ask how big of a loss is it yeah because it is i don't want to say it's not a big loss but it is from an optic standpoint because it is to oregon and it is an elite prospect in your backyard not necessarily a prospect you really needed at cornerback you have a lot of talented cornerbacks i you, i don't think you're gonna have trouble getting cornerbacks in at all um even though people are gonna point out well, what about roger pleasant but yeah I, you can't get roger pleasant who are you getting <laughs> They're going to be able to have to get cornerbacks, whether that's through the cor- the transfer portal or through the high school ranks. This is just one they they could not bring in, and so I, it's not like it's a defensive tackle. Uh, you know, the argument is certainly there that Mateo was a much bigger loss in terms of need, and it being a powerhouse at Bosco, where you just can't can't seem to quite break in yet. 
And Sarah being a USC pipeline school also, yeah. you know, throws into my optics argument that it's a worse optics look than it is maybe personnel loss. But how big are you able to say this loss is? Yeah, it's not huge because, I mean, need is always going to affect the grade uh, more than anything else. You know, if you need that player, then the optics are the optics. But the need is what are you getting on the football field? Who are you trying to replace? And so I think Roderick, like I said, he has some development time ahead of him. He's not a guy that you're going to throw on the field right away as a quarterback. You could use him potentially right away in the kick return game. And I think that's, you know, a loss because USC's consistency there with kick returners is a bit, uh, you know, sort of up in the air, a little mixed bag. That's true. They've got some talented guys, but they could definitely use another guy with 10-1-4 speed. I think I agree that optics-wise, it's not good. It wasn't good with Mateo Oyungalile, and it's not good with Roderick Pleasant. And it's also not good that Oregon can get their foot in the door in Sarah with a guy that's been, you know, sort of a long time Trojan lean because I know having spoken to Jason Mitchell Jr. and having spoken to Dakota Fields or the two underclassmen they have for the 2024 class at Sarah that they like Oregon a lot. In fact, Dakota Fields, I think if he had to commit today would probably go to Oregon over USC. He's going to be a guy that could be a national recruit camped at USC. He grew a lot closer with the USC coaching staff from that camp, but he still likes Oregon a lot. And I think Jason Mitchell is a guy that likes Oregon a lot. And I think Oregon's going to push there in Sarah a lot. So from that standpoint, you know, you allow Oregon to maybe get a little more traction into a pipeline school than they've had in years past. But as you said before, in terms of need, yeah, I mean, we look at the cornerback position. Uh, we have a scholarship you know, chart breakdown that Ryan does. It's you know, very good about kind of getting a better idea in terms of eligibility, what the impact would be of these recruits. And, I mean, you've got Prophet Brown there. You've got Sierra Wright, who's still a, a freshman. who will be a sophomore next year. Fabian Ross is there, and you've got Damani Jackson. So they're all freshmen. That's just your freshman class. Then when you look at who's got sophomore eligibility, Josh Jackson is still there. We're not really sure what's going to happen with Josh Jackson. There was some talk like maybe he was going to transfer out as well. This is a guy that at one point we penciled in as a potential starter for USC a couple years ago. But injuries and what have you, he hasn't really seen the field very much. But he's still there. Um, you've got uh, Jacoby Cup who came in uh, last year as a transfer, who was a you know potential starter at Washington. So you've got a very heavy underclassman group there uh, that is starting to transition to upperclassmen. You have some of those guys that um, are, are, are developing, like Latrell McCutcheon, who's played a lot of nickel position. You know, he's a guy that was originally was recorded, uh, recruited as a corner at Oklahoma. When he transferred in, he played mostly nickel for USC. So, I mean, there's still a lot of youth in that defensive back group. USC does use really, you know, three safeties in two corners is, is really how it looks like. And I've talked a lot about maybe with the linebacker improvement and upgrades that they've made, maybe you can move Eric Gentry out from that Mike position and put him over at a sort of nickel backer position. So that would, you know, maybe put less stress on your defensive back position. But in general, I mean, they've got some guys here and they've got some talent. You know, we all want to see what can Prophet Brown could do because he's a guy that he doesn't have – Roderick Pleasant speed, but he certainly is a football player. One of those guys that, you know, when you watched him in high school was equally as impressive. So, you know, you want to see those type of guys develop because that shows you the coaching and it shows you that you can bring in uh, whoever and you're able to mold them and get them to be productive. And ultimately, you know, that's what the coaching staff is there for. They're able to develop those guys and you don't necessarily just need guys with 10-1-4 speed to, to cover people. I actually had a question because – when you were speaking about the cornerbacks and such, someone wanted your opinion on uh, Malachi Crawford, the incoming freshman that is right. coming in now. Six foot three, definitely a very different player. Excuse me. Then, <coughs> whoo, this is live, so I can't cut that. <laughs> a, a very different player than uh, uh, Roderick Pleasant. Yeah. Uh, lanky, very long. What were your thoughts on We saw him many times uh, at the. Uh, seven on seven level and a couple times in the season i believe yeah moves incredibly well for a guy that's legitimately six three almost six four so he's a, a big long kid i think more of a safety potential up at the line of scrimmage as he as he bulks up as he gets bigger 
but a guy that you can definitely put on the outside if you've got a big receiver. So he's a matchup guy. I mean, he's a guy that you have that's tall, long. You really don't have a guy that kind of that big that can actually play on the outside uh, against a bigger receiver. But I think as time goes on, there's potential for him moving inside and being, you know, kind of a, a, a like a like a nickel backer, nickel safety type of guy that plays over the slot. Again, it depends on what the opposing team's personnel is. If they're playing their tight end out there in the Y, then a guy like uh, Malik Crawford is, is great. I mean, you're, you're talking about legitimate, you know, 6'4", 200 pounds. That's going to help them a lot as opposed to, you know, right now they've been using Max Williams there. Max Williams... Phenomenal football player. We've always talked about Max Williams. I mean, he's 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 amazing. The fact that he's playing as well as he's playing now after two ACLs is, is incredible. He is a football player's football player's incredible instincts, but he's 5'8". He's 5'8 on a good day, and you got him going against tight ends. It's a tough matchup for him, and it's a tough matchup for the defense in general. So when you get a guy like Malik Crawford in there who's a legitimate 6'3 and a half, 6'4", you know, that changes things a lot when you're having to see those bigger receivers or you're seeing those tight ends in the slot. So I think he is a really good matchup guy, and you kind of put him depending on what the offense is doing. And so the offense is using a lot of guys in the slot that are bigger and taller. I think you can move him up near the line of scrimmage and have him play that. Otherwise, you move him back. I don't think he would be a boundary corner or certainly not a field corner, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. You know, you don't want to put too much doubt on the kid. I mean, we haven't seen that much of him. He's up there in Oxnard, so we didn't really get to see him play in person uh, in full games and what have you. But um, I think just watching him on film, I think that, you know, he's definitely going to put on a little bit more weight, and we're going to have to see how that affects his flexibility to be able to play out there on the edge. Otherwise, I think you move him inside over the slot or you have him play off the line of scrimmage and then move up maybe a, a, a strong side linebacker, or excuse me, safety. Um, again, depending on the personnel and, and, you know, if you're playing against an Oregon, you're playing against the UCLA, you're playing against Utah. Uh, we'll see what Stanford does offensively. Pac-12 is very balanced in terms of run pass. You know, everybody thinks about the pass and the quarterbacks with the Pac-12. Uh, but I tell you, you know, Lincoln Riley is going to have to do more. Uh, and the defense, you know, his defense with Alex Grinch is going to have to do more in terms of adjusting to playing against teams that have some power football elements as opposed to just sort of the wide openness that, you know, he won a lot of conference championships at the Big 12 with. The Big 12 eventually sort of started to play a little more balanced. I think, you know, with Iowa State being successful, some other teams started to run a bit a little bit more. But for a lot of years there, man, Big 12 was completely spread open, Air Raid City, whereas the Pac-12 has always sort of been a little bit balanced. And if you look at the teams that have been dominant in the modern era of the Pac-12, I mean, we go from what? We go from Chip Kelly's Oregon, which liked to spread it out, but it was a run-oriented option offense. And then you transition into Stanford, and Stanford was, you know, that was complete bully football. You know, they had three tight ends, Jim Harbaugh, and then they sort of transitioned to, to David Shaw, who kept some elements of that and, and were still a, basically a run team. And then Mario Cristobal comes in at Oregon, and he wants to play bully football and be sort of a pro-style type of offense with, you know, the offensive line emphasis. And now, you know, with UCLA having Chip Kelly, then, again, we're at a run-oriented type of team. I mean, Utah's been dominant lately. Utah is a run-oriented team. So, you know, the thought is the Pac-12 is very finesse and likes to throw the ball, but, you know, you don't, you might need to be putting a little bigger players in some of these positions when you've got slots and what have you because just because they spread you out doesn't mean they're not going to run the football down your throat. Gerard, I got some donations in that I think you're going to be interested in. Oh, okay. I think you're going to be interested in. I got one from Aesop FO, uh, $10.00. An original herder always appreciate your efforts. Lunch parentheses for one of you on me, Gerard. I'll let you have it. Stand and be heard. Stand and be heard. And then, Gerard, I got a big one for you. I got a hundred dollar donation. Wow. From Roderick W. Moore Sr. Uh, keep up the good work, gentlemen. And I don't want to like b blow his identity right now, but he is actually sort of a celebrity to me at least. And I don't want to blow his, his, his uh, identity out there, but if, if he puts in the chat that I can, he's actually <laughs> a big deal, a very big deal to me. So thank you so much to Mr. Roderick. Thank w. you very Moore much, Senior. Roger. We were talking about Roderick Pleasant. He decided to uh, change was, the narrative I was say, there a you little go. bit. He decided to change the narrative and drop a hundred dollar donation. So thank you so much. For those two donations, really appreciate it. And we reached 150 likes, Gerard. We're up awesome. to 155. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much to over 500 people watching us live. 
uh, very, very much appreciated. So there we are with Roderick Pleasant. USC can still, you know, right now USC's class is number 12 in the high school rankings, what we call the composite rankings, because that is based off the composite uh, 24-7 sports composite rankings. They are number two in the transfer class. We're going to talk a little bit more about the transfers uh, further down the show. And when you factor in composite and transfer class, they are number eight in the country. They finished number six last season, thanks to the number one transfer class. Obviously, it was not a very high composite class, high school class, because you know they oh, only seven. signed seven <laughs> kids. Lincoln Riley had maybe three weeks to kind of hustle together and duct tape a class together. Still ended up getting some good guys, but still finished with the top 10 class when you look at it from overall factoring both now, of those sides. Now, here's something, Chris. Okay. To interrupt you here. Do it. Lincoln Riley said he wanted to definitely put more emphasis on high school kids for the 2023 cycle. I mean, stands to reason you only signed seven. So I guess, you know, you signed eight. That's putting more emphasis. But do you think at face value that they did put more emphasis or do you see – that the temptation out of the portal is hard to resist. Getting guys that you know are going to be able to come in and potentially replace guys that you're losing right away. I think, sorry, I'm trying to get our layer back. I think, yeah, I think it was both. I think it was a little bit of column A and column B. They definitely put more emphasis on the high school ranks because there was definitely some guys that they really, really wanted. You know, Attack at Curtis, uh, Braylon Shelby, some big offensive linemen. Amos Talele, Elijah Page. There are guys they really, really wanted out of the high school ranks, but you never know what is going to pop up into the transfer portal, and it could be a guy that can absolutely help you now as opposed to a guy you have to spend three years to develop or two years to develop and get. If you get three years. If you get three years, you never know because maybe that player leaves. Yeah. Or maybe, yeah. CJ Williams There's a good example. There's a great example. So – there's always the temptation of what's out there. It's sort of like greener on the other uh, – what's uh, – Grass is greener on the other side. Grass is greener in the portal. Sometimes that is the case. Uh, but sometimes it's the case of, you know, you still have to develop players out of the high school ranks. So I think it was a little bit of both. I think it was definitely more – I think you can see my hand – more high school and a little bit less of the portal. But it still felt like – they knew they they still needed portal help. They still needed to upgrade a bunch of positions. And the fastest way to do that is through the portal, through the secondary market. And so I think it was a little it was just a little bit more and a little bit down on both sides. But for the most part, portal was still very, very much important. And we're only through the first window of the portal. Right. The portal opens back up May first. So May first through fifteenth after spring football. During that May evaluation period, you're going to have that portal open up again. So we'll see. Do you expect a bigger rush? No, and I don't think so. Uh, it's obviously dependent on what you lose. If you have a mass exodus of players that leave from spring, then you know you have to scramble and you're going to have to bring in more players maybe than you thought originally. But if we look back to last season, you know the initial rush was bigger than the final rush. And there was a lot of names that were floating around out there post-spring that were potential impact players that might be leaving. Uh, Jordan Addison was actually on the back end. Eric Gentry was on the back end. Those guys were guys that came in after spring football. So, you know, there are big-time players that could potentially end up in that porthole for the second window that uh, we don't even know about right now. And so, yeah, we look at the high school period and I agree with you. It was sort of a little bit of both. There was definitely more emphasis in 2023 on high school players. And the argument would be made, listen, it's great that you can bring in guys that are immediate impact players. In fact, it's really, really great because those guys you bring in, you don't necessarily have to worry about turning around and transferring. As I kind of alluded to, one of the issues with the high school kids, in addition to having to project them, you also have to know that you got to play them early because if you don't play them after the first year or so as five stars, then you probably end up like Texas A&M. And then half your class is gone. And you have the great historic recruiting class. And then half those guys leave the next year. USC was the recipient of one of those players that left Texas A&M in the portal. So 
that's one of those things that, you know, there's a lot of arguments to be made. Why waste your time messing around with high school kids when you don't really know what you're going to get? But I think the argument for is culture. The argument is when you have a mercenary sort of squad, you're always going to try to be, you know, you're always trying to juggle that with all these different personalities and these guys that weren't in the program originally. And you do have the potential of possibly bringing in guys in the program that don't mix well. Now, I know that's part of the evaluation process, and Lincoln Riley has talked about that. Like, if you're coming in as a transfer, then you need to be team-oriented. It's team first. But some guys, you know, they look like that, and they talk the talk, and all of a sudden you get them in the locker room, and things sort of change because they're not getting the ball enough. So you kind of have to know that that's a potential that – it can mess your season up a little bit with chemistry in the locker room. Uh, whereas you get guys with high school, yeah, they can do that. But if you're getting freshmen, if you're getting guys out of high school and they're freshmen, then, you know, they're going to have to go through that process. They're going to have to, you know, kind of wait their turn What if, if, if you know, you can – keep them patient enough, uh, but they should be humbled a bit coming in and you can mold them maybe a little more than you can the transfer that's coming in that wants to, you know, be one and done sort of thing. So, you know, there, there's arguments for both ways, you know, to bring in more heavy recruiting classes that are high school kids as opposed to transfers. I would say that, you know, with Alabama and Georgia and the schools that have been at the college football playoff consistently, Ohio State's in that conversation as well. They have cherry picked. And and I saw an interesting comment where somebody on ESPN2 during the Roderick Pleasant, or maybe it was just right after the Roderick Pleasant announcement. And, and you know signing day starting to lose its luster a little bit when they don't even put it on ESPNU, but it's on ESPN2. The casuals are like, what? What is this? I think they talked about how the transfer portal is going to bring parity. And I think at face value, you could say that. But I don't think we've necessarily seen that. I think we've seen Alabama sort of expound the roster from guys that they don't really want and get better players and, and, and go out there and get guys like Henry Tooto, you know, who's an all-SEC linebacker. They've gone out and they've cherry-picked some guys that they really wanted, and I think they've kind of let guys that they didn't want sort of weed themselves out. The same thing with Georgia and Ohio State. You don't see them picking up a ton of transfers, and you don't necessarily see them losing guys that they really want to lose either. So I don't know if these teams that are mid-majors or what have you where these guys are leaving, they're going to these other schools. I mean, USC picked up a couple of Alabama players, and certainly with uh, Ishmael Sopcher, that was kind of a bust for USC. So I think those schools know what they're doing, and they're not letting the really good players leave, the really good players that can actually make an impact for other schools and get them to a point where they can actually compete uh, at, at the same level as in Alabama, Georgia. So the argument there, you know, from looking at what is working for those teams is that you continue to bring in, bring in bigger high school uh, classes than just go out and, and bring in dozens of transfer portal guys. Absolutely. And I have a bunch of things to juggle right now. Nope. I feel like that's the, the process of this. You talk for a long time, a bunch of things happen on the back end, and then I have to uh, get everyone caught up to what's happening. So first update, <laughs> uh, uh, Roderick Moore Sr. gave me the green light to... To, to dox him? To, do to dox him. He is, in fact, uh, the father of Grammy award-winning artist Roddy Rich. A, a rapper from Compton, California, uh, artist from Compton, a very popular with the with the youths. Um, I, there might be people who don't know who that is. That's you can Google him, Roddy Rich. That's with two C's, by the way. Uh, I referred to uh, Mr. Moore as Papa Rich sometimes. I do not know if he approves of that nickname. I don't <laughs> have that on record. So maybe we'll find out in a little bit. Uh, we do have a new donation. That I wanted to get here. Okay, there's too many now. Uh, one here from uh, Moneybags Manford once again, throwing it up here. How will USC's move to the Big Ten Conference impact their recruiting strategies? And then I have another one from Marcus Wilson, another $10 donation from Any Chance We Sign Any Good Preferred Walk Ons. Gerard, we're going to go back to Moneybags Manford question about Big Ten impacting the recruiting strategy because I want to jump into these preferred walk-ons real quick. USC did offer a couple of preferred walk-ons recently this week out of Calabasas. Kalon Miller, a lineman, and then King Miller, a running back. And a little bit interesting because 
uh, I believe King Miller actually posted that he was committed to Portland State, and then he deleted it. And now Calabasas Athletics has posted today that uh, Kayla Miller and King Miller both signed with USC today. Yeah. So I believe USC has a couple of new preferred walk-ons in King Miller, a six foot, two hundred pound running back. Ran for a lot of yards last year, I believe around 1,600 to 1,700 with a bunch of touchdowns. I think it's a great pickup. Uh, I think USC needs more scout team running backs. Uh, Well, they'll have more scout team running backs, even in the scholarship chart. Even in the scholarship, (laughs) absolutely. They'll have more of that. But sometimes you don't want to bang up those freshmen too much. But you would like to get them some carries on the scout team. But King Miller, I think, is going to be a good addition for the scout team and maybe a special teams contributor down the line. And then Kalon Miller... A little bit undersized, six foot one, 250 pounds, had 27 tackles for a loss, five sacks, very productive uh, in that league. Uh, I believe he led the team in tackles as well. I believe that was around 80. Sorry if my numbers are slightly off, but I know he had a bunch of tackles for a loss. Again, six foot one, 250 pounds. I don't know how accurate that is, but that's obviously got to get that weight up if he's going to be playing uh, offensive line or defensive line. Not sure on which side of the ball he's going to be playing on. But I think those are two really nice preferred walk-on additions. And then from Calabasas. US, from Calabasas. Home of Aaron Butler, who just recently decommitted. From who did USC. just recently decommit. Four-star. So USC got some, some former teammates on the roster recruiting the 2024 former commit Aaron Butler. So. And then USC also offered Tyler Robles, who we've talked about on the show, a kicker out of San Diego. Pretty good leg. I believe his career long is about 52 yards. Really good at, at touchbacks. He was the CIF, CIF leader in touch, touchbacks as a senior. And Lincoln Riley specifically said they need better touchback production on special teams. So I believe Tyler is a play to upgrade that. And he was offered as a preferred walk-on. He took an unofficial visit to USC this past weekend for their final kind of junior day visit. So that's something we're going to monitor. USC is his Biggest preferred offer right now, uh, preferred walk-on offer. So yeah. USC could be adding a kicker here very shortly. So a preferred walk-on. So right now they do have two out of Calabasas. Could be three with a special teams addition, which I think could be a guy who could absolutely be your kickoff specialist and possibly push Dennis Lynch to be the the, the place kicker for next season. So always want to add more competition. And usually with kickers, you're usually kind of going the preferred walk-on route. Chase McGrath was a preferred walk-on. Yeah, they earned their scholarship, you know, by being on the team as walk-ons and kicking. Yeah, this isn't the John Baxter era where everybody <laughs> gets a gets a kicking scholarship. Long, so long snappers, too deep, too deep, <laughs> three deep sometimes. So yeah, Tyler Robles, just remember that name could be the next preferred walk-on that joins uh, the team. And then going back to Moneybags Manford's question, the which, Big Ten, the Big Ten. What will he be called, Chris? <laughs> Will it be called the Big Ten still, or are we going to the Big Conference? Some, it's just going to be the Big Conference. The big Conference, yeah. How is USC's recruiting strategy going to evolve going into the Big Ten? Well, I think it could potentially evolve in being more run oriented uh, offensively uh, because you're going to play some weather games. You're going to play some games in Michigan in November. You're going to play some games potentially in Columbus in November, and. You know, you don't know how well you're going to be able to throw the ball around. Now, we've talked about just the offense evolving because of the available personnel that will be a, that will be in the 2024 class on the offensive line. Guys like DeAndre Carter, uh, guys like Brandon Baker, uh, Modern Day, uh, St. John Bosco. They've got some really good young offensive linemen in 2024 classes, 2025 going into 2026. They got some big guys. Now, they're mostly interior offensive linemen. But then you combine that with what USC got with this past class in 2023. And the 2023 offensive line recruiting class was very good. You know, you get Elijah Page, 6'7", 305 pounds. You get Alani Noah, 6'4", 6'5", 330 pounds. You get uh, Amos Telelele, 6'5", 330 pounds. You're getting some big boys. You are upgrading in terms of your size and the ability to just straight up G block, right? Just to just to get upfield and just push people out of the way, as opposed to maybe having to move guys around and, and having a more athletic offensive line. Now, you know, Lincoln Riley likes to run that GT counter. He likes to run those guards tackles where they both pull, and you've got to have some mobility there. It's going to be interesting to see what they do with Ethan White. We talked about this on the podcast last week. Ethan White, 
and used to be 400 pounds, right? Now he's down to what? Is, what is he down officially to? Uh, 340, like 340, 350, 330. Actually, 331, I think, was his official roster weight for Florida. So yeah, I would he, say 330, 335, whatever. He looked a little bigger than that, but mobility wise, you know, I don't know how much you want to bring him from one side of the offensive line to the other side of the line as a pulling guard. I think he can do it, but I don't know if you want to do as much of it because. I think he's a guy that you can just get straight forward with. And that's sort of the mentality of the offensive line, the physicality of the offensive line, the size of the offensive line. I think it's actually going to be much better in the Big Ten. Um, but I think it's going to be much better even if they weren't going in the Big Ten because I think they're going to be able to play more with the mentality. We know you know what we're going to do. We're going to do it anyways. Because like I said – eventually somebody's going to figure out you're going to come across the team and either you offensively are playing flat you know you, you've got an injury with your starting quarterback there's a lot of things that can happen offensively that can hurt a really potent offense and you've just got to do what you do well and the other team is going to be prepared for that they know what you do well and it and it comes down to well okay man versus man Okay, it's, it's you versus me, your guy across from my guy, and my guy's just better than you. And that's what USC had to do a lot of times with Pete Carroll. You know, they weren't just misdirecting and, and fooling the, 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 the opposing team's defense. They were just going to have to line up and be better. And they did that offensively, and they did that defensively. And I think that's true of a lot of the elite teams. Eventually, you're just going to have to have better execution and better players. And with USC, I think they're getting there. I think they upgraded – for sure on the offensive line, it's especially when you're talking about, um, you know, bringing in the transfers. Guys like Ethan White, um, you've always you already got Michael uh, Tarquin there, his teammate who's going to be right tackle. So he's going to compete at that spot. We're going to see him play against maybe Mason Murphy. We'll see what happens with him. I think Mason Murphy can be kicked down inside. And that that he's a very athletic player that you can pull a lot and you can do a lot of different things with if you wanted to put him on interior. They may keep him outside. But then on the left side, you're bringing in Jarrett Kingston from Washington State, who is – potentially a, a franchise-type left tackle. USC hasn't been able to sign that guy out of high school, but they get him from Washington State, and Washington State has a great lineage in producing very good offensive linemen, particularly left tackles, who are guys that were, you know, 240, 250 pounds, coming out of high school, underrated, two stars, three stars, and then ended up being guys that go to the NFL. So Jerry Kingston is a guy that people talked about, hey, this is a guy that can play in the NFL. Instead of making that jump, he goes to USC. So I think on the offensive line, we talked about this, you know, a couple weeks ago and last week. Did they actually upgrade an offensive line? I think they have. I, I think the offensive line is actually getting better now. There's more depth. There's a bit more talent. I mean, they played well last year. This was, you know, probably still the weakest spot on the offense, but it wasn't a, a an Achilles heel for USC like it's been in previous years. I mean, there's previous years there. They couldn't run the ball. They were averaging, you know, like two yards a run. It was ridiculous. Last year, they were actually pretty good. They had some really good run games. They had you know good pass protection. Obviously, Caleb Williams supplement, supplements that to some extent with his uh, mobility. But I think overall, they definitely are getting better on the offensive line, a a w where you already got an elite offense. An elite offense indeed. Indeed, I have a bunch of updates. I'm sorry. I even forgot that we had just a clip. We, had, we have eclipsed the one-hour mark. Which is like nothing to us. That's like that's like twenty minutes. <laughs> that's the to cold us. open. <laughs> that's the cold open. So if you were if you've been here for the whole first hour, I need a I need a hashtag one hour crew. The one hour crew. Chris is back with his. I'm back hashtags. out with my hashtags. They got a lot of engagement. I don't want to hear about this. Making fun of me for my for my hashtags. They do well. So if you've been here for the full full first hour, I need a hashtag one hour crew. And I said at the top of every hour, I'm gonna shout out Meredith Schlosser and her team. Top 1.5% of agents nationwide uh, from the Wall Street Journal, over $600 million in sales, 200 plus five star reviews. Can't beat that. MeredithSchlosser.com. Check her out if you are buying, selling, or you want to rent a house. So back to me and you. I have a couple of donations I need to get through right now. Uh, I have a. A uh, $10 donation from Silver Shadow 48 to Roddy Rich is Pops being in the house. $10 donation. Thank you so much, Silver Shadow. Thank you. Uh, Moneybags Manford also wanted to drop $10 uh, for uh, Papa Rich. Shout out to Papa Rich. <laughs> I got the mojo deals. We trapping like the 80s. 
Uh, that is a lyric. I did not just say that myself. Trapping like the eighties. Tra- were trap houses really something like the eighties? I don't. I don't know if that was so. even. Was that coined in the eighties? Snowfall. I think snowfall is the eighties. Okay. Yeah. I, th- I think so. For any snowfall fans, please uh, correct me on there. I have a question, but one more. Uh, that is not a donation. Before I get to it, uh, W C. Fenderson says, I need one of those shirts. How can I get one? There you go. Well, I'll tell you right now. You have to be an insider. uh, WC, I don't know what your shirt size is, but I might have an XL here for you that I will just give you. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. Wow. We got uh, trade giveaways, but no Trader Joe giveaways. If the yeah, Ryan has gone dead on us. I don't know anything about this Trader Joe's thing. Maybe he's in the traffic. Maybe he's in the traffic. He's at lunch right now. if we get cut off, it's because I'm giving away this shirt. But WC Fenderson, let me lunch. know what your shirt size is. And then going back to our other donation of $10. Let me get a ching in there. Alex Ruiz. Uh, are kids really signing elsewhere strictly because of upfront money? And any news on Bailey from Stanford possibly oh. transferring a... A, uh, a Peristyle favorite. A Peristyle favorite <laughs> along with uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., and uh, Walter, Walter Nolan, Nolan is, is getting up there. <laughs> I don't that, know. Is <laughs> unsubstantiated? Uh, does that go along? We with haven't the do- talked about Walter Nolan, and we haven't done a unsubstantiated rumor segment since the first one, since it derailed the entire social media. <laughs> uh, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about later. But from the standpoint, our kids really signing elsewhere strictly based up um, front money. I no. think some no. are. Not, um, well, yeah, some are, but not. All kids. I think that the upfront money is for the five stars. Uh, therefore, the, the, the quarterbacks, um, a lot of what I've heard, and it's real hard to get solid numbers and things of that nature. We've heard a lot of numbers thrown out there, and I've been told that they're nonsense from pretty good sources. But nevertheless, there is been some talk of you know certain players getting money to actually commit and then having – you know, the ability to get more money when they sign. So, yeah, that's a thing. And and, and some of it, I've been told, is used to just uh, place families. So, you know, if you can give somebody upfront money and then you place their family that's near the university that they're going to go to, it does make it a little more difficult to decommit from that university. I mean, you've literally uprooted your family, uh, potentially from a Pacific Island nation uh, somewhere. And all of a sudden now you've moved them all the way to another uh, a place. And, you know, even if they didn't want to go to that school, it's going to be pretty difficult to decommit there when, you know, you've been paid money, your family's there now. And uh, yeah, it's, you're it's, rooted. It's you're rooted now. You're, you're rerooted. So yeah, it is a thing. Um, you know, I, I, I can't like, again, I, I don't want to get into numbers because I think that a lot of those are incorrect, but nevertheless, uh, that is part of the NLI process. Um, how is that not inducement? <laughs> how how are these contracts? And we've you know seen some things come up. Uh, we talked about uh, Jalen Rashada, the quarterback out of Pittsburgh, California, the five star quarterback uh, that actually signed today with Arizona State, uh, originally committing to Miami, then decommitting from Miami and going to Florida, and then it being outed that Florida didn't want to pay him thirteen million dollars. Gerard doesn't believe the thirteen million. No, He's skeptical. I, no, I don't. I think that's completely false. But nevertheless, it was millions of dollars. And that money was uh, evidently uh, balked on. It was defaulted. The contract was defaulted. And again, when you start talking about contracts, they become binding to committing to a certain school. That is according to the NCAA inducement. So we're still trying to figure out like how that works, you know, and you can say, well, this wasn't a booster that was involved with this contract or what have you, but I don't think that matters. I think that's still an issue with the NCAA. So, you know, at this point in time, in terms of the committee of infractions and the NCAA regulating NIL, they're sort of right now just trying to like figure out what's going on. They, there's, there's, Got to be pressure from the schools, universities, and I think people forget the NCAA isn't really this autonomous governing body by itself. It's made up of representatives from the university. So what tends to happen is the university presidents, 
and the, the coaches and people, they start complaining and it becomes issues and that puts pressure on the people in Indianapolis to get off their ass and actually do something. Unless, you know, the, the, you know they're, they're, they're put on uh, a little mission to, to try to you know, derail the school um, for some other reason. But nine times out of ten, it's because they are getting complaints from other universities. And that's what happens. So it seems as though there's a few things on the docket right now when it comes to college football. The transfer portal, I think, is still maybe a bit of an issue uh, because tampering is something that a lot of college coaches are complaining about. And then you have NIL and, and all the money that's you know being thrown around out there. And, yes, there's definitely money being thrown up front. But I don't think it's for a, a vast majority of the players. I think you're talking about the guys that schools feel are at – those the sort of franchise positions, right? Left tackles, quarterbacks, um, maybe a corner, uh, you know, maybe a defensive tackle or, or, or like a really good rush end. I could see that, but you're probably not going to see that for a lot of receivers, a lot of running backs. Basically, if you look at the NFL draft and you look and see what positions are prioritized and draft first, that's where you can sort of guess where schools are going to kind of go a little overboard with where they're going to try to invest that money. And it goes back to that argument. We talked about this at the top of the show. From USC's perspective, USC has always been a school that when it comes to money, and, and we're talking about like going after coaches, they go after proven commodities. They do not want to go after a guy that's the next great coordinator, this, that, and the other. You know, In my lifetime, USC is always going after the proven commodity, which is to say that they don't pay a lot of upfront money for coaches. Lincoln Riley was sort of the first um, in my lifetime that USC has actually gone in and invested uh, after a proven winner somewhere else to bring him in. You know, they had Pete Carroll as one of the highest paid coaches in the uh, college football, um, but he had to gain that. He had to work his way up to being one of the highest paid football coaches in college football. When they went and got Steve Sarkeesian and they got Lane Kiffin, those guys weren't very expensive. Uh, and Clay Helton was a discount. So, you know, this is like the first time really that we've ever seen USC put money um, forward, you know, to try to invest in a great coach. Uh, whereas they usually try to get a guy that they feel good with, and then if he wins, they'll invest that money. And I feel like right now, when it comes to NIL, the money is there for the transfers more than it is for the high school kids. And when you look at going after a guy like Anthony Lucas, who was a former five-star, who a lot of people were excited about at Texas A&M, he didn't play a lot this season. He only had, I think, like 10 tackles or something like that. Uh, but he was really good in their spring game, and he's really good in fall camp. And he had his grades together. And I think, you know, when you compare him to a guy like maybe Mateo Uyunglele, I think there's definitely uh, a little more of a proven commodity there. So when you're asking boosters and you're asking donors, hey, we need millions of dollars to have NIL uh, to, to be able to have kids to have deals for these collectives, I get the sense that, you know, Jordan Addison, the money is there. Caleb Williams, the money is there because they've done it already in college. They're proven commodities as opposed to maybe a kid out of high school that doesn't have a whole lot of production, but, you know, he's just got the body and he's just got the athleticism. I don't know if they're willing to, to, to go there with those type of players. What a great wrap-up by Gerard. I just have to post one of my new... Uh... Okay. I didn't know how long that was going to go. I was waiting for the solo. I, ha I can't do more than 15 seconds or we'll get sued into oblivion. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sure. I don't even know if that's the real rule. I don't I think it is. I saw that. I think we I might heard get that sued on, I, I heard that on a podcast. <laughs> they were like, as long as it's not 15 seconds, you're good. So I'm just running with that. I'm just running with that. You, we didn't tell them that. Uh, so I was stuck on the freeway. That's why we were a little late. Something oh, I tweeted it out. Happened on the 91 freeway. No, 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 no. But you oh. didn't tell them that I called you to update you, to let you know. And when I called you, the first thing you heard was what? Well, after the second attempt, it sounded like you were in a high school gymnasium with a band playing. Yes. And that band's name was... Def Leppard sucks! 
<laughs> Def Leppard. So he I was rocking some so Def Leppard. I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the freeway. So I never listen to the radio. I turn on the radio, and what's playing is Def Leppard photographs. So I call Chris. I'm like, oh, I should tell Chris, you know, that I'm stuck in traffic, that I might be a little bit late. And so I put it on speaker and I played photograph and he had no idea. He had no clue. In my defense, what, I really couldn't hear that there was in, like in his defense, a band you could play playing? Def Leppard for him right now and he would have no clue. Absolutely I don't think not. He really knows Def Leppard songs. Absolutely song, so, not. Yes. Absolutely not. But fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> he I, knows Roddy Rich, and that's all that matters. That, that's all that matters for the composite two star recruits. Uh, I did have a twenty dollar donation, nineteen ninety nine. I'm rounding up for all of these from Giovanni Tejada. Thank you. Just a $20 donation. Thank really, you, Giovanni. Really appreciate it. Uh, Ryan texted me. He's actually at dinner right now, so he is not <laughs> aware of anything that's going on. But he reminded me that we were having a 60% off flash sale right now at uscfootball.com. And that runs until 9 p.m. Pacific time. So you can join us on the Peristyle. Every day you can get this type of banter. Every day you can... Uh, hit up Gerard whenever you want on the board and bug him incessantly. And uh, you can read my ghost notes when we have games. People seem to love the ghost notes game day. If you if you read those, just g give me a referral in, in in the chat right now. People seem to love those. Uh, Gerard drops VIP stuff all the time. So right now, 60% off. It's a no-brainer. Come and join the Peristyle family. Go from filthy casual to Peristyler. Make that jump. Don't think about it. Just do it. Again, that goes until 9 p.m. So you have over an hour to get it going. And unfortunately, W.C. Fenderson hit me back that he is a 3XL. I don't, unfortunately, have that size. I only have this, this XL right now. I might even give this shirt away uh, from the support if we if we keep it coming. The shirt off your back. I will give literally. the shirt off my back. It doesn't fit me. I just wanted to wear it because of the goldness. And I knew you'd be wearing the red, so I like the... I like the visual of it. Uh, we did have some more questions come in, but I'm going to get back to those. But I want to get back on track to our cold open because technically we haven't finished the National Signing Day no. stuff that we that we have on our docket here. And I'm going to transition us into another prospect that signed with USC that was already on the board for USC in terms of commitment. That's yeah. four-star Arizona wide receiver Jacoby Lane. Uh, a couple people posted in the chat. Don't forget about Jacoby Lane. I promise you, I will not. Six foot four, hundred and eighty pounds, seventy one seventy five. Just a. It's like he has pogo sticks in his legs. Just super athletic out of Red Mountain High School. Number thirty two wide receiver in the twenty four seven Sports composite. Was the only prospect that was committed to USC in December that did not sign, which set off a couple of months of you know. I don't want to say drama, but like recruiting drama of other schools talking to him. Arizona State was making a push. Texas was making a push. But in the end, Jacoby Lane stuck with the Trojans and ended up signing with the Trojans today at a ceremony at Red Mountain High School. So USC is officially bringing in four wide receivers, including Dorian Singer, the transfer. But Jacoby Lane will be part of that high school class with Zachariah Branch, uh, Makai Lemon, and Jacoby Lane, you know, we've talked about Jacoby Lane and his body type being six foot four, being that bigger bodied wide receiver that USC doesn't really have on the roster. But instantly, Jacoby Lane is that guy. You know, you can kind of argue about his 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 need to put on some more weight at 175 because he he does look like a string bean at times. But man, the guy has hops. The guy can be an absolute red zone weapon. And the fade ball is where he's going to make his money. Uh, out there on Saturdays and possibly on Sundays moving down the line. But Jacoby Lane was someone we didn't really know if he was going to end up in the class or not, but we have confirmation that he is signed with USC and he will be joining the team in the summer, Gerard. Yeah, and, you know, needs to put on weight, but the physicality is there. You saw him play uh, during the summer in one of the honorable games and uh, you were impressed with his run blocking and that he was able – to get out there and, and mix it up on the edge, and he wasn't a guy that was necessarily a pure finesse guy. He wasn't afraid to to put down and, and block somebody. You know? Yeah, I think a, a little bit on film, like a poor man's Dwayne Jarrett. You know, it doesn't necessarily the yak yards are not necessarily there. And Dwayne Jarrett, I think, out of high school was a little better in that sense, maybe a little more twitchy. But I think in terms of ball skills, uh, very similar 
uh, to be able to go up and get the ball and, and play that 50-50 ball really well. Um, he's very young. I think he's got a lot of development. Physically, he's got a lot of development. And I think if he can get himself 200 pounds plus, um, he could be a little different football player uh, in terms of the possession game. So, yeah, a guy that, you know, can get vertical. Uh, and I think, you know, as a possession receiver right now, that's sort of his game. He's forced to, you know, sort of run those fade routes and, and get into the seam routes, maybe the skinny post. But I think if he could put on some more weight, he could be a little bit more of a presence uh, in the in the sort of lower post, if you will, you know, sort of play that power forward position for USC as a wide receiver that we've seen with guys like Mike Williams, um, some of the bigger receivers. But, you know, some guys don't have that in them either. You know, they don't have that mentality. I mean, Patrick Turner was never really that guy, even though he was a, a big kid, 6'5", you know, 235 when he came to USC. He was still um, a, a a possession receiver that really ran routes and had good footwork, but wasn't necessarily super physical like Mike Williams. So again, we have to see what Jacoby Lane looks like when he puts on that way. Uh, but I like to hear that, you know, away from the ball, which is something you don't get to see a lot on highlight films. That's why I like to watch game film. And that's why we do ISO film. ISO film is, you know, a mu as much about what the player does away from the football as he does with the football in his hands. Because you're going to be able to see that if the game's on ESPN or, you know, you're going to watch huddle, but you don't necessarily see what they're doing away from the football without the ball in their hands. And, and Chris was impressed with that. So that's a good sign for Jacoby uh, Lane. One of the best recruiting classes, I think, nationally. I mean, this cycle, is there really a, a school that signed, you know, three better high school football wide receivers? I mean, you got Makai Lemon, who... Dropped a little bit in the uh, the the twenty four seven sports you're, rankings. You're, fo you're fomenting a riot in the in the chat by well, bringing up Makai Lemon. But <laughs> but we did get some amount of explanation from some of the national analysts that were coming on the board, and they defended themselves. I don't know that they necessarily made the best argument, but you know they at least were there to say, hey, you know, this is why we're thinking what we're thinking. I think. Listening to them, a lot of the question becomes about size with Makai Lemon. The thing is, Trojan fans have seen a guy that wasn't even as big as Makai Lemon do it, and he's playing in the NFL, and he's playing well in the NFL, and I'm on Ross St. Brown. And Makai Lemon is more athletic than that. Now, Makai Lemon, like we said, not as polished as that, but he could get there. You know, you can coach up that. The things that he doesn't have that uh, Amon Ross St. Brown had out of modern day – you can coach and you can get to what you can't coach is the speed. What you can't coach is the, the dog. And what you can't coach is the explosiveness. And Makai Lemon has those things. So I think USC is really good off Makai Lemon. It's fine. I know people think, you know, he maybe he should play uh, quarterback. That's been a talk for a long time with him, but I think he's going to be pretty good as a wide receiver. I think he was excellent this past season. I mean, in the big games, when it matters, he turns it on. The all-star games don't mean anything. And he knows that just like a lot of these seven on seven tournaments don't mean anything he knows that and he wasn't necessarily dominant or he didn't play a lot and, and show a lot in those tournaments and sometimes that's all that the national guys get to see uh, unfortunately and they make I think opinions that are weighted too much on those type of events show me a football game that means something and and I want to watch him play and so I think Makai Lemon is definitely a five-star for USC and then you get Zachariah Branch who's the number one wide receiver uh, in the nation and a guy that's explosive and a guy that, you know, we talked about Roderick Pleasant and maybe his immediate impact would have to be on special teams. We can see that with Zachariah Branch as well. He and Makai Lemon are both guys that you can put as special teams. So, you know, there's only one ball. There's only so many positions. So, you know, again, you know, we go back to Roderick Pleasant, not the hugest miss in the world. I think um, in terms of the, the special team, you can supplement those uh, those positions with Zachariah Branch and Makai Lemon. There was talk on the Twitter sphere that, you know, uh, Ohio State actually had the best wide receiver class in the 2022 cycle with their four signees, Brandon Innes, who actually, very similar to Makai Lemon, dropped out of five-star range uh, from the 24-7 sports rankings. And then Noah Rogers, 6'2", 195, out of North Carolina. Carnell Tate out of IMG. And then their fourth signee, Bryson Rogers, six foot out of Florida. So... You know, I don't know Bryson Rogers. We, I don't really know him as well, but I think there are no one. I know USC fan would trade Zachariah Branch for anything in anyone else's class. Carl Tate is great. Yep. Carl Tate is going to be a guy. I think Brendan Enos is interesting. Very good high school football player. Very dominant in seven on seven. Has the body of a running back. Now you kind of compared him there with Makai Lemon. I think Makai Lemon is a better athlete. I think he's a lot more flexible 
and as a receiver is going to be better athletically playing in space than Ennis. Ennis isn't very – he's he's thick, you know, with two Cs, um, and he, and he kind of is built squatty like a running back, but he's not necessarily super fast. So it's like he's more of a possession receiver, but he's not a big possession receiver. So he's a bit of a tweener, you know, very productive – and I think you got to give him his credit for how productive he was. He was a guy that a lot of people thought would end up at USC. He committed originally to Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma, but uh, USC is better with a guy like Jacoby Lane, who's you know just a different body type. I mean, a little versatility. Yeah, you got to have some versatility in that wide receiver room, and you want some big guys. You want to be able to do some different things because you're going to play defenses that are going to have different things. They may match up really well against Zach Branch. Or, or smaller type receivers, but not have a guy that's going to be able to uh, guard a big, tall receiver, and you can throw that ball up to him and win 50-50 balls in the end zone. So I think um, you know having a little bit of everything in that wide receiver room is is definitely a good thing, and it's something that's a little bit new for Lincoln Riley because a lot of his past receivers that were really successful with Oklahoma were those guys like C.D. Lamb or you know that six foot six foot one range. And Dorian Singer is six foot one, so maybe we'll see a little bit more out of there. Now, did Ohio State get anybody? See, we have to include Dorian Singer in that. Did Ohio State get anybody out of the portal that was that level of wide receiver? I don't think they did. Uh, Certainly not as They productive. did not. They have no, they only have five transfers, yeah. uh, only two on the offensive side of the ball Victor Cutler, a offensive tackle, and then Tristan Jebia, a quarterback. So, yeah. Uh, I, I know as, as soon as we bring up Ohio State wide receivers, the Marvin Harrison Jr. talk is going to start. <laughs> Someone actually, in an earlier uh, speech you gave, rant, they speech. were like, yeah, I call them speeches these days. Uh, they were like, did Gerard just drop a hint about Marvin Harrison Jr.? Did he just, I don't even know, I don't know what you said, but if that person wants ex, ex, uh, explanation explanation as to what he said that triggered that 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 comment. Uh, I had a couple more donations. I had a 99 cents donation from James Holquin. Thank Holquin. You, James. He he also had a question. I don't know if he forgot to add it to his donation, but he said, "Will you sign the shirt?" I, I will absolutely sign the shirt. I think I might ruin the shirt, but sure, I will sign anything you offer to me. And then I had another, of course, donation from Moneybags Manford. Uh, do you think Tackett Curtis has the potential to become a starter despite the presence of Lee, Gentry, and Cobb. Do you predict who do you think will be the starting linebackers? Who do you predict will be the starting linebackers for this team? Interesting question because I think my answer for who will be the season opening starters will be very different for who will be the ending starters to the season. I think the starters for going into the year will be Gentry and Cobb, but I think by the end of the season, it could be Tackett Curtis and Cobb. Interesting. But that's just like an early throw out, throw it out there. I would love to see Tackett Curtis starting first game of the season. Oh. Put him as a starter. Mike Linebacker. That's not sarcastic? Put, just, no. Okay. Sarcastic? <laughs> My friend. Oh, no. <laughs> you picked violence. Mason Cobb at will. Give me Eric Gentry on the field. Put him in the slot. Put him outside. Move him around. He's my Sam. He's he, We're going old school, like more of a 4-3 type of thing. Uh, now you can mix them up. You put three guys line scrimmage, whatever you want to do. But I, I like those three guys on the field at the same time. I think your second level of your defense gets significantly better than it was last season. I, I think I've seen enough of what's on the roster from some of the transfers that we saw a year ago. I think that that group would be the most athletic, productive, versatile group. Um, now, you could also mix and match with some things and do whatever. You know, different teams have different strengths, but I like that group right there. I, I like that group. I, I'd like to see that group on the field at some point. I want the chat's opinion to Gerard's, I don't want to say crazy, but your out of the box thinking with Mason Cobb, Tacky Curtis, and playing. Eric Gentry in the kind of slot position and kind of moving. What do you guys think about that? Nickelbacker. Nickelbacker, yeah, as the nickel for Eric Gentry. What I do don't think, think you can put him at Mike Linebacker again. I just think that I, I, you know, he's an extraordinary talent. The fact that he was able to play Mike Linebacker was amazing, but he's 200 pounds, and that is going to get you in trouble at some point. And so I, I like to be able to move him around, not allow teams 
to to scheme against him as easily. Mike linebacker, the first thing the center is pointing out is where the Mike linebacker is. The first thing a quarterback is looking at, where's the Mike linebacker? All these teams this offseason are going to want to know, where is Eric Gentry? And wouldn't it be nice if Eric Gentry all of a sudden wasn't there where they thought he was going to be? And being a player that is such a, a unicorn of sorts with his length, having him on the hashes I just think would – would do a lot for the defense, and it would certainly help them a lot in the passing game against tight ends, which we saw them really get exploited against. It's, it's a couple of games last season where they just could not guard the tight end in the passing game. Do you think Curtis at 220 is too small? No, because I think he's probably going to be closer to 230, and I think if you, could put, if you can put 200 pounds there at 6'6 and have the season that USC had, you're going to be okay with Curtis Tackett. Really, Curtis's biggest challenge, Tackett, I think. Tackett Curtis. You said Curtis Tackett. <laughs> Tackett Curtis. Cur Curtis is, well, that's his last name is Curtis. So You said Curtis Tackett. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Curtis's biggest issue is going to be, of course, absorbing the, the defense and the, and the play calls and what have you. It's, it's a communication from that point. So I, I don't know how much he's communicated as a safety uh, playing at the high school level. That That's something that's going to be a little bit used to. He's going to have to be very vocal. He's going to have to line guys up. And he could he could screw up. And, and I know that that's going to be something that's going to scare uh, Lincoln Riley. It's going to scare uh, Alex Grinch because you could give up some touchdowns with that. Um, and the other issue is eyes. It's just seeing the field differently because he's going to be closer to the line of scrimmage than he has been. Now, he, you know, he plays near the line of scrimmage by the time the ball snapped a lot, but just lining up there is, is going to be a little different. And it's, it's a different feel, man. I mean, being out there, quite frankly, I think for a linebacker, it's better. The closer to the line of scrimmage, you know, you, you, I think in general, it's, it's, it's easier for you to play as opposed to the more you back up, the more you have to play in space and the more it's, it's difficult. You have to have spatial awareness and some guys just don't have it. I know I don't have it. I played in high school, played the line of scrimmage in the three, four. And I was like, cool. I got a man in front of me. I key him. You know, I had everything set up and all of a sudden they moved me back into a four, four. And I'm like out here in no man's land. And I wasn't really that far back, but I still wasn't at the line of scrimmage anymore. And it's just a weird feeling. It's a different feeling. I remember among Marshall uh, playing seven on and everybody talked about how Biggie Marshall needed to be a safety and people said that throughout his USC career because they never saw him play safety in 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 seven on seven or in a game I saw him play seven on seven safety and he was so out of sorts he had no eyes no instincts took bad angles it just clearly was not a position for him but you put him at corner you put him over somebody and you say Biggie that's their best wide receiver take him he was fine. He was good to go. He locked him down. And that's true of a lot of players. So I think the eyes is going to be something that, you know, Tackett Curtis has to kind of get used to. And certainly, uh, you know, just the, the, the communication of, of getting the off, uh, getting the defensive play call and making sure that everybody around you knows the defensive play call. USC likes to use a lot of shifts. They like to use a lot of movement. Uh, sometimes a linebacker is the guy that's telling those guys where they need to go, when they need to go. You got to think of all those type of things. And I don't know how much he did of that at the high school level playing, uh, you know, single high safety a lot of times. We have a lot of people that agree with your linebacker take, and they would love to see this. But we also have some people throwing out Jamil Muhammad as maybe a guy who steps in at Mike linebacker. At Mike, I mean, he's played off the edge almost completely at Georgia State. You know, he's always been kind of edge guy. Now, he did play quarterback in high school, and that's always kind of a cool thing. You know, we saw that with Lofa Tatupu when he transferred in from Maine. You know, nobody knew anything about Lofa, but he was a former high school quarterback. So when he came in uh, and they put him at middle linebacker, very smart. I mean, he, he, he played that position so well. A lot of the intangibles – playing Mike linebacker, he was able to play those because he played quarterback in high school. Now, hey, guess what? There's one thing that I didn't mention that I kind of forgot about. Tackett Curtis plays quarterback in high school. And that's different kind of quarterback. It's a, a lot of uh, sort of wildcat and, and running. But nevertheless, he's Show got that a, speed, baby. He's got to call plays, and he's got to get everybody lined up right. And that's basically the same thing he's going to be doing at Mike quarterback. So I'm literally talking myself into and giving myself even more reasons to believe that Tackett Curtis is – the answer at my at my linebacker. <laughs> well, there you go. There you he, go. Uh, he just, I just he didn't talk himself out of it, but nope. he just like re he he talked himself into doubling it down. Double down, yeah. He, yeah. The old double down I like by it. Gerard Martinez. I have another money bags Manford drop, of course, because 
He's money bags man. <laughs> uh, not a question, just 10K and G Mart. Imagine how crazy this show would be if you had live callers. Well, we did, didn't we? Or no, we no, had a we voicemail. Had, yeah. We had a voicemail, yeah. which we do actually have a voicemail for for maybe questions at the end. But yes, I have thought about the capability of doing live callers, but maybe for the next time because I'm afraid of what that will unleash. <laughs> I'm afraid of what it will unleash. But if Moneybags Manford is, like, throwing it out there, I think we at least have to try it. I think we have to – because he's the biggest donor to the show. You know, if he, he says how crazy, does he mean that in a good way or a bad way? <laughs> I think he meant it in a bad way. No, I think he meant it in a good way. But, a, yes, I think it would be – In a who knows kind of way. In a who knows <laughs> kind of way. Roman388 says uh, – GM and CT would make a great wrestling tag team. Cilantro boys. Luchadors, right? Luchadors. Yeah. Nacho Libre. Uh, we, you know, it's funny because Chris makes all... He did the Macho Man thing for, for Halloween. Mm -hmm. And so I always make these like 80s WWF references to him. And he just he has no idea. Like he just doesn't... He doesn't really... He doesn't go back to that. But he was Macho Man. For Halloween, nevertheless. Nevertheless, I was certainly Macho Man. Oh, I got a... Dream of the crop, brother. $20 donation from Roland. Al, if you remember our good friend Roland from last time, he donated a bunch. Uh, I, I think we call him Roland. Roland? Roland uh, and money? Yeah, $20 from Roland L. Chrissy T would love if the Cowboys lost all their games Ooh. in 2023 and got to draft Caleb Williams oh. next year. Wow, Fight that on. Did, that took a turn there. That was like I was reading and I thought it was <laughs> it was going to be going, going a slight. Yeah. But in the end, if you get Caleb Williams, I think that's a, a win either way. You know, I feel like I I would absolutely run out and buy Caleb Williams. Uh, jersey number thirteen quarterback jersey. I would absolutely have to do it. It's probably not going to happen though. You don't think, right? I don't think they're going to lose all their games next year. Unfortunately, no. they're definitely not going to be in the contention for the number one pick. But yes, I would personally love it if the DMV's the great Caleb Williams uh, was the next quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. Absolutely, but that is a that is a far shot from happening. A far shot from happening. Now we've talked about Jacoby Lane. And his signing, and I guess the final kind of piece to National Signing Day is with another Arizona prospect that is a five-star pinnacle tight end, Douche Robinson, which this one is really chock full of recruiting drama. Douche Robinson took an official visit to USC in the summer. We felt really good about USC being in the driver's seat for that one. Yeah. But then time went on, time went on. If a trend here you're following... You know, maybe USC faded a little bit, or more so Georgia came on strong, and the Bulldogs kind of moved in position for Deuce Robinson and picked up all those crystal balls for him. Texas was also hanging around with USC trying to, you know, get back in the front seat, if you will, for Deuce Robinson. And then all three of those schools also had to compete with America's pastime, baseball, because Deuce Robinson, high-level baseball athlete, and capable of being a first-round draft pick in this summer's MLB draft. I believe the comp for him is Aaron Judge. You know, he's six foot six, 230 pounds. Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams, they would love to add another big-bodied wide receiver especially, or weapon excuse me, in Deuce Robinson, and that kind of brings up the point. Is he a tight end? Is he a wide receiver? It does not matter. He will be catching passes and catching touchdowns if he decides to play football at the next level. But this is going to continue on. Deuce Robinson was slated to sign today on February 1st, but uh, in, the, in the days leading up to this, uh, leading up to Wednesday, it came out that he is not going to sign. He is very torn on what to do and wants more time. And Gerard, I feel like for the last three cycles, we've had a prospect, a five-star prospect nonetheless, that has taking it past February and USC fans have to wait and see what is going to turn out with this recruitment. Deuce Robinson, USC would love to add him for the offense next season, have that dynamic five-star playmaker in that tight end room. So Deuce Robinson, you're going to have to hear that name a couple more for a couple more months because this one is going to drag out. I feel like maybe until the summer. Potentially, potentially he could wait 
and see what happens with the MLB draft. I think if you would have asked me if they're going to be a recruit that's going to go past the February signing period, who would it be? I probably would have said Nicholas Harbor. Mm -hmm. But it ends up being Deuce Robinson. And, you know, with players that are two-sport athletes, you know, there's there's various different influences and, and points in which things during their recruiting process can uh, prolong the process itself. And so with Robinson, it's baseball. There was not a lot of confidence here kind of last, I would say, ooh, month and a half. Um, I, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. Let me, let me take that back. There's been confidence within USC recruiting circles throughout. Um, basically, coming out of the summer, it was USC, USC, USC. He's going to USC. Um, and I think that that's never really changed a whole lot. I think with, you know, commits and, and the players that are close to him, the vibe has always been USC. However, in the last month or so, it's definitely changed with uh, the sources outside of those circles. And what we've seen, unfortunately, is that nine times out of ten, it goes – uh, uh, not USC's way. <laughs> USC may be very confident, uh, but that read is wrong, and those kids end up going elsewhere. So, you know, for us, I think coming up until signing day over the last month or so, it's felt more and more like USC was potentially going to lose him. Uh, yes, USC sources very confident, but um, looking at you know what's happened, the read there has usually been that they're going to some other school. Now it gets prolonged, and the interesting thing that happens is that Walker Lyons says, well, I'm not waiting. You know, I'm going to go, and I'm going to jump on this, and he commits now. So, you know, does that have an impact on Deuce Robinson? I think Deuce Robinson potentially had an impact on Walker Lyons, uh, even though Walker's not going to enroll right away and he's not going to play right away at USC. Uh, but I don't think this really impacts Deuce Robinson too much. I mean, USC brought them in on the same weekend. And so there are obviously that conversation about playing multiple sets with two tight ends. And like I said, I mean, I, I kind of joked out there that, you know, maybe USC was going to be using some jumbo sets with maybe three tight ends because you've got Kate Eldridge there as well. Uh, I think that um, USC is, is going to still be there. It's uh, going to be interesting to see how the, the, the continuation of his recruitment goes on from this point forward. You know, is he able to get on campus at USC again? That was the other thing that was kind of an issue. He had a workout for the Dodgers there uh, just a couple weeks ago. He was in L.A., and he didn't, didn't unofficially visit USC. He, he was basically going to the Dodgers workout on the Sunday, and then he was off to the Polynesian Bowl. And you felt like, you know, if USC was really his favorite school still, and that's the school he saw himself at, he would have made time to try to get to USC. You know, it's sort of going back to the actions speak louder than words in recruiting. And so you felt like USC was slipping. The interesting thing about his recruitment as of late, late, late. So we have like this month, we've been kind of here in Georgia, 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 is that more recently, there's been a couple sources that have told me that this might be Texas in USC right now. Which is interesting, and, and some of that has to do with Todd Munkin, who's looking at some NFL jobs and potentially being an offensive coordinator in the NFL. I think he interviewed for the Bucks job. Um, so he could possibly be moving on, and that would be a new offensive system that they would have to bring in at Georgia. And, of course, Kirby Smart's going to say, hey, listen, you know, we're going to bring in a great coach. He's going to be great. He's going to be awesome. We're Georgia. We're national championships. But Georgia is led by Kirby Smart, a defensive coordinator uh, in mind and heart. That is a defensive run team. So when you bring in an offensive coordinator, you're really bringing in a new offense. It, it might not be the same offense, and it certainly might not be an offense that utilizes the tight end a whole lot. So uh, it was kind of unique what Georgia did last year, and, um, you know, congratulations to them and, and their run. Uh, but, you know, that's obviously something that also comes in to play when you're talking about this sort of drama with with uh, Juice Robinson. Not to say it was drama, because it's not really drama. Uh, I think that he's handled the process very well. He's always been uh, very gracious with his time. For us, he hasn't really created, like, a weird sort of vibe um, in, uh, yeah, in... I don't like calling it drama, but, like, yeah. that, it's just... I call it recruiting drama, because it's just a delayed, like, because fans. Because recruiting tends to lend... It, it lends itself to drama, you know? It's, it's very gossipy, and, uh, you know, now with the NIL, you've got all of this rumors with money and this, that, and the other. Um, but I think with him, he's always handled it well. Now, there is one point on contention that I do have with what you said, 
when you said that uh, big wide receiver, tight end, it doesn't matter. You know, he's going to catch the ball. I, I think that does matter. I think that, you know, he plays wildcat quarterback. He plays receiver. I think he looks at himself as an athlete and probably likes the idea of at least being utilized and targeted a lot. And that's been one of the biggest issues with USC. Really, what's a big issue for USC with recruiting Deuce Robinson is the fact they didn't utilize the tight end. They're trying to sell him on something that they didn't have, right? And I think that's always harder than selling a proven you know, commodity. Like, okay, this is our tight end position. You know, This is the guy that just caught 50 balls. This is who you're playing for. Now, it didn't work on the defensive side of the ball with Tuli, Tui Pelotu trying to recruit Mateo Uyunglele, but I think that it would help with Deuce Robinson. The other issue is the baseball program. The baseball program is sort of just, you know, there. It hasn't been as prestigious as it was in the past. And, you know, in the SEC, baseball is big. Georgia has been okay lately, but has, you know, in the modern era of baseball, had some good teams and some good runs. And I think that is a better sell for him from that standpoint. So, you know, th there's some things that they're working against, but I think in terms of relationship, he likes the USC coaches. I think he loves the players that are going there. He has a great relationship with Zach Branch. He has a great relationship with Malachi Nelson. I think, you know, being close to home is a good thing for him. I think that does help USC to some extent. I mean, it's not going to be the deal breaker for him, but I think that is a positive for him. Um, so, you know, there are some aspects, but, you know, Texas creeping in here late is interesting, and I don't know what to make of that. I mean, that is coming more from USC sources than it is from other people. So it's kind of like if you listen to USC sources, it's USC and then Texas is trying to get into it. And if you listen to people outside of that that are, you know, on the East Coast and what have you, it's all Georgia. So it's kind of hard to know. But um, at the end of the day, I think from a forecast standpoint, you know, somebody pointed out I had 46 percent as my as my forecast percentage, uh, which was a bit odd. But I made it 46 percent specifically to make it odd. So it stood out because it would there get people go. talking about it. He's not committing now. So we kind of, you know, drum up a little bit of uh, uh, interest as to, you know, what, what the story looks like. Um, I think, you know, truthfully, it's probably around 40%. I think I tend to lean with the sources that are outside those USC circles just because, like I said, read wide. I kind of have seen this story before. We've seen this go down before where, you know, people are confident. I mean, Roderick Pleasant would be another example of that where um, I know, you know, some USC sources were very – for very uh, confident that they were going to get him, um, and Oregon was confident as well, and he ends up going to Oregon. Uh, I think, you know, for me, the read just came down to him, uh, you know, being uh, really having so many pro USC influences around him. I think that I thought would would be the deal breaker for him, and certainly, you know, some of his family. I don't think what's happy uh, from what I hear with with his decision. But you know what, it is his decision. He's got to go to that school. He's got to be there for three or four years. Um, and so, you know, we'll see if, if, if that sticks or not. Uh, somebody made an interesting prediction on the peristyle. I can't remember who it was, but I give a nod to it that, um, you know, he commit, he commit to Oregon and then in a year he'll transfer to UCLA. That's not, that's not a bad call, man. That's not a bad call. That's uh, very possible that happens. Absolutely. I have a $50 donation from, wait for it. Winnie the Golden Retriever. There you go. Winnie. Bark, bark, I love Menudo Heart. <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed by Winnie the Golden Retriever's ability to type and pull out and have a bank account. And, and open cans of Menudo. That's not... And open cans of Menudo. So a very day. talented dog. Maybe maybe this is like the the granddaughter of uh, Airbud, Airbud himself. No? No. You, you understand I don't that know reference? that reference. No. The dog that plays basketball? You know, like in soccer and football and come on, somebody. Somebody in the comments has to know what Airbud is, right? Connor McGregor. No, not Connor McGregor. Airbud. Someone No, please. but I remember last remember the last uh, Oh last right, we couldn't know, we but <laughs> I actually know what the thing is we're trying to figure out. So Yeah, but you're asking other people to and they don't. <laughs> okay. Well but I guess my last question to this is we talk all the time about how Time, more time in a recruitment can be good. It like especially if like USC is a school trailing. You know, like we talked about with Justin Scott delaying his yeah uh, signing. Well, or, I think that's a little different. Well, it's, it's very, I was just using it as an example. But do you think this is a bad thing to have more time in this recruitment? 
Uh, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe. I mean, you're going to get a little bit of time away from Georgia winning a national championship, and obviously there's a lot of momentum with how they played on the field. Um, I think it only benefits USC if they could get them on campus again. I, that is always something that helps just getting – a player and his family familiar and comfortable with the program. And kids will say, you know, I don't need to take that visit. I don't need to take that visit. I've been there already. I mean, Roderick Pleasant said that as well. And that was another reason to think, you know, he took that official visit when he didn't have to. And that was, you know, USC's last chance to really close with him. And I think with Deuce Robinson, it would be similar if he was able to get around USC more. Obviously, traveling to Georgia is a little more difficult. Traveling to Texas, a little more difficult. It's not impossible, obviously. But I think, you know, that would help USC. Uh, but if that doesn't happen and he doesn't end up on campus at all, then uh, that that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, maybe USC's baseball team uh, improves and, and plays well. And he sees some improvement there, and that helps him. So, you know, from that standpoint, yeah, I don't think it's, like, huge. I mean, you know, for some guys, it, it didn't really matter. JT Toy Moala was a guy that, you know, uh, kind of prolonged the pro process uh, a year ago, and it didn't really help USC. I mean, he ended up going to Ohio State, which everybody predicted he was going to Ohio State uh, to begin with. So um, Josh Connerly, he waited a little bit. It didn't really help with him. Um you know, uh, it, it gave USC – I shouldn't say that. You know what? I take that back. I think it did help USC because it it gave them a chance to really make a run and almost sign him. I, I don't think they had that, you know, with Lincoln Riley coming in and it being a whole new coaching staff and they didn't have Josh Hinton right away. I mean, they really didn't have a chance at Josh Connerly. And I think, you know, getting that time and him delaying – uh, his uh, commitment till March, I think it did help him. It didn't help enough is is what happened, but it did help him. So in that circumstance, absolutely. But with JT Toy Moalo, it, it didn't really do anything for USC. They got a, an official visit out of it. Okay, cool. But, you know, I don't think USC finished in the top three for him. And so with Deuce Robinson, he's been around USC enough. He has a great relationship with the coaching staff. I think uh, it's marginal how much it will help them, uh, but certainly it will help them more if you know he's able to be on campus be around go to spring game you know he shows up to the USC for a spring game just to see the offense and, and watch it and what have you those are the things that I think are going to make an impact and that's the stuff that USC has to take advantage of being so close someone wants to know what energy drink you're drinking <laughs> I'm drinking Arrowhead energy water H2O baby Water it is, and Airbud also a multi-sport athlete like Deuce Ramon R. I put that one up on the screen, and everyone is like, "Who doesn't know Airbud?" No, I don't. Or Gerard apparently I does have not no know. Idea. I know that there's dogs that surf; they're cool, but I don't know their names. Well, maybe Winnie <laughs> surfs. I do not know, but thank you again for the donation. Well, that kind of I guess wraps up close to. Where are we at? Are we at two hour mark? We're almost at the two hour mark, so I'm going to be getting ready to do those hashtags, people. But we are at uh, the end, I guess, of the cold open running through uh, Walker Lions, Roderick Pleasant, Douche Robinson, and Jacoby Lane. So now the show can actually start, Gerard. We are finally through with the, uh, the, the cold open. But I wanted to just, because obviously maybe Douche Robinson joins the class. Maybe not. So, but for the most part, the high school class is done and we'll see what happens with Deuce. But can you just give me a grade for the class? I have my grade in mind. And if you're in the chat, what is your grade for the high school class? Lincoln Riley's first quote unquote full recruiting cycle for the Trojans. I know what my grade is, Gerard. I don't know if you want me to say my grade. For just the high school class. For just the high school class. We graded the transfer class guys last our last episode. I believe it was last episode. One episode in January we graded those guys. I'm not asking to grade every position. Right. I just wanted the overall grade. Uh, not counting Deuce. But for me, I'm giving it a B plus. Okay. That's my grade, like an 87 type deal. And if you get deuce, you know, you're going right to an A for me. You go right at that 90 90 range, but for me it's a B plus. I get a lot of Bs. Yeah. Here. Yeah, and I think we kind of came to that conclusion with the transfer class as well. I think we were we're giving a, above averages 
And I would agree with you. I think it hovers around a B minus B. Um, I wouldn't give it a B plus, uh, mainly because I think the interior defensive line still lacks those uh, impact players mm -hmm. and, and, and impact players. I mean, really within the first two years that they're on campus, I don't think you necessarily are going to get a guy that's going to come in right away and play, but uh, you know, we don't have that yet from the transfer portal and we don't have that from the high school ranks either. And I think that's still an issue for USC just up front um, being able to have someone that comes in uh, that you could sort of build around, you know, the future of your defense. Uh, no defensive backs that come in and are really going to play right away or push for early playing time. Uh, not that necessarily USC needs that. I mean, they are losing Makai Blackman. You know, the thought would be that Christian uh, Roland Wallace would come in and fill that position, but you would like to have somebody else come in and compete for that spot. And they did recruit, you know, Warren Roberson, uh, like we said at the top of the show, he's just still technically out there, but people are looking at him to go to Texas. Uh, that would have been a nice pickup. Uh, I think uh, Roger Pleasant would have been a nice pickup. Um, you know, I, I, if you're looking at A's, for me, you know, I've been around long enough to see, like, elite classes. I've, I've been around long enough to see USC sign Reggie Bush, Linda White, and Chauncey Rossington at running back. You know, like, you know, really stack some positions. And they really haven't stacked any positions other than maybe wide receiver. I mean, that's the only position you really look at. It's super a stacked position. Um, and I think if you only have one position in that position, it's uh, an important position to USC, but a position that they do have some talent at already. The needs are still a little bit there. Not a franchise left tackle. Um, you didn't get that, you know, that three technique that's a big-time player. Uh, I think they definitely improve in that second level of the defense with Tackett Curtis. And we'll see if, you know, Braylon Shelby plays you know, strictly up at the line of scrimmage or if he moves back a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's in that B area. I, I'd say, you know, like an, uh, an 82 to an 85, something of that nature. Um, it was a, a good class. I think the issue that Trojan fans would have with it is, again, correlating 11 win seasons with recruiting. If you're going back to the Pete Carroll era, you think that automatically means that, you know, you're near the top five as a high school recruiting class. I think, you know, some of it is, yes, we're, we're trying to figure out whether that's that, that recruiting lag that's, that's, you know, USC has been irrelevant for so long that, you know, it's going to take some time for the modern era of uh, recruits and, and kids that are actually in high school right now that are paying attention to football, um, that they actually see USC being good again, and it, and it starts to rekindle that interest and that, that love for them, um, having seen how far USC could fall, which I, I tell you, there's probably a lot of people that watched USC football during the Pete Carroll era that thought they could never <laughs> fall as far as they did and be as mediocre for as long as they were. But um, I don't know, man. You, you, if you lived through the Paul Hackett era, then you probably knew that there was a possibility that you could have a, a Clay Helton era. Um, so, you know, USC is definitely not a school that uh, can, can, can dodge, you know, having those mediocre sort of runs. It, it, it happens. Um, so, you know, that's, that's unfortunately what USC is sort of dealing with. But then I think we also have to come to terms with it's the modern era of recruiting and with NIL and with the transfer portal, it's going to change what the high school classes are going to look like. Um, it's just, you know, the facts. It's just what's happening. We kind of have to embrace it and understand that, you know, the signing days for high school are just not going to be as big as they were. Uh, a lot of it's going to be, okay, how did you supplement that with the transfer uh, portal? And and we just have to see what USC does going forward. Are, are they going to continue to put more emphasis on the high school kids uh, when they can, or is the portal become a crutch of sorts where you start missing out on certain positions and you don't land guys and you just say, oh, well, we got a guy in the portal. You know, it, can that work? You know, is that going to be um, something that actually helps the program get to that elite level? Because, you know, they won 11 games. Fantastic turnaround by Lincoln Riley and his staff, but they're certainly not where USC fans want them to be. You know, they're still not necessarily there where they – are playing in the college football playoff and they're competitive, you know, and that's, I think they're still a, a ways away from that in terms of personnel. And so they definitely have to get better uh, on both sides of the ball. I think they got better, interestingly, on offense with the, the, the upgrades with the offensive line, um, you know, particularly through the porthole. 
but uh, defensively, we're still kind of waiting what they do up front if they're able to get one of those guys in the middle that can really sort of change, you know, how how, de how, how the defense plays and how offenses have to scheme against the defense. We officially hit the two-hour mark, so you know the drill if you've been here. I need a hashtag two-hour crew. Cameron got things jumping for me with his first hashtag. So if you've been here for two hours, I need a two-hour crew hit in the chat. And if you were here, even through the delay, you can even throw in a hurricane was late hashtag. <laughs> uh, just just to, just to poke a little bit. And because we are at the top of the hour, I do need to shout out Meredith Schlosser, the official sponsor of the Composite Two Star Recruits. You can see her website down there, MeredithSchlosser.com. Seriously, if you're thinking about buying a house, selling a house, they do it all. Specialize in first-time home buyers and sellers. This is the team on your screen that you need to go with. Over $600 million in total sales. 200 plus five star reviews on Zillow. She is the best in Southern California. You got to go with Meredith Schlosser and her team. Now, Gerard, let's get back to you and I. I'm going to get that main background out there. Let me throw some two hour crews on the board. Now, we just gave our grades for the entire class. And this was part of another overviewing question that I had that I wanted us to talk about because. We have talked about something called the golden hour for multiple shows. And we always talk about was it, how successful was it? And we couldn't really assess it, you know, yeah. a week after. We couldn't really assess it at the end of the summer. But can we assess it now with these products? But could we still out there? <laughs> could we assess it now on this live show? I feel like what, at what point? Do we have to assess it? I feel like this is the time to assess it. You mean give it a review, a grade as to whether it was a, a success or, or, or it wasn't a success? Yes. If you don't know what the, the golden hour is, that was the name of USC's big recruiting weekend where they brought in – how many kids was it? Like close to – I think it was two dozen. Two dozen. Yeah. Two dozen kids. You know, they had the luau that stirred up some things uh, that people were talking about. Uh, was this the right move? Uh, our own YouTube channel has posted a two-hour crew. Hurricane, Hurricane moves on his on their own time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Is that large, like Nightbot? the Nightbot. No, I, th I think it's <laughs> I think it's us. I think it's our own. It's coming. The house is the calls from coming inside the house. So. Gerard, you can decline to, to assess this. We can wait until. No, I think we've already made our. I think we've already made our, our call on whether the Golden Hour was a success or not. It was a success just by the ratio of commits that they had. We said a recruiting weekend is usually graded as a success or a failure based upon 50% of okay. the, the, the recruits that visited that weekend committing. Now, we've never seen – it was unprecedented USC having, you know, 23-something, 24 – official visitors on campus one weekend. It was, you know, uh, th that's never happened before. I mean, I think the most that they had were like eight, maybe 11 at some point uh, during the Pete Carroll era. So to have two, you know, to, to basically have two dozen recruits on campus, that's a lot of commits that you got to get to get to that 50%. But they still were pretty close to it. I mean, they were, they were still pretty close to it. So, I mean, the guys that were of that weekend, David Peavy, Amos Telelele, um, Quentin Joyner, and now, you know, a lot of these guys, some of these guys, I'm going to say a lot of them, but some of them were already committed coming into the weekend. You know, right? Quentin Joyner was already committed. Um, you know, uh, Peterson? I, I think, uh, yeah, Mary Peterson was already committed. Uh, David Peavy, though, that's that's a commit that they got from that weekend. Uh, Bra uh, Braylon Shelby was a big commit that they got from that weekend. Uh, they were able to get Zach Branch. He was already committed. Alani Noah they got from that weekend. Micah Benuelos they got from that weekend. And uh, who else did they get from that weekend? Uh, that's it. That's that's the that's that's the group that they got that was not committed going into the weekend, that committed coming away from the weekend. So altogether, when you're talking about the numbers of guys, because we're also com you know including in that two dozen that visited guys like Malachi Nelson and Mikhail Lemon that were already committed. So I think of the guys that were not committed. 
Um, you know, you're, you're, you're still at that, like, 50% ratio. Uh, now, certainly you could argue, you know, you, list, you, you missed out on Francis Maragoa. Uh, you missed out on a guy like Edric Hill, which, you know, I think was a traction recruit anyways, kind of a long shot. Uh, they missed out on Anthony Hill, Jalen Hale, which are big-time recruits. Certainly there's some guys on here that are misses. Braxton Myers ends up decommitting. He was actually committed to USC when he visited USC during the Golden Hour weekend. So it, it's an interesting group, but I think overall we have to say that it was successful. I think bringing in that many recruits all at once, um, certainly it helped with the offensive line. I mean, I think it helped with Micah Benuelos and Alani Noah getting them together and having them being able to come together and build that bond a little bit and, uh, you know, it didn't work out, unfortunately, for Francis Maui Gold because I think the thought was, hey, get them all together. Um, and that didn't really happen. But, yeah, I mean, I think it was definitely a success. I think it's something you're probably going to see from them next year. I think they're going to have a big weekend. I think big recruiting weekends where you bring in 20-odd recruits is just something that you see nowadays. I mean, you saw it from Ohio State. I think Clemson had like 31 kids come in the first weekend of June uh, last year. So the only thing is – there's only so many weekends that you have. <laughs> you only have three weekends in June where you can take official visits or host official visits. So everybody's going to be scrambling to try to schedule their big official visit when. And a lot of criticism from USC, um, it wasn't from USC, but towards USC, from the USC fan base, was that you didn't have the last visits for those guys. That was the biggest issue. A lot of people felt like, if you're going to have a big recruiting weekend, you need to have it the last week of June. So you have the last say in what's going on because a lot of these guys are going to make their commitments in July and August. And so that was kind of a little bit of a back and forth. We'll see if USC adjusts the weekend and tries to get it uh, the last weekend of June. But like I said, there's only so many weekends and everybody wants to bring those kids in. And there's a lot of overlap between Ohio State and Alabama and Clemson and et cetera when you're going after like four-star, five-star guys. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have a special guest. A special guest has just walked into the room. The overhead camera. The, overhead camera. the owner is here at the studio and he's kicking us out. You're not no, quite. Not. You're not quite in. You have to move in a little bit. Ryan Abraham has just uh, arrived with. He's brought something with cookie, cookies. Cookies. Oh, cookies. Nice. He is Crumble here. No, I'm <laughs> doing a. I don't want one right now, Ryan. This is live. <laughs> I'll take one for later, but I mean. I don't know. What is this? Well, since Ryan is here, is this that? is my time to remind people this that. And this is an Oreo chocolate? Oh, this 60% off on an annual membership. You have 30 minutes until that flash sale ends. The oh, big yeah. boss. Uh, yeah, can I get some hashtags for the boss man in here? Uh, I'll let the. What are, what are the options? So this, is like <laughs> a, this is a chilled uh, with like uh, oh. frosting. I think it's a regular chocolate chip. And then some kind That's of a chocolate, chocolate chip? Oh, they all look so good. Dealer's choice. You decide. One has Oreos on it. It's a it cookie it? with cookies on it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Brownies Think and about cookies. that. Take this. Uh, Ryan, I may have inadvertently given away shirts. Perfect. <laughs> and His there, own shirt? there, people wanted a Trader Joe's gift card giveaway. I don't have the power to do that. Yeah, I have. Uh, we can do two fifty dollar card giveaways. Ooh, we can so do two so fifty dollar. Like, yeah, so the, the, the chat, however you want to do it. <laughs> Like so, most donations or something, whatever you want to do. I have a hundred dollars of Trader Joe's to give away, and apparently two sh shirts. Crumble, Crumble is, Crumble's not an official sponsor, but, sponsor but but they, they could be. be. Yeah. <laughs> they could be. Ryan out here hustling, <laughs> trying to get a third uh, sponsor out here for us. So, how you doing? I'm good. good. He's good. <laughs> two hour crew. Two hour crew. Two hour crew. <laughs> Were you watching for two hours? No, I went to dinner. <laughs> So you're not the two hour. No, crew. no, yeah. You are not. You in don't fact, get the hashtag. You are not, in but fact. But we got a bunch of a uh, hashtag boss. That's man. typical, Ryan. This, this is I've worked <laughs> with this man for 20 years, and this is like exactly what happens. It's just like we're working. It's like yeah, but you know we got to make it fun somehow. So like let's go get some ice cream, some cookies, or something. We have to do something to. But Chris and I are just. This is this is what we do. We just do the thing. Like we just. Like, oh, do the thing. we're just doing the thing, you know, myopic, like it's a recruiting signing day show. Let's talk about recruiting and signing day. Although I did mention Trader Joe's tamales, which Ryan, he did. I heard that. Yeah. 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 Of course he heard it. It's a sponsorship. He's like, I gotta, I gotta make sure that. Yeah, uh, $250 uh, Trader Joe's gift cards, however you want to do it. 
however I want to do it. How do I want to do it? I don't know. I have a don't. I have a don't know. Just because you walked in the door, Ryan. Let me throw <laughs> it up on the thing. Uh, from uh, nope, that's not the right one. I feel like I've been clicking them correctly, but they're just not coming in correctly on a. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. Ten dollars from Roland Bossman. When are you planning a pair style fishing trip? Ooh, I think I got one. <laughs> you don't. Yeah. Don't ask him twice. Golf and I'm fishing. I get these guys to go fishing. They don't want to go. I don't know how to fish, Ryan. I can show you. I showed you how to play craps. I can show you how to fish. Yeah, you should pick an elite uh, group of peristyle subscribers. <laughs> an elite. Do they have to have an elite? And then take speed? them on a uh, on a peristyle fishing trip. I love it. And then I had another ten dollar donation from Rene Cortez. Uh, seen a lot of USC offers announcement on Twitter. Is this normal compared to previous Helton years? Uh, referring to all the, the offers that have been out there. Oh, the offers. I thought it was the announcements of... Um, no, just a, like... The, the commitments uh, from today. Maybe 50, 60 offers? That seems like a lot. Yeah, I mean... Thank you, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you for those two donations. Uh, Roland, I, uh, Ryan will get you an answer to a fishing trip. Mm. If, if Yeah, Ryan will do it. He'll, he'll get it. He'll get it done. I would say with the scholarship offers... Um, <laughs> it would, uh, Chris, don't break character. Um, I gotta throw... it's a sign of the times. I mean, listen, Alabama has been giving 200 plus scholarship offers and they've been winning national championships. They don't have 200 scholarships to give, right? Like, I mean, not even close, but scholarship offers nowadays. Uh, I used to say, I've, I've changed this now, Chris, I've changed this. I oh. used to say there were like flowers on the first date. They're not even that anymore. They're not even worth the flowers. It's a business card. They're, they're, yeah. It, no, it's it's basically, hey, how you doing? Hey, we like your film. Here's an offer. And that's it. And sometimes those kids will continue to be recruited beyond that point. And then a lot of times they won't be. Nobody will follow up with that recruitment. Later, Ryan. Ryan's Bye, Ryan. Ryan's, Ryan's off. dropping off cookies and leaving. Yep. Like a, like a goat. Like the goat. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. hey. Uh, right there for you. Oh, good. Christmas yeah. present, yes. Yeah, delayed Christmas present. Ryan takes off. And <laughs> so that's his, that's his Christmas present. Thank you. All right, man. It's not a ping pong table right. <laughs> or, or, or a pool table. And I'll let you know how we will distribute those Trader Joe's gift cards. Yeah, I know. I'll figure it out in the three hours we have left. <laughs> three hours, yes. Three hours and one commitment on signing day. What would happen if we had, uh, you know, ten commitments if, on signing if day? If Deuce, Robin, if Deuce... And Roderick and everybody. Screw committed. it, Warren. Had we had like a surprise, you know, flip on signing day. It would be we'd be here all night. Um, but nevertheless, I, I mean, I I think it's sort of um, just a sign of the times. You know, offers are really just initially. Hey, you know, uh, we're interested in you, and, and sometimes that's followed up by actual recruitment and communication, and sometimes it's not. And so, yeah, the numbers are there. Uh, there's a lot of out of state offers. The guys that um, will probably never step foot on campus at USC. So it's not something to necessarily um, put too much stock into. You know, it's it's we'll see who ends up on campus this spring. You know, we'll see who's here for unofficial visits, how many times they take unofficial visits and whether those unofficial visits end up being official visits. Um, now, the interesting dynamic that's changing with recruiting in front of our very eyes is the official unofficial visit. And the fact that now that you have NIL and you have these collectives and they're able to pay for visits, uh, unofficial visits are not what they used to be. Unofficial visit meant more because you would have a kid and his family coming in on their own dime to visit a school. So you'd say, okay, they're pretty serious about that college. If they want to come down and they're going to pay for that flight and they're going to pay for that hotel room. But now that you've got NIL, you have some boosters or some shell company that's paying for everything and putting them up in this great hotel – you know, does that really mean that they're that interested? It means that the school is interested, but is the visit really showing that the, the recruit is reciprocating that type of interest? I don't know. I, I think that's something that we kind of have to see. The, the NIL, the transfers, this is sort of all in flux. This is happening right now, real time. And we're really not going to know what to make of it for a while, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we're stuck in that limbo period where we figure out what becomes of the NCAA. Do they still exist as they do now? Do they transform themselves into some type of different regulating body? Does a player union of some sort pop up? 
um, because you're going to have collective bargaining agreements that have to come. And all of this stuff is still – there's still stuff that has to happen that hasn't happened. You know, there, There's still a lot of things that are completely up in the wind, and uh, we're just kind of waiting to see what goes on. And it's, it's, it's exciting and fun to watch it in real time, and then it's also frustrating because – you know, the fans, they're used to, to, to what college football was, and that's not necessarily what college football is going to be. So everybody sort of wants to fast forward and get to the point where it's like, okay, at least we have a certain expectation of what's going to happen, and we don't right now. We're literally in a spot where we don't know what's going to happen of NIL. We're not going to know what's going to happen with the portal. Uh, we're not going to know what happens with college football probably three or four years from now. I mean, we could potentially be looking at – a point in time where the players unionize and all of a sudden now, you know, what does the NCAA do in trying to regulate schools which are not employing uh, a group of people that are unionized and being paid by someone else? Like, I don't know if that exists another place in uh, at least the Western world where you've got a union that's that's has workers that are working for an entity that actually doesn't pay them. It's someone else that pays them. And so they're having to unionize to have some type of collecting bargaining agreement for deals and endorsements that come through. Like, let's say EA, the Electronic Arts, makes a college football game. Well, every, they want all the players from all the teams to be in the college football game. Well, EA Sports does not want to have to negotiate with every single college football player on every team. You need someone that represents the players from each team, and then those people come together as a union, and then they talk about what are we going to be happy with, what kind of number can we come to, 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 to an understanding where we are all happy and we're going to sign off on it. That doesn't exist right now, guys. That's still out there. And so, you know, the NCAA football game has been delayed, and that doesn't shock me. I kind of almost predicted that because – there's still a lot of stuff going on with NIL right now and in college football. So, you know, is the farm system still, you know, our future? We, we just don't know. And, and would that be a good thing or a bad thing? I think it would obviously be very different because all of you have an emotional investment in college football because many of you are alums. Right? Many of you went to that school. You walk the same halls as these recruits are going to walk. And so that just means more to you. Whereas the NFL, where you have franchises, it, it is it is regulated well and it is run better, uh, but you only have a, a emotional attachment to it because maybe you lived in that area or you have somebody that lived in that area. You know, people have all kinds of different reasons why they like. I mean, Chris likes the Dallas Cowboys, and I don't think Chris ever lived in Dallas, right? So you know, but that but it's like you know the Terps versus Dallas Cowboys. You know, how is that for you, Chris? Like. If if you because you have to look at this if you've got a farm system then you just have area, uh, sort of like minor league sort of NFL teams right and, and and I think it would still be popular it definitely be more popular than baseball minor league but it still wouldn't have the emotional investment that you have with you know kids going to schools that other people went to how would that how do you think that would work for you like from that point of view where you follow Maryland sports and you follow the Dallas Cowboys, how is that different for you? Well, I guess for me, because you, you mentioned the emotional connection fans have to those schools, I literally would go to games since I was a child. I would be on campus with my parents. I went to the University of Maryland. I would walk by the stadium every day going to class. I would be in class with football players. So I had this emotional connection to the program. And while I still have an emotional connection to the Dallas Cowboys, in a sense, it's it's further removed from from that the heart of it because, you know, I didn't live in Dallas. I don't, you know, go to the stadium. I didn't spend four years around that stadium. Yeah. And again, a, a NFL stadium is not a college town. Everything kind of centers around, uh, not centers around, but you know, you're a customer. <laughs> yeah, I have a customer and at the end of the day and I and like for Maryland for an example the the campus is like uh, excuse me the the stadium is literally right on campus. I could see out my freshman dorm room and look into wow. the football field. It's like the center of campus and it's like this 
the eye of a hurricane, if you will. You know, I'm always around it. I was always around it. And, you know, it's a little bit different with other colleges, like the Coliseum isn't on USC's campus, but still it, it's part of the, the university of life. And so there's this emotional connection. And I mean, yeah, I see what you're saying in terms of it being, you know, maybe a farm system and it would take a little bit of it out for me yeah in that sense but i think still a lot of people would still i think it'd still be popular it's football right and football is very popular and if you were still getting the best players at that level and you didn't you know have any kind of sort of guys trying to jump guys couldn't jump to the nfl from high school that would be a disaster but yeah i mean if you still had the best players at that level even though it's professional or semi-professional i don't know how you would categorize that um you know, I think it still would be very popular, but it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same. And we just don't know if it comes to that. You know, certainly the talk of unions and the talk of employment, that scares the colleges the most because then the tax man comes knocking on the door and they're no longer tax exempt because they've got employees and they've got benefits and everything else that they have to pay. So, yeah, there's just um, a, a lot that uh, we just don't know about the process. So, you know, when you're asking about, is it normal for USC to send out this many scholarship offers? Um, you know, it's not terribly abnormal, but it's the last thing you need to worry about as far as the changing of the guard when we talk about new things and uh, the, the evolving, you know, sort of college football that uh, we know and love. I have another $10 donation from Moneybags Manford. Who else? Manford! 10K, I saw you at the Tulane game. I didn't realize how much you have to walk up and down the field. How many steps do you get in, and how heavy is that big camera you have to carry? The Cotton Bowl was a... Thank you for the donation, as always. Thank you the, very much. The, the Cotton Bowl was unique because Canon was actually doing a program where you could borrow one of their cameras free of charge. So they just gave me what I projected to be maybe a $15,000 camera wow. just to have. And shoot for the entire game just to try it out. Now, be uh, keep in mind that, yes, while I have photography experience, everyone else essentially renting a camera was like an actual, like, <laughs> real photographer. That, like, they do this for a living and not like a quote-unquote amateur photographer. But still, to have, you know, an elite-level camera in my hands was just incredible. And that thing was that thing was heavy, but I was also terrified of dropping it. Uh, I don't really uh, know how to calculate how many steps. I, I don't have a tracker or anything, but I would say it's a lot. Shotgun probably does a little bit more than me because for the most part when I'm filming, I'm posted up in the yeah, on one video, side. You, yeah. I'm posted up for the most part in the end zone, and then when I, I switch over. But for that game, I was running back a little bit more. You could not shoot video for that game, so I wasn't uh, posted up a little. I was moving around trying to get different spots for – for photos with that nice camera. So I was moving a little bit more than usual, but I do run up and down. You know, I'm trying to get ghost notes as well, try to, you know, go to the sideline, and go behind the bench and getting yelled at by staffers to leave the bench. So it's, it's, it's definitely a grind running around, but it doesn't feel like that much. I would say, I don't know, a thousand steps. I don't, no, it's got to be more than that. More be than probably... that. I, I don't know. I don't know how to calculate steps. Like I don't know what. Uh... I'm trying to think. Uh, oh, I know how many calories you 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 tend to burn like around uh, maybe like 2,800 calories probably just walking around a football field on a Friday night when I'm just like shooting video and stuff. So yeah, I mean, and it, I say it's not that much. No, wait, excuse me. I mean, that's a day. That would be like a day. So. I mean, in and of itself, it's probably like 650, 700 calories, which um, I don't know. I, I don't I, I don't have my Fitbit to, to look at, see what uh, what that usually is. But that's that's usually how many calories it is. I can tell you how many calories. It's about 650 calories usually running around, um, at least for my fat ass. But anyways, um, I had a question for Madford while we were doxing people today. <laughs> Who is what, Madford? Are you on the pair stall, my guy? Are you you're like uh, coming through? He and, and the Mitch uh, the last time we had um, Money with, Mitchell, Money Mitchell, yeah. What I mean, you know, I, I'd like to know if Madford's actually uh, he could be an insider. We don't even know, you know, the, the, our pair style insiders um, who 
<laughs> it's always a, a, a good. The uh, tables have turned. You're asking man for a good thread. Yeah, a question. Yeah, we're, maybe we'll give him a shirt, or we're giving him something to Trader Joe's to answer that question. There you go. Uh, Shotgun actually chimed in from our account on this little steps question. He said, "I usually get ten to fifteen thousand steps on a game day when I'm running around the yeah, sidelines." Yeah, that sounds right. Ten, yeah, ten thousand. Yeah. And like I said, he's running a lot more than I am. He's running around like a madman, taking photos, moving up and down the sidelines. So, I would say I probably I'm probably like maybe eight thousand steps. I'm definitely less than Shotgun running around like a like with a, a suit and tie on, nonetheless. Uh, we had a suit. He does monocle full. Full, Top hat. The whole whole shebang. Uh, we have a comment from Eddie Reyna. Watching while getting an EKG at Urgent Care. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Okay, Eddie. I, at I, Urgent I, Care? I, I appreciate the... Not an emergency? Uh, they have EJ, EKGs at Urgent Care? Yeah. I think they just send you to the emergency. Call the ambulance if it's... Uh... <laughs> I appreciate the dedication, but please take care of yourself. We are... <laughs> he's going to be trying to watch it while he's uh, the nurse is fiddling with the... With the thing, hope you're okay there, buddy. Yeah. But just wanted to throw that on because that is some serious uh, dedication uh, going on there. So we'll we'll I'll, I'll keep on the 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 lookout for Manford if he if he responds to you, Gerard. Okay. We'll, we'll see. We'll try to flush him out. The peristyle but, needs to know who's who's our benefactor. Who's our benefactor? Get this guy an NIL something. Get it'd him be fun, It'd be bus. really it'd be really funny if we actually banned him uh, like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know it. <laughs> I'm terribly the, I'm unfortunate the also and then someone actually suggested that we should give one of the trader joe's two money bags manford yeah uh i think that's fair he's given enough money over these two yeah he's he's paid <laughs> for 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 both of them <laughs> he's done enough to buy off a four-star prospect at a power five conference at least so, so what I think, are you trying to say he's a louisville fan no i'm oh. just saying i'm just saying he's he's donated enough and been gracious enough that I'm going to give one of the gift cards to Moneybags Manford. So we still have one up for grabs. I'm not sure how we'll give that one out. If anyone has a suggestion, uh, we will do it that way. Let's keep it moving, though, because we're kind of moving out of signing day. But you did have one sort of uh, point here about National Signing Day is that did the porthole kill National Signing Day, Gerard? Yes. Or did December kill? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I was going to say. Who shot first? I, I, yeah. December, I, I, I think, um, yeah, it was, uh, he bled out. Uh, from, people People miss February as being the, the one. I know I do. Uh, I think, yeah, I do too. I think that, um, yeah, college football jumped, jumped the shark there with the early signing period. <laughs> jumped the shark. And the transfer portal. And the transfer portal, like, again, for some colleges isn't as important as for others. I mean, for USC, it's been. Very important. It's been as important as the high school football signing period. But for others, you know, Alabama and uh, Georgia and Ohio State and some of these other schools, they have not been as aggressive in the portal, obviously because they don't have to be. So they've built their roster to a point where they're pretty happy with it unless they have guys that they want to kind of sort of weed out. And we saw, I think, this past year, uh, the first portal window, a lot of guys from that 2020 class – you got to remember that 2020 class was full of kids, and it's really the 21 class, but that 2020 cycle where you had COVID and you didn't have guys playing. And so, especially on the West Coast, you had this truncated sort of season that they had in the spring, and some kids like Corey Foreman, uh, they didn't play at all. And so I think the lack of visits and camps and in-person evaluations – uh, resulted in a lot of teams going, okay, well, we got some guys here that are not as good as we thought they were. And so I think um, – I don't know what the total number of transfers in that first uh, porthole window was. I know it was over 1,100 in the first couple of days. <laughs> I think the first week it was like 1,300 or something crazy. So um, I think some of that had to do with the 2020 uh, COVID shutdown and, and coaches not being able to go on the road and not able to have camps. Um, but the schools that are at the top uh, are comfortable with their rosters, and they don't look like they're making the porthole um, like a huge priority for them. You know, they're they're definitely cherry picking and getting some good transfers here and there. 
but they're not, you know, bringing in dozens of guys each cycle. So for them, I don't think the portal is necessarily uh, killed signing day. I think the early signing period has definitely watered down things. And the early signing period, you know, everybody's dealing with the holidays, you know, and, and, and there's all kinds of things going on. The coaching searches are going on. It, it, not everybody really focuses on it. Whereas today, if we didn't have an early signing period, and all those guys that were going to sign in December would be signing today, I mean, it, today would be a much bigger. Even though for USC, it would have still been the same amount, <laughs> the same amount of guys that ended up committing because USC didn't get anybody on the early signing day. Um, so, I mean, they didn't get any commitments on the early signing day. Uh, but you still would have had all those guys that were recruited, and there's still that, you know, who sent the faxes in sort of thing, you know. Um, so I think it definitely would have been bigger, and I think the early signing period definitely killed it. I think you could have an early signing period earlier and you would have less guys committing and less guys signing, but it would be for the, you know, the quarterbacks and some of those, those few players that were really serious and focused on that school and weren't just going there for, you know, kind of superfluous reasons. And I think, you know, that's what you get. And that's why you have so many transfers, unfortunately, is that guys commit to schools for the wrong reason. Uh, Manford has answered you. Money yes. Bags is here. I am on the P and don't post much, but I read almost every entry. Chris okay. once commented on one of my posts asking if I was Moneybags Manford. <laughs> really? I, yeah, I, <laughs> I did that recently. I just don't remember. Like, I lost track of it. Like, you know, I can't, I, I don't get notifications for being tagged or anyone responding. So I remember I asked it. I feel like it was late at night and I just kind of forgot about it. So <laughs> he is, in fact, there you go. Moneybags Manford. There I you found go. him on so, the Peristyle. The Peristyle, please. Please give him some respect. Put some respect on this man's name. He's uh, supporting the site. And he's got a $50 Trader Joe's gift card you can coming get some tamales. his way. Get some tamales. Get some uh, the trail mix is good with the chocolate chips in it. You'd like that. Oh, there you go. Another plug. I'll figure out a way to get that to him. But, yeah. But I still have one more to give out, as I mentioned. So still got to get that out. We are at about 400 people watching us live. That is amazing. We lost 100, Chris. But we're still going strong, baby. Those aren't. Those there could be four people in here, and we would just you know. still be going. Uh, we have 258 likes. Can we get to 300? The National 247 show was really screeching along to get 300 likes. I think we can get, we can surpass 300 likes. If we can get 300 likes, that'd be amazing. So if you can hit that like button, we're at 258. Is that the one with Josh Platt? Plate? Uh, no, that's their. Uh, that show's a monster. Uh, okay. It's their new 247 kind of recruiting show okay okay uh, with emily and blair's on that he was on there today oh nice. i remember blair was on uh blair came out on our blair live came show on this last time the so. east coast he was up he's in nashville so maybe he's still up uh so no we'll is, aren't they aren't isn't that in fort lauderdale or something like that i thought he was in Florida. i thought they were in nashville this time i don't oh, know this time okay this time around i thought they were in nashville but we'll see Nash but yeah Vegas. that's the, that's their new national show okay. which is a recruiting show so i think we and our composite two-star recruits can uh get 300 likes so please hit that like button gerard you talked about the death of national signing day yeah i want to get into some team stuff i want to get into uh -oh. some outlook of the 2023 uh -oh. stuff i want to talk about offensive line i want to talk about defensive line someone asked me on the peristyle to rank the my top 10 transfers to the 2023 season from this cycle so far so i'm going to share that that ranking, and you can tear it apart. You can agree ranking? with me. Ranking? Oh, you mean from the players individually, not from a the grade. Play. No, overall. no, no, players individually, yeah. like in terms of impact, like yeah. the biggest kind of impact. But for starters, I wanted to talk about Ethan White because a lot of people, the Florida transfer, USC interior offensive lineman who is officially signed, he has been recently minted a four-star prospect by the 24-7 Sports Transfer Rankings. And that seems to be the number one gripe with fans after USC gets a transfer is like, when are the transfer rankings going to get updated? <laughs> when are the transfer rankings going to get updated? I get that question so much. But finally, Ethan Wright has a transfer grade. He is a four-star prospect. He is a 90 rating. And that was good enough to bump USC all the way up from, I believe they were five or six, all the way up to number two. So they are back to number two. They're about four points off the lead of the number one transfer class, which, as you as we mentioned, there will be another portal yep. uh, period. So USC can absolutely get some more players in and uh, 
take back the number one ranking, maybe have it two years in a row. But Ethan White is a four-star prospect. I know people thought he should be ranked higher than a 90 rating, uh, Gerard. Yeah, I kind of think so, too. 90, because 89, you start getting in the three-star. So he's a pretty low four-star, I think, at, at 90 as the ratings go. So I could see him, yeah, a little higher, a little more like 93, you know. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're splitting hairs there. Is, so you're ranking him as the number one transfer that USC got? No, no, no. I was just... No, no, no. I was just ref- no. He's not number one. I'm gonna get to my list in a little bit. Oh, okay. uh, I would. I was just wanting to get into that by bringing up that he is now a four star prospect. Okay. Because a lot of people were saying. Uh, but we'll have to see where he ends up on your rankings. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we could go into that right now. I did also want to mention, speaking of transfer portal news, is that redshirt freshman defensive tackle Colin Mobley oh, yeah. pulled his name out. Of the transfer portal, if you remember, he is, was a three-star prospect in the 2021 class. Out of the DMV, actually a graduate DeMatha. of DeMatha Catholic High School, which, if you're not familiar, which is my alma mater, I was a DeMatha stag as well. So we have that connection, the blue and red, and he has decided to stay at USC, and we'll see what happens. At, at I, This isn't a guarantee that he's going to be on the roster for the 2023 season. Right. But at least points to, you know, maybe him sticking around and competing in the spring. USC does, could use some more defensive tackle bodies, six foot four, 290 pounds when he enrolled. You're hoping he's g- gained a little bit of weight, maybe uh, eclipsed that 300 mark. He was injured in spring camp of last year, so pretty much missed all of that and seemed to be a little bit banged up going to fall and summer as well. So, Really did not really start practicing with the team until the middle of the season, early in the season, and for the most part was a scout team player. You hope he can make that jump and maybe be, you know, suit up on game days, maybe be a special teams guy, and you know, maybe compete to be in that too deep. We'll see. Again, six foot four, two hundred ninety pounds, out of the DMV, three star prospect in the twenty twenty one class. Gerard, you don't have to comment on him, but I just wanted to note to people that maybe weren't aware, but he is sticking on the roster at least for at least through spring camp, it seems. Let's get to these rankings. I want to hear Oh them. boy, I'm a little bit uh nervous about this. So someone on the peristyle asked me to do this and I was like, sure, let's let's do it. Um so top ten, I'm gonna start from ten and up, or should I go the opposite? What do you think? Oh no, you should go from we'll go from ten and up. Ten and up. Okay. Make it suspenseful. Make it suspenseful. Well, I'm looking at it now, and I'm <laughs> second-guessing myself. But I'm just going down whatever I put down first, and then I'll let the crowd and Gerard rip me to shreds after that. Should I just read them all, or do you want to go one by one? And you'll be like, I hate it. I love it. You're dumb. Let's go. Let's go one by one. Okay. So, number 10, I just, like, gut reaction. Number 10, Jack Sullivan. Okay. Maybe a little bit too low on my first ranking, but we'll have to go through the rest of the nine to really figure out if he's too low. But number 10, I just did Jack Sullivan. Edge rusher from Purdue and has some productivity. Could be a starter, you know, a replacement guy who could play defensive end, rush end, kind of that replacement for Nick Figueroa. USC needs more consistency getting in the quarterback. Jack Sullivan has proven that he can do that at the Big Ten level, so we'll see what that looks like in the Pac-12. But Jack Sullivan, number 10 on my list, Gerard. Okay. Hate it or love it? There's only 12 transfers, (laughs) so (laughs) I'm interested to see who you left out. Okay. Um, Fair enough. uh, Because I don't have this written down, folks. I, I... Chris sprung this on me, so I don't like have my own list. I'm looking. He's doing a list live. He's just kind of. Right now. And um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean. You're looking at my list or you're. I'm looking looking at at the the commits. You know, I'm thinking, you know, who's here out of the 12, you know, where I would put Jack Sullivan. I I think that's, I mean, that's respectable. That's, That's not crazy. No. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay, well, number nine. Number nine. And again, this is ranking based on sort of impact. There's really only one guy I'm curious to see where you put him, but go ahead. Oh, no. 
I don't like the sound of that. But this question was based on sort of like the 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 potential impact for next season, and yeah, that was kind of the criteria. So number nine, which looking at it now, I hate that I have him at nine, but I I'm just going with the first instinct, and that was wide receiver Dorian Singer. Hmm. Kind of hate looking at it. That's kind of low because I think he's going to get a bunch of catches, a bunch of yards, could be the number one wide receiver. But I kind of went with the importance of other guys on this list. So. Yeah, right. Need first. Need first. So nine is D- Dorian Singer. Okay. You can hate it or love it. Okay. And then number eight, I went with cornerback Christian Roland Wallace. You know, lots of starts to his name, a veteran. USC's cornerback room, you know, a little young, not a lot of starts. You know, Sierra, Sierra Wright got some experience. Jacoby Covington got some experience. You wish Damani Jackson had gotten more experience. You're losing Makai Blackman, all Pac-12 uh, cornerback, and you're bringing in a veteran guy like uh, Christian Roland Wallace, who I think you could, you know, slide in there, be a starter uh, immediately and not, not, not skip a beat, but, you know, be a be a veteran dependable guy who's started a lot of games so for him i went with eight uh so two arizonans two wild former wildcats back yeah you don't have anyone from the high school ranks to supplement that position either as of now so not that i thought you know roderick pleasant was going to come in and compete for that starting job right away but you know with dorian singer i can see where your you know logic is Yes, you need someone to replace Jordan Addison, of course, but uh, you know you have two guys from the high school ranks that are going to help do that in Makai Lemon and Zachariah Branch, and so you don't have anybody like that on the defensive side of the ball to uh, replace Makai Blackman. Now you also have some other receivers that also left, you know Kyle Ford, C.J. Williams, and Kerry Bryant. Uh, but if you're just looking at the guys that were you know, super contributing last year, you know, who are, who are going to be able to take over and come in. Yeah, I understand where uh, I think the need for Singer is just not quite uh, as high as it is for Christian Rowan Wallace. I agree with that. Yeah. Someone saying Honey Badger saying nine a little low for Dorian Singer. Look, I already, I already, I already put myself over the coals saying it was too low. So, but I'm going to keep it rolling. I wrote this, this, uh, list, uh, Sorry, Dorian Singer. I wrote this list in pen, so I have to go with it. Uh, number seven, offensive tackle, Michael Tarquin, the big six foot six, 300 pounder out, 320 pounder out of Florida. You know, a guy who has right tackle experience in the SEC, who we think could be the right tackle next se- starting right tackle next season, maybe shift Jonah Monheim inside to right guard. That's going to be a very interesting thing to see in the spring. What happens with Mason Murphy? Jonah Monheim, does he actually move inside to the right guard spot? We don't know, but Michael Tarquin could easily be a right tackle starter for this team next year. So I have him at seven. Okay. Number seven. Sorry, number six. six. That comes before seven. Yes. I'm all screwed up with my numbers. Uh, Number six, I have linebacker. Jamil Muhammad. Okay. Just because, you know, I'm putting an emphasis on that defensive front. And Muhammad is a guy that you were really big on. That that love of Jamil Muhammad has really rubbed off on me. <laughs> I'm and I'm you. becoming a Jamil Muhammad guy. You know, I watch the tape, love the athleticism, guy who can get to the quarterback, make plays in the backfield. So putting an emphasis on defense right now. So I have him at number six. Okay. Number five. Looking at it, maybe a little bit too low, but he is in the top five. I will say that. I have inside linebacker Mason Cobb. I think he is going to, you know, kind of be like Eric Gentry in a sense where he can be step in from day one and be a starter. You know, coming in in the spring, like we assume, he's going to have plenty of time to learn the playbook, plenty of time to get used to his new team, his new defense, new coaches and all that. I think Mason Cobb, I project Mason Cobb to be, you know, on the field, starting lineup, game one for the Trojans. So Mason Cobb, number five for me on my list. Okay. I would – that would be one that I think is maybe a little low. I don't know. Fair? Yeah. Fair. A little low. Not not crazy. I mean, because I'm I'm on the Tackett Curtis 
crazy trade. We're already on record. To starting on record. and bumping Mason Cobb over to Will Linebacker, but we'll see how that goes. But, um, okay, okay. People are people are already ripping my list up in the chat. I, I I agree. This is a live show, so I have to take it as it comes. But we're moving on. I'm Number I'm four. soldiering on. Number four, defensive tackle Keon Bars. I'm putting up there. USC needs some Bubba's on the front. They need some Bubba's who has experience and need some Bubba's that can play, especially on the interior. I think Keon Bars, while you know not the sexiest pickup, if you will, uh, from the transfer portal. I think it's a very solid pickup. Six foot three, 300 pounds, a guy who has started multiple years in the Pac-12, uh, was a second-team All-Pac-12 player in 2021, has good tape, also could be an instant day-one starter at defensive tackle in the middle. So I have Keon Bars at number four. That's high. That's one that I disagree with. That's sure. the first one that I would disagree with. Again, I was going more with need on it's this It's so one. easy for me to sit here in armchair, though. I mean, I'm sitting here, you know. <laughs> You're literally armchairing, but that's okay. I love you. This is why we do this show. Moving on. Three. Now unless the top you, three. Unless you want to rip me a little bit more. <laughs> no, I, I'm interested to see uh, if a, I'm interested to see what the top three okay, is. Okay, number three. Interior offensive lineman, Ethan White, the projected left guard starter. We talked about him being a four-star prospect, number 90. I think that's a plug-and-play, wipe-your-hands-of-it, move-on kind of guy. Big, six foot four, 330 pounds, a monster in the middle, and that's a guy who's going to protect Caleb Williams on the interior. Second team all AP second team all SEC did not allow a sack or a QB hit last season. Can be a wall in there in the interior. So I have Ethan White as number three. Okay. Right. Number two. Things are getting spicy now. I have defensive lineman Anthony Lucas. And before everyone storms the studio and carries me out and throws me into the river in the back. Five star talent, yes. Six foot six, yes. Two hundred seventy pounds, eighty pounds, whatever. Does not have a ton of production at the college level, and that's the only real thing that was keeping him from number one for me. While he's supremely talented, lots of potential, we don't know what we're gonna get, and that's fine. And I think we're gonna get a good amount, but I went a little bit more with production over. That five-star pedigree here. Right. Proven commodity. Proven commodity. So that's why I have Anthony Lucas at two. I don't even want to look at the comments right now. <laughs> Number one, punter Eddie. No, okay. Number one, offensive tackle Jared Kingston is my number one. The left tackle, you know, an upgrade at left tackle. You need to protect Caleb Williams. God, you need to protect Caleb Williams, as, as most USC fans would say. So... <laughs> Jared Kingston did get a little bit banged up last year, but when he was healthy, did not allow a sack or a QB hit. All Pac-12 potential. I think he's rated too low for what he is right now. He is very he is very underrated. Yeah, I just saw that he was an, he's an 89. Yeah. So he's an 89, three star, and yeah, he's a four star. That he's definitely a four star. This is a guy that people were trying to project and scout for the NFL if he left early. So yeah, I think he's definitely. A four-star. I agree with you there. So to run it through, Jack Sullivan, Dorian Singer, Christian Roland Wallace, Michael Tarquin, Jamil Muhammad, top five being Mason Cobb, Keon Bars, Ethan White, Anthony Lucas, Jared Kingston. If you asked me to do it again, I'd probably move Dorian Singer up, I don't know, a couple spots. I'd probably move Mason Cobb up at least one spot, maybe drop Bars down a couple spots as well. But for the most part, I don't think I would change my top three. That is my list. Gerard. <laughs> Chat, do what you will. Are you in the crucifix? Yeah, I don't even want to look at the chat, but I have to because I'm the producer. <laughs> Damn it! I would say there is one guy that I was interested to see where you put him, and you didn't even put him in your top ten. Eddie Chapleski. Look, man, Eddie Chapleski. What is he? First team of conference. He was like, he's. Big time. He's a big time punter. I'm a former punter, and I just punting is winning, as Nick uh, Rick Neuheisel used to say. Um, I like Eddie Chaplesky to be in that top ten. The chat is roasting me for no Eddie Chaplesky. Oh, really? Are so, they? Yeah, <laughs> he'd be up there, man. He'd be like six, 
maybe for me, seven, six, somewhere. He'd be he'd be up there. I think he's going to be a guy that's going to be an immediate impact player for them. And and you talk about proven commodities, he's actually a proven commodity. I think Bars would probably not make it. Okay. And yeah, I would. I, I'd be. I'd be a debate between you know Tarquin and maybe Marshawn Lloyd in terms. You're saying of, you said drop. Uh, who who wouldn't make it in the top ten? Okay. Yeah. So um, I like Tarquin, and you know USC needs good offensive linemen, and, and you know it's it's one of those things that just uh, overall having a good solid offensive lineman who 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 played at the power five level I think is very important for USC. So I think Tarquin would would make it in there. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd would not. But I I, I agree with you. I kind of think it kind of goes Jack Sullivan. Um, and then I'd probably have... So you don't hate my list? I don't hate your list. No, okay. no, no. I, I'm i surprised that Ch- Chaplisky is kind of... Yeah, he would... That's one of the biggest ones I, I, that was kind of omitted. I, I was surprised that you didn't have that. I would have myself also put Jerry Kingston as number one and Anthony uh, Lucas number two because I just... Yeah, I, I, I've, I've, I've made the whole point of... We need to evaluate prospects by their college film as transfers, not as their high school film, right? And and so with Anthony Lucas, I can't be a hypocrite and say, well, yeah, just o- overlook that. You know, just gloss over the fact that he didn't play a lot last year. The good thing is he wasn't hurt. He didn't have any, like, knee s- surgeries or season-ending surgeries that are going to keep him from playing uh, at USC or, or cl- keep him from participating in spring ball. And the second thing is, Texas a and was absolutely stacked out of their gourd with defensive linemen. I mean, they had the most ridiculous class of defensive linemen. I think they had five defensive linemen that were five stars in that 2022 class. And they had guys on the roster already that were good players. Guys that USC would love to have. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a combination of things. Walter Nolan? Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, he came into that class. Uh, he was part of the 22 class. I'm just, I just love a good uh, – we'll save him from unsubstantiated rumor. Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think overall, like, there's a ton of talent there, and uh, you, you know, the other thing that makes me a little wary is, you know, he wants to sort of do the I can play on the edge thing, and it's like USC really needs a three technique, like we really need inside guys, and so we'll see how that affects his impact. But yeah, he he if he had a little more production, he, he'd be number one for sure. But I, I put Jerry Kingston out there. I think as a left tackle, it's, it's huge. It's a, it's a money position, man. Like that's we're talking about draft picks here, and we're looking at this like it's a draft. That's huge. Um, so I, I think that he goes there. Then Anthony Lewis. I actually probably put Ethan White number three. I mean, because you got a guy, you know, second team, uh, all conference in the SEC, and uh, like I said, you know, he, he's he's a big kid. You would assume that he's just a run blocker and he's just a guy you could hike the ball and you lean forward but he's actually a better pass blocker than he is a run blocker he's probably got to get a little better at run blocking i think a lot of that has to do with getting used to his frame is his, his new weight you know coming from 400 pounds down to 340 330 pounds so you know that's something that he's going to have to get better at but he, he's still good at it you know it's not like he's that that's a that's a weakness. It's just I actually think he's a better pass blocker than he is a run blocker at this point. Um, so I think USC's getting something uh, pretty good there with Ethan White. So that would definitely be my top. Can three. I show a? Can I uh, run off a quick uh, chats uh, list? Okay. Big T thirty seven says okay. Lucas one, Cobb second, White three, Kingston four, Marshawn Lloyd five, Tarquin six. Boy, Marshawn Lloyd, pretty high That's there. That's pretty high. Yep. Eight, Muhammad. Nine, Roland Wallace. Ten, Singer. Eleven, Sullivan. Twelve, Chaplitsky. Ooh. I think people are saying Ch- we're not. They're not going to punt this that much this year. Yeah, I'd like Chaplitsky. I think that's uh, dude. All you got to do is punt once and have a bad punt in a close game, <laughs> and you're going to be kicking yourself. No pun intended. That you didn't have a better punter. I mean, that's um, yeah. It's one of those things that. Uh, you know, you and USC's development of the punt game. Everybody talked about why don't they have a special teams coach that's full time? Why don't they have a special teams coach that's full time? And I don't know. Give credit to whoever the hell was coaching the kickers. Um, they went from being not being able to really punt the ball at all at spring ball. That's the spring game. You the punting looked like a JV game in, in spring ball. Like it was bad. It was Pop Warner level. I mean, they were kicking the ball left and right and it was going off in the sideline it was like a you know 
10 yard punt, 15 yard punt. And then in the beginning of the season, they didn't have to punt very much, luckily, but they did a couple times and it was uh, it was a little cringy. And then get it to like where they're midseason at the end of the year, they're actually punting the ball very well. They actually were, were decent punting the ball. And for USC with that offense, you just don't want to give up big plays punting the ball. You just don't want to flip the field with the bad punt. So, I mean, I think Chaplisky is a big. I, when you you got You guys got to look and see what Chaplisky did last year. He was a good player for Arizona State. He was one of their standouts. So, I mean, you're getting you probably. I mean, people think he was probably the best punter in the conference last year. He was. He was All Pac-12 first team. So, you know, <laughs> it's tough to beat that. So I, I'm gonna say, yeah, he, he he's got to be in that top ten for sure. He'd be like, I think, like seven for me, maybe maybe six or something. Yeah, Lloyd. Um, I just feel because you've got uh, Austin Jones coming back and he can do some of the things Lloyd does. And then you've got those freshmen. And I think that's the same argument with Christian Roland Wallace being ranked higher than Dorian Singer because Dorian Singer comes in. Dorian Singer was very productive, very good player. But it's like, who else do you have? You know, what other options do you have there? Uh, because you have some other options there at receiver, I don't necessarily know you have an option like that. Um, at, at defensive back, at cornerback specifically, to be able to come in for uh, Makai Blackman, I think that you know you you you've got some young talent there. We talked about it, but nobody's necessarily just stepped up and been that guy that um, you don't necessarily need uh, Christian Roller Wallace to, to play from the first game. Yeah, I have another list that has Kingston at number one, Lucas at two, Cobb at three, Bars at four, White at five. That's the top five. And where do you have Cobb on your list? Cobb would be... Because um, you already locked in those three, so you had to put him at four, right? Yeah, he'd be like five or four, something like something like that. He you was know? five on mine. But, I mean, I said, you know, I'm on the tack <laughs> of Curtis uh, sort of bandwagon for him to be a starter from, from day one. Um, it's That's a lot for a freshman, you know. I'm not trying to put pressure on the kid, but, you know, he's in the weight room. He's doing his thing. And, um, you know... It, it, USC can prove <laughs> prove a lot. <laughs> the second uh, the second level of the defense, man, they were awful. They were awful when when Eric Gentry went out. That's really where they looked the worst. I mean, their their defensive line is void of elite talent. It is void of guys that are really playing. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't think any of those players, with all due respect, have a chance at sniffing the NFL. So you know, they actually played above their heads. Um, quite frankly, uh, on, on the interior defensive line. You know, I mean, it's always a blurred line when you say defensive line. You've got guys like, well, Solomon Bird part of the defensive line. Is Corey Foreman part of the defensive line? Is, you know, Tui Toy Pelotu. Um, outside of Tuli, there's just, there's nobody there in that in that defensive line, uh, particularly the interior that are like NFL level guys. Or I, I mean, even, not even in the conversation, right? You know, so that that's, 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 they played above their heads as just to get to where they were. That's why they need to get better, obviously. That's why they need guy, more guys like Anthony Lucas and maybe Walter Nolan. Um, but it's, uh, you, it, you just, know, it, the, 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 right the, the second level of the defense had more talent. There's some talent there, but it performed even worse. Maybe it's the expectations. I don't know. But they, they did not perform the way they needed to. And um, I think that's that's going to be where, you know, Tackett can can make an impact. He could be a, a starter. Um, you know, it's just going to be interesting to see how uh, it goes with Mason Cobb and, you know, what 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 they do there. That's going to be all Alex Grinch uh, and, and Brian Odom to some extent. But it's going to be like, you know, who can execute the game plan the best? Who can who could be a three down linebacker and who's not going to give up big plays? I remember when. Alan Bradford um, came to USC, and Alan Bradford was originally recruited uh, by law schools as a safety, which was kind of nonsense, but, you know, he loved to hear it, you know, because, again, everybody wants to play the next position over where it's perceived to be more as athletic. You know, the the, the, the linebackers want to be safety. The safeties want to be cornerbacks. You know, I've said it time and time again. Um, tight ends want to be receivers. But, you know, USC was like, hey, we'll bring you in as a linebacker, right? And USC was rolling. This is, again – a, a, amazing class. I think that was the class where they brought in like six running backs. You know, they had Stephon Johnson, they had Emmanuel Moody, they had CJ Cable, they just stacked class, you know, the, the various positions. And so, you know, uh, Alan Bradford started out on uh, playing linebacker for, for USC. Um, but 
the, the I remember having a conversation with one of the coaches, and they eventually bring him over to play running back, and I was you know surprised by that, and I said so you know I I, I you know I thought he's going to be like an all American linebacker for you guys, and the issue was just the playbook and not understanding things, and he and, and basically what I was told was. You know, on defense he gives up touchdowns. On offense he might give up a sack. And you go that that that's that's the difference. That's the big difference. It's, you know, so defense, you know, there's sometimes even though you think there's less to know, the potential of you having a breakdown and giving up a score is you know it it, it definitely keeps coaches up at night. So sometimes it's harder for them to play those freshmen. You know, if you go out there as a freshman, as a wide receiver, and then you line up wrong, okay, whatever, delay a game. You drop a ball, okay, whatever, you drop the ball. But, you know, if you're a cornerback and you're a freshman and you just blow your assignment and you're in man coverage, that's six. That's six you're giving up. And if you're on a wheel route with a running back and you just don't take that route and he's right down the sideline alone, that's six. So, yeah, defensive players, it's sometimes tough for those coaches to put them um, as freshmen in the, in the starting lineup. So we'll see. If uh, if if USC's got the confidence in in Taka Curtis and he gains that confidence, you know he's got to play to that level. He's got to do those things in practice that shows that he's not going to give up big plays. You know he, he's going to make some mistakes, but they're not going to be huge mistakes. Granted, you know this is a different team. I mean, offensively they could score enough points that hey, you can give up a couple touchdowns. Maybe the maybe the give and take for that. You know, having a guy in there that's uh, just that much better of a player on most downs, just because he gives up one or two big plays, is is still. Um, still uh, acceptable a couple of production updates we have surpassed three hours so okay. you know what that time it is if you've been here the whole time i need some three hour crews to go up on it means you've made it to the island huh to the island yeah do you know what the reference that is no i do not <laughs> Gilligan's island a three-hour tour oh is that it was it a three-hour <laughs> tour, three that hour tour yeah into the the gilligan's isle i d i did not no, that's every day I learned. Killigan's Islands. I mean, that's before my day. But did you ever watch any of that? Just even though it was. I mean, I think old. I. I think I randomly would see it like on what was that old time uh, TV? Nickelodeon. Uh, nah, Nick at Night. Right? Yeah, Nick at Night. But I feel like there was like a channel that specifically showed. Yeah. Older shows. Antenna TV has like old shows. What's the one with the the whistling? Oh, um, Andy Griffith. Andy Griffith yeah. show. That's a good show. That's good. You know, with Ron Howard. What is that about? Uh, Mayberry. It's just about I'm be honest, being I never really watched past the intro. He's a sheriff there, and it's like a small little town, and it's like small town nonsense. You know, they have the town drunk Otis, who like just takes himself into his own cell every night after getting hammered, and he basically just sleeps at the jail. It's got uh, Don Knotts in it too from Three's Company. That's that's a little before your time as well. The name Don Knotts sounds familiar, but I I have nothing. <laughs> to to add to that, I'm sure that the chat is uh, roasting me right now. We also surpassed 300 likes. We're at 304, so yeah! thank you very much. Still holding strong at about 450 people watching. Because it's top of the hour, I just have to throw up. They just want to see you Schlosser. dunk on Eddie Chaplisky. Dunk on Eddie Chaplisky. Yeah, we're holding strong at the three hour mark. We were trying to. Surpass last time's mark. We uh, just need more commits on signing day. We Come just need on. more commits on signing day. Uh, shout out to Meredith Schlosser and her team. You can visit her website at www.meredithschlosser.com. Top 1.5% of agents in the nation. Over 200 plus five star Zillow reviews. Five star realtor is the official sponsor of the two star podcast. I love it. And now we're going to. I'm lost. Oh, no. <laughs> I thought I had it. No, I have it. So let me throw up some three-hour... TV Land! Thank you. Thank yeah, that's you. Nickelodeon. Is it? Yes. TV think, Land is Nickelodeon. Is it? Yes. It's the same thing. Somebody, it's a... Uh, hashtag Gerard's Island, someone says. <laughs> it's like... Um, someone confirmed that. Is that TV Land? It's I like a Cartoon Land Network this... Adult Swim. It's, it's the really? same thing. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well... Uh, I have a two-hour crew because someone was late. That's fine. I'm still going to throw you up here. You're, you're in there with Ryan. Actually, yeah, Ryan's there, part right. of the half-an-hour crew. He's probably not even watching now. <laughs> I think he's still in there. He just posted yeah. a link to a story oh, up right, there. there so he, he's, he's home, uh, and he's... Uh, I did also... I had a donation from none other than Moneybags Manford, who... G-Mart... Hold on. It's going yes. up here now. $10, $10 from Yes, Manford. sir. Thank you. G-Mart, can you give me your... 
thoughts on my latest post on the P. I greatly appreciate the message. It's too long to post in the super chat. Manford, if you can, can you DM me that on uspeople.com and I will get it read to Gerard here live? I don't see it on at least the front page and it's going to take way too long. Does it to have to do about Urban Meyer? Is it discussing Urban Meyer? I don't think so. But if you're, if you can hear this message, can you please uh, DM me and I will get it in my note, my inbox, and I will read it to him once we can uh, sort that out. And I will get him here. He cannot go anywhere, so he has to answer. Wait, I think I found it. I think this is it. I'm looking for it. I don't see it. Uh, I, I he has a post here about. Lincoln Riley's offense, but that's not uh, breaking. Is he breaking this down? Interesting. Yeah, if you could just send me which post you want me to read, and I'll, I'll get that answered for you. But, yeah, I did find his post, but I don't know if that's the right one. So I just want to make sure I'm answering the correct one. So that is my top ten list. You guys can tear it apart. Tear it apart. Be nice about it. <laughs> I don't hate the list after hearing your thoughts on it. No, I don't think it's uh, way off. I, I, I obviously you I feel know. like I nailed the top three. I'm sorry to Eddie Chaplitsky or his family <laughs> listening. They're going to punt, what, 20 times next season? Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I mean, could be more. And maybe. I left off a DeMatha alum. You know how much that hurt? Marshawn Lloyd? Yeah. I guess so. I don't know how much it hurts. I didn't go to the math. So I left off. I, a former punter, a punter, and a DeMatha grad. That's like... You've lost your roots, Chris. Oh, my goodness. You forgot where you came from. Punting at DeMatha. <laughs> you didn't punt at DeMatha, though. You I did not I did not punt at DeMatha. That would have been the, the cherry on top. But, yes. <laughs> Somebody did punt your, uh, your school bag on the top of the roof there, but that's another story. It was actually the top of a locker room. Uh, sorry, the top of a locker. Oh, a locker as a joke and a guy who's in the NBA right now, Victor Oladipo. If you're a basketball fan, you might, uh, I feel like maybe we've gotten some more NBA fans after your <laughs> NBA breakdown <laughs> my, in the last my, episode. My nonsense breakdown of somebody who I couldn't even remember their name. I, I helped you out, but Victor Oladipo, I think he's still in the league. Pretty good player at Indiana. He was walking by and I was like, Hey, cause he's like six foot four super athletic like hey any any chance you could uh, help me out here and he's like no no so i had to shimmy my way up as only a cilantro boy can do i thought that he's the one who did that no he was just happened to be walking oh, by it was just something oh. my friends did no he he, was, he didn't he <laughs> was just friend. he was just he was uh yeah maybe maybe not my friends no i'm pretty sure it was uh it was a harmless prank but i also thought it was still there no, no, no. I, I got that bad boy. I had, oh, my homework okay. I had to get it down. I could just leave it up there. I, I couldn't. But yeah, that's my Victor Oladipo story. For anyone that knows who Victor Oladipo is, if you're an NBA fan. But that moves on to there. I think while we wait for Moneybags Manford to send me this uh, post, I think I can run down some scholarship offers. Yeah. Which I feel like is... Speaking of which, that would have been a good uh, trans uh, segue there um, from the question about you know, is it normal for them to put out this many right. offers? Out? But I'm not a good producer, so that didn't happen. <laughs> I'm always looking for the segue. I'm always the seamless segue. Now you're thinking like a producer. I don't think like a producer. Well, I'm a I broadcast like journalism it. major. You're a print guy, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a print guy. Yeah, see, they, don't have, they don't have segues and transitions and print. Well, they kind of do. They kind of do. But not, not, not quite as elegant as the broadcast. Keep it simple, <laughs> stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. That's broadcast. We have more 2024 offers because we only really have 2024 on the radar, even though there have been some 2025 and 2026s. But I feel like we had 12 two weeks ago, 12 last week, less this week, but still a substantial amount. I have Bountiful. Is that Bountiful? Bountiful. Bountiful. Safety. Oh, I practiced this, and so now I'm going to butcher it. Falatua Satua. No. Falatua Satuala. Safety from Utah. Houston, Texas safety. Damani Maxson. Los Al cornerback. 
Isaiah Rubin, who was actually at Desert Pines but transferred to Los Al. He gets that. He's a four-star prospect. He picked up that offer following an unofficial visit to USC over the weekend. North Richland Hills, Texas guard Daniel Cruz, Forney, Texas cornerback Aaron Flowers, Austin, Texas offensive tackle Blake Frazier, Clearwater cornerback Jarvis Boatwright, Los Angeles Cathedral wide receiver Xavier Jordan, local kid, four-star Utah offensive tackle Isaiah Garcia, and then Orendel, New Jersey, offensive tackle Nair Daniels and the one that jumps out to me is Nair Daniels because I went ahead and watched some of his huddle he is a big big boy three-star prospect six foot seven 340 pounds and Gerard, I don't know if you watch this film but he does not look like a sloppy 340 pounds it looks like it fits on his frame quite well and Boy, does this guy do some pancakes. There's there's a there's a clip in there where a kid's helmet literally flies off and then for a second I think it's his head. <laughs> I don't know what the the competition level is. At, well, wait, he's playing at Orendale, New Jersey. Is it Bergen Catholic cuz that's Brian Cushing's old high school. Yeah, it's Bergen Catholic. Bergen Catholic's good high school. Okay. So, yeah, he's doing against some good good competition. Go watch his tape. Now you're Daniels fun tape to watch. Uh, New Jersey kids, they love SC. They do. We talked about it on this on this podcast a lot. How much they love they like a LA. Bit of SC. They like the big city. They're not scared of it. They're not looking around to go bass fishing. Uh, yeah, I think um, the USC. I mean, that's the the argument for going into the DMV harder. Um, and certainly, you know, the DMV has a lot of great prospects. DMV, though, and you, I mean, we have someone from the DMV here who can answer this question. I have never been to the DMV. Well, I have, I've been to Baltimore, um, but I haven't really been around uh, the area as a whole, like the region. Are there some areas in the DMV that are kind of out of the way that are not super city that, I mean, because I remember Percy Harvin. I remember speaking to Percy Harvin, and he had a country-ass accent. He was, like, very country-sounding. Now, I don't know that what where that came from but you know he was from hampton virginia not is that considered that's still considered or is that tidewater i mean i i, I don't know i don't tidewater know. kind of hampton virginia while is virginia obviously that's not really considered dmv dmv okay. it, it it more refers to kind of the city like alexandria those kind of cities that are kind of like right around washington dc you know where a lot of people commute from going into uh dc to work and then come out that that's more like southern virginia and that's its own type of thing you know that's yeah. where like uh uh alan iverson is from that kind it. of area yeah, michael vick is from there i yep. believe yep. that's a whole different obviously a very big talent pool out there so but some different really good... pace of life i i, get, right. yes. I gather okay a lot more southern yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i think it kind of reminds me of florida except for the heat is different. It's not. I, I feel like cold similar. is different too. <laughs> yeah, that, that's tr- very, very true. It's it's Florida with cold. That that <laughs> area yeah. and athletes are kind of similar with that, out the mud, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, there. But there are definitely places in the DMV that are far away from the city. It takes a long time to get to places. Everything's further apart, uh, far apart. Because like in California. It could take me a while to get somewhere, but it's not that far for when I'm back home in Maryland and we, we're kind of in the, the boondocks, but you have to drive like 45 minutes to an hour sometimes just to get somewhere you need to go. And you're actually driving that amount of time yeah. as opposed to... Here, and there's no just, traffic. There's the traffic, no traffic. Yeah, that's the difference in that's LA. That's the difference. It'll take you two hours and you're, you're driving somewhere that normally in another place would take you, you know, half an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like here. For me, <laughs> if it's 45 minutes, I have to drive a distance of 45 minutes to get there in yeah. LA. It's I'm more, I'm mostly waiting around to go. I'm driving five miles and it takes me 45 minutes, kind of deal. That, yeah. That's the difference. So, yes, a lot everything's further out from each other. Uh, we have Shotgun doing producing. Oh, research. yeah, Shotgun's in Jersey, so yeah, he should. That's uh, true. He will send him out to see, uh, uh, 
Daniel Nyer. Uh, research says TV Land is a spinoff of Nick at Night and was originally named Nick at Night's TV Land. Right. Yeah. So Gerard with the point, the trivia point, if you will. Uh, Manfred sent me the PM, so I will look that up. Unless there's anything you want to comment about any of these offers, Gerard, I don't. You know, there's a lot of names right now. Like just we said, um, it's, uh, you know, we're going to see what happens with, uh, you know, I think Isaiah Rubin, you know, transferring over to Los Al and being there now is, is going to be interesting. He's going to be more local. That's one of the top cornerback uh, recruits on USC's board. So, you know, you always kind of look at the local offers a little harder than the national offers because, you know, you offer some kids from Florida, some kids from New Jersey. I always, I always check out the, the, the offers from North Carolina, which <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember the last kid from North Carolina that USC had an official visit. Uh, South Carolina as well. It's, it's pretty tough to recruit that far into the South. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out with some of these players. You know, got a few Texas players, not as many Georgia players this week we had like the last two weeks where we read off these offers it was like you know six or seven players from georgia so um you know a little different xavier jordan we actually have an update coming from xavier jordan the wide receiver from los angeles cathedral high school xavier jordan very confident young man very confident young man a lot of people feel like he's a special too and uh, usc should be uh, all in on him so um, you have the uh, decommitment from Aaron Butler, as we talked about before, an athlete. I think he wants to play receiver a little more than cornerback, but USC was kind of pushing for him to play defensive back. I mean, that kind of goes back to the whole Dante Williams thing, obviously, with, with him decommitting as well as uh, Aaron White, Aaron Jet White. Um, we're going to see what happens with uh, the defensive back. So, you know, you got Isaiah Rubin on the board. Um, we'll see here probably the next month or so, another junior day of sorts. And you will see we'll have a bunch of these guys down uh, for official visits. The interesting thing, and I, I think I'm, I'm going to preface this now because I, I know at some point during the spring we're going to get, why doesn't USC have more commits? Why doesn't USC have more commits? I think that's going to be another part of this evolution of the recruiting process is, are we going to see as many early commits? Because now that you have NIL, that means if you want the best offer as a parent, you want to get your kid out there you got to take visits to multiple schools. You got to get them out there. And some people may be able to do that. Some people may take them a little longer to take unofficial visits, quote unquote, and official visits and get to see everything through the process. And whether you want to wait till the end to make a commitment and see, you know, if there's a bidding war that, that, that transpires or you want to go ahead and just jump on a place because you feel comfortable with it. So this is another aspect that we're going to see. It's going to be a little different. I think the days of everybody committing over the summer, uh, I don't know if they're going to end completely, but I could see that slowing down a bit. I could see where more guys want to wait it out just to kind of see, you know, what's out there in terms of endorsements and sponsorships. Uh, and, and, of course, not everybody's going to be in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. I have Manford's question teed up. It's about you, uh, Lincoln Riley's offense, uh -huh. and he posted a – uh, analysts breaking down the offense. Okay. Uh, the analyst who does these breakdowns believes that USC's offense will only get better. Mm -hmm. He observed that from watching Lincoln Riley at Oklahoma and at USC. The majority of his offensive system has yet to be implemented. Unless Riley changes his approach and strays away from what worked well at Oklahoma, the USC offense was rather basic last year. However, with a second year in the system, it is expected that USC will have more comprehensive and effective offensive game plans leading to improved performance in the future. Possible. I mean, it was Caleb Williams second year in the offense. And obviously the quarterback position is the most pivotal when it comes to what you can run and what you can't run. The other thing is that you are continuing to bring in transfers. And so, you know, it's a second year and there's more players are going to know more of the playbook, but you're also going to have a bunch of new players there as well. Chris brought it up on the last podcast that that whole left side of the offensive line could end up being completely new with Ethan White and uh, uh, Jared Kingston both being there. So, yeah, I mean, I haven't gone back and looked at what they've done at Oklahoma, um, you know, in, in, the, in the last couple of years uh, when he was there. And then, you know, that transition to 
what they're doing at USC that they didn't do at Oklahoma or that they did a lot of. You know, there's there's only so much you're going to do a lot of, right? You kind of have to have your bread and butter, right? The GT counter and certain things that you do. Uh, I thought the offense was really good. I mean, listen, it, I don't have a monopoly on wisdom. They could get better, I guess. You know, I mean, it, the offense was just very good, very prolific. You could make the argument it was good against a lot of bad defenses. You know, I mean, Arizona wasn't a great defense. Arizona State wasn't a great defense. There was a bunch of defenses that weren't necessarily fantastic. So they they could get better. My feeling, though, is the expectations you got to know that the defenses are also going to get better. And the defenses are probably going to catch up to some of the things that Oklahoma slash now USC is doing just because they're going to have more film with that personnel. And knowing the quarterback, first and foremost, can be a big deal. Just knowing his tendencies, being able to scout him more in that offense, I think is going to help the defenses, you know, maybe maybe close in a little bit. And again, you know, figuring out is not figuring everything out. It's just figuring out certain things that they like to do a lot of and the tendencies and that, you know, kind of becomes more difficult to do because you're not really taking anybody by surprise. At the same time, I also said, with the offensive line and, and getting a little more physical, you know, they might be able to bully some teams a little more. And it doesn't matter if the defenses start to figure out, oh, they like to do this little thing. And, oh, okay, when they line up here and they're this down a distance, look for this screen pass here or look for this. They're trying to get this person the ball. Why? Because now you have, you know, a whole season or a season and a half of film where you've been able to figure out that tendency you know, at the end of the day, if the game becomes close, it's like mano a mano. You know, who's 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 going to get that third and two? Well, sometimes it's just a matter of having the guys up front to be able to do it, and that's where USC is getting to. You know, they're they're not having to jerry rig their offensive line with you know guys that are like okay, you know, kind of good players, and then there's some guys that are not really great players, but you're trying to develop them into better players, and then you get a transfer in there and whatever. I mean, last year's line was just not the most; it was one of the least talented lines. From a from a player uh, potential standpoint, coming out of high school, um, this offensive line is going to be a little better, and then progressively you could see where they could get better and better. It's certainly nowhere near the offensive lines that USC had when Pete Carroll was there. I mean, maybe if you can compare them to the original offensive lines, but you know what, the first offensive line he had there wasn't very good uh, that first year where they went six and six, but that whole unit came back the next year. They brought in Tim Davis. And they got that much better. And then from that point on, really, you know, when they brought in Pat Rule, they didn't have a bad offensive line. They had a, they had more talent. He was a good recruiter, but he also could move guys around. And even though they lacked depth, and I, I often argued with Pat, he needed to pound the table harder for more offensive linemen. Uh, they they got it done. You know, they were able to move guys in and out, and even guys that were the three stars were able to get in there, and they got a lot of contributions from them. So. Uh, you know, USC's got a little bit of ways to go from the talent standpoint, but I do think they're upgrading. You know, now you got to see that on the defensive line. That's really where they still got some work to do. Gerard, how you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing good. This cookie is staring me in the eye, though. I'm smelling this cookie. Yeah. I'm just, it's just lofting. It's an Oreo, like, double chocolate fudge with some kind of something going on. It's like a Rocky Road cookie. And, um... Ryan's just like, ha, 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 and just like puts it down in front of me. Like, I'm just going to sit here and eat a cookie during a podcast. Very, it's very, a professional, very, man. Very, very, very evil of him. He knew what he was doing. Uh, Ryan, speak for your, for your crimes in the chat <laughs> if you are still listening. I think we're at a point where I think we're just going to roll out questions for the rest of the show until okay. we, we can run out until we hit this four-hour mark. Because that was what we did last time, so we at least need to get to four hours. We still We're not going to talk about Dylan Riola and his visit to USC on the weekend at all. Oh, that is true. I forgot about that. So, yeah, kick us off. Yeah, yeah. That's another good segue out of the 2024 class. Man, you just that, you're missing those segues for 2024, dude. There's so much going on. I'm not a segue person. <laughs> I'm a get it done and move on person. <laughs> you're trying to click the clicks and you're not clicking the right thing and it's messing you up. Uh, yeah. The number one quarterback in the 2024 class, five-star uh, quarterback, Dylan Riola from um, from Chandler High School in Arizona. Not uh, anymore. Well, he has transferred to Pinnacle High School. Oh, has he? I didn't yeah, know that. That just came know. out today, I believe. Okay. He is going to Pinnacle, but still in Arizona. So, 
Let's see, Pinnacle. Everybody's leaving Pinnacle. I don't know why you go to Pinnacle. <laughs> the school that, uh, you know, they they got talent at Pinnacle for sure, though. Um, and year in and year out, they've got good players at Pinnacle. They got uh, they got beat up by Gilbert pretty good, though. We watched that game. Um, we had, uh, I think Trevor went to that game for us. And, um, yeah, Gilbert just uh, running behind uh, Caleb Lama, who USC missed out on. He's going to, going to Utah. He's going to be a good one. Uh, Gilbert uh, Highland had a very good year last year. But, anyways... Uh, they're going to get um, Dylan Rilla, uh, number one quarterback in the nation. And so he visits USC. He's looking at Georgia. He's looking at Nebraska. USC's, you know, in there again. And obviously, you know, with with Lincoln Riley and that offense and everything that he's done, you know, we talked about where USC goes in the future with the quarterback position and why I think this is such an interesting dynamic that Lincoln Riley is recruiting Dylan Riola. Um, you know, we talk about teams and when we look at the evaluation process and the rankings of players, those rankings being in a vacuum, right? The national guys are looking at attributes in a vacuum. They're not looking at attributes of a player within a certain team. That's, that's what we do. That's sort of where we overlap. And when we do things like the future impact pieces, it's not who is this player? How good is he? Well, you know how good he is. You know what he did in high school. That's fine. But what does he look like within the offense? What does he look like within the depth chart? What does he look like with the play calls? And so, you know, my con my main concern with USC is getting away from what works or more specifically what works for Lincoln Riley. And, and the last few quarterbacks that Lincoln Riley has had have been quarterbacks that could run the ball by design. You know, Jalen Hurts, he's in the Super Bowl. Uh, Kyler Murray, guy that was a first-round pick. Uh, and certain Caleb Williams, a guy that's built more like a running back than he is, you know, a classical six foot five, you know, Carson Palmer type of quarterback. These are guys that you can run the ball by design a handful of times, not just mobile. Uh, Baker Mayfield was mobile. You know, he scrambled around. He had a lot of agility, but he wasn't necessarily a guy that you run the ball with. So it's interesting to see that, you know, Lincoln Riley is, is taking this interest in Riola, not because Riola is not a good player. He's overrated. Not at all. He's a five-star quarterback. He's got a great arm. He's a big kid. He's physical. He can move around. But again, there's a difference between being able to move off your spot and throw the ball and actually run the football as a runner. And so I think, you know, that's the interesting thing. As we go forward, you know, USC is, is continuing to, you know, look at some other quarterback options. Obviously, you're not in the, uh, the, 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 that point in time where USC decided they were going to put all their eggs in that basket and tell Dylan Royola that he was um, the only guy <laughs> for, for their team. And then he subsequently visited Ohio State. And uh, next thing you know, he commits to Ohio State. Uh, DJ Lagway is committed to Florida. We'll see if anything continues with that. You know, we're not going to hear about it, but I could see USC still trying to keep their foot in the door with him. You know, for my money, when we're talking about four-star, five-stars, but we're adding the fit into it, Lagway fits. Lagway fits exactly what they're doing now. And, you know, you, you see a little more of that because of the ability to run the ball. And then Elijah Brown, you know, what happens with Elijah Brown? That's going to be an interesting question because he's still there at modern day, proven winner, uh, not super mobile either, not, not super you're going to run the ball a lot with him, but they do run the ball a little bit with him at modern day. And so we'll see, you know, if, if he continues to be a big part of, of the recruiting process for them. But these quarterbacks, they get things done early. So this is not probably going to go and last too long. Again, the NIL process could change things a little bit. Uh, but, um, you know, unless it's a Jaden Rashada situation, uh, I don't think this is going to go on for too, too long. Yeah, the the 2024 QB cycle was looking, I mean, it was still going to be interesting just because it's Lincoln Riley. But with Royola, you know, went ahead and committed to Ohio State. That was a big L, but here we are again. He's uncommitted and just took a visit to USC. The spring is going to be another big time to get him back on campus and see what happens there. Maybe an official visit. And like you said, things move a lot quick, quicker for quarterbacks. They want him to get in those classes. They want him to be the Pied Piper for a class, build around the quarterback, especially yeah. a big time name. That's one of the reasons why DJ Lagway accelerated his process. He was like, I'm ready to get in there and build the number one class. That's what you got to do if you're a big-time program. Get your quarterback in early and then build around it. You saw USC do that with Malachi Nelson. 
and obviously Zachariah Branch was a big part of that that effort. But you know, five star quarterback in your class, that's a, a great recruiting tool. It's someone who can go into all these different circles or at all these different camps. They can you'll get your DM answered a lot quicker from a five star quarterback than a three star quarterback. So that's kind of a move now these days is to get that quarterback in early. So I would assume this is going to be we'll see our next QB development in the springtime and see kind of what what that board is looking like. But it looks like USC certainly back in it for Dylan Rayola. Nebraska is obviously in there. They sent nine assistants to go see him. I wonder what the 10th assistant was doing. Uh, legally, I think you can only bring in nine. I think that's the I thought it was actually seven, but they might change the rule. But why can't you bring in 10? What's the difference? I don't know. That, it's a rule. that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> What's you the can difference? only have so many assistants on the road at a time. Actually, that might just be because of um, they don't they don't want to overwork guys. I don't know. But you're only supposed to have so many guys on the road at one time. Uh, but, you know, hey, uh, Matt Rose is going to be you know pushing hard for that. Uh, Matt Rule. Matt Rhodes? Matt Rule. Matt Rhodes. I love Matt it. Matt Rhodes. I didn't sound right when it came out of my mouth. Uh, I thought you were saying rule with like a weird... Matt Rule? Matt oh, Rule? Like, like Tommy Boy? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I love Tommy Boy. Right. Um, yeah, Matt Rule is, is going to be pushing to make him like their guy, right? You know, that's... Like, hey, you're, you're going to be the face of, the, of, of Nebraska. You're, a legacy. You're, you're, the, you're the legacy guy. And... Um, and hey, you know he's 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 done some good things on the college level. You know he's turned some things around, Temple and Baylor. So uh, that's a great pickup for Nebraska at face value. We know how these things work. Sometimes, you know, it goes the way of Dan Hawkins at Colorado, and you're just like, how did that happen? Why did that? Tom Herman at Texas. How did that go so south so fast? And then they turn around and hired Steve Sarkeesian. But I mean, yeah. how 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 does that not work? You know, on paper it looks like it's the, the home run hire. And Matt Rule at in Nebraska looks like a home run hire. So we'll see, you know, how it shakes out. But that's going to be, you know, the big push from them to, to, to give them a look. And, um, you know, I don't know where Ohio State seems like they're out of it now, which is odd. I don't I don't know what happened there entirely with Ohio State. Uh, but um, it doesn't seem like they're really going to be an option necessarily. And, and we'll see, you know, if, if somebody else doesn't become a factor in his recruitment. You know, Michael Van Buren's out there. Michael Van Buren. St. Francis. Just just throwing it out just there. Just saying there. ESPN told me he's the next Bryce Young. I don't know. QB coach is the one that worked with Caleb, so we'll see. We'll see. Recruiting Doesn't have that offer yet. Slash beat rider was the one who worked with Caleb to get him to swim and not sink. Does, <laughs> Doesn't have an Caleb offer yet. Caleb didn't drown because of uh, some guy that's... Uh, he's pointing at me, folks. That's a, that's a reference to me. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's he's that way for you me. Actually, you actually point... If you point to the side, like, it's like your other oh, no, side. Other this, side. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This guy right there. <laughs> okay, now your finger's gone. Now it's gone. Okay. Okay. We talked about Royola. This is what happens when you go past three hours, folks, or four hours. I don't know where we're at. Let's run through <laughs> questions. I still don't know how to give away this last Trader Joe's gift card, Gerard. I still don't know. I think you should pick it. Huh. And I don't know how you should pick it. I didn't see any <laughs> suggestion in there. Also, Ryan says, eat your cookies. No, we're professionals. <laughs> we're not going to sing we're with our mouthfuls. We're professionals that play professional clips like. Terrible air guitar, but whatever. You get the point. I would have really loved it if you could have continued like the, with the verses there. I don't know what it is, but that would. Do you been. know who sings this song or does this song? Uh, it's the Scorpions, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I asked. I actually, uh, Ryan that, and he looked at me like I was crazy. Cra like, like. Oh, uh, more so disappointed. He knew. Okay. He not that because he didn't know. So. Has anyone in this chat been to a Scorpions show? Maybe that's who will get the thing if they've been to a <laughs> Scorpions show. Anybody know? But Rudolph like, you Shanker. could just you could just say. You could just say you went to a Scorpion show, you know? You could just say that. So we'll see. We'll see. But low, I have, but I have hanging like, fruit. I have like 45 minutes to uh, give out this uh, gift card. So we'll see. Let's get to some questions. I don't think we're just going to run through questions I see in the chat. But we do have 
a voicemail, Gerard. Okay. I did not listen to it, so I do not know. But we know who it's from. But we know who it's from. <laughs> we did this we last got, we time. We got bamboozled last we got time. We got bamboozled. Beginning. Beginning. But I have a feeling we're, we're still good. There goes my phone. Whatever. So let's play this, this uh, two-star question. It seems like it's about the O-line based on the saved file. So let's... Uh, are we going to do it again? Are we going to bet all the donation money again? <laughs> on uh, whether it was Eddie or not? Um, yeah. No. Okay. Well, let's go. We think it's Eddie. We hope it's Eddie. We assume it's Eddie. Let's let's give it a listen. This is for the cilantro bros. Um, quick question. Um, Gerald, you often say that it's a little different recruiting um, linemen, you know, that the NIL, NIL means more to – to them than maybe other groups, um, and that's where USC is having trouble getting big men. Uh, but Hanson, Coach Hanson, seems to have a really good reputation of developing linemen for the NFL. Do you think that's why, you know, guys with one year left before they go into the draft want to, you know, play for him? Um, you know, we got you know, USC picked up three really good linemen who are going to be draft eligible and possibly get picked up next year if they perform well for USC. Is that the difference? Is the difference that the mature guys know, like, my money is the year after my year at USC? Um, thoughts on that. Also, um, Chris, you're awesome, man. All right. I, I look at you as a little brother. All right, man. Talk to you later. later. Bye. Eddie from Orange. <laughs> I really want to know how old Eddie is. Because he sounds so young. If you told me he was 32, I'd be like, wow. So I don't really know. So, if, Eddie, if you're still in the chat, I'd love to know how old you are. Don't dox yourself, of course. Maybe DM me. I don't know. <laughs> we know he's from Orange. His name is Eddie. He's on the P, so he can just. What's your he, age? He, he just uh, <laughs> gives your social, too. You can DM me. I'm just curious. But, Gerard. That was closer to his uh, Alec Baldwin. That was a little, little, little closer to his Alec Baldwin. Fair he enough. wasn't in the car. I don't know what we got the last time we had the live show. He had some different voice, he just threw us off completely. He was like his his Rollo voice or something. Like, yeah, we're fired up for the, the live show. He had some kind of raspy thing going on. I didn't I didn't I didn't know it was him at all until the very Could end. Did you hear that question though? Yeah. In a roundabout way, the question I think was does NIL impact linemen more than it impacts other players? Was that what you got from it? That's but also is that is is Henson's Henson uh, is a very good developer of talent. I think that being the the reason why USC has won recently yes. out of the out of the portal. Well, no, I think it's I think it's because uh, a I think they 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 were better on the field. Obviously, I, I think you saw um, development from Dust, Justin Dejitz. I think Mason Murphy was the big one just because you saw in the beginning of the season how he looked, <laughs> which was out of sorts, to when he came in and played a lot during the latter part of the season. And he actually played pretty well, you know, say probably the Utah game. So I think that's always a sign. Those are little things you kind of watch for or when guys get hurt and their placements come in, how, how, how succinct is that? You know, how, 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 how do you notice it very much? If you notice it, then there's a little bit of a problem. If you don't really notice a big difference or dip in the performance, then somebody's doing their job right. And so I think we've seen that. The movement of the offensive line and their ability where they put Jonah Monheim at different positions and, and guys have performed very well. And I still think that that, from a talent standpoint, is a position that doesn't have a lot of talent. It's not a great position talent-wise. So they performed well. They performed above their head. And so I think that's a good thing. I think... Uh, in terms of the players going forward that they get, uh, yes, development and, and showing that you've developed guys is a big deal. I think uh, Josh Henson is, is is a good recruiter, a good communicator. We saw him at the camp, uh, the first, I think it was a Rising Stars camp, in fact, which is full of guys that USC is not going to recruit. They come out and they shake hands and they kiss babies and whatever, but there's like a thousand kids there. I mean, I remember what year they had 2,000 kids there but this past year I would say what probably a third of that yeah it wasn't that it wasn't the, it, but it was still their biggest camp and they had a lot of kids there and Josh Hansen was like in the stands talking to people and shaking hands and like every time we saw him he was shaking hands with somebody and talking with somebody and he's just clearly just one of those guys that's out there and 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 
you know, wanting to, to, to network. And so I think that bodes well for them. Um, getting to the NL, NIL aspect of it, I don't, I don't, I don't remember saying that the linemen or that's it, NIL is more important for them. I mean, quarterbacks is, is obviously going to be very important. There's, I mean, it just depends on how good of a player you are. Like that's where it comes into play. And certainly NIL beyond just the booster end of it, like you have the donor collective NIL, which is not even really supposed to be a thing. It's not what NIL is supposed to be about, but that's what it's become about. But then you have the beats aspect of NIL. Then you have, you know, Adidas. There you have the actual companies that want to get involved and have these young men endorse and sponsor uh, to, to be a part of their, their, their brands. Those guys, those are the guys that, are, that you know, it, it tends to be the quarterbacks. It tends to be the, the players at the positions that are a little more visible. Um, probably not as much offensive linemen, quite frankly. So I think when it comes to collective and boosters, that's where – they're football guys, and they're guys that are putting money in for a specific purpose, and they know that purpose. They're talking to the coaching staff. That's where your your money for NIL is going to come from, it, it, for alignment. That's where the alignment money is, I think, probably more with the collectives and the boosters than Beats by Dre. Beats by Dre is not looking at Jared Kingston necessarily or, or somebody on the defensive line as being their guy. They're looking for – Caleb Williams, they're looking for Jordan Addison. They're looking for maybe, you know, a, a Reed Brown that, that down the line if he ends up being a guy. They want guys that score touchdowns probably more than that. So I would say, you know, in terms of NIL, that's something that might be hurting USC right now because they've chosen, at least when they went the route of Boulevard, to sort of have this proxy middleman um, to deal with the NIL and maybe not just the people that are paying the money, you know, that are writing the checks. And those guys are the guys with the cash, and those chicks and those gals are the guy are the are the, are the ones that have all those all those 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 dollar bills that they can be able to put into the funds to get the, the Manfords, the, the Manfords, that they get the specific you know players for specific reasons because they actually know who those player are pl those players are. I, I think the 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 big corporate donors or the big corporate people that want to have these people uh the 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 players represent their brands those guys are the the kids filthy casuals those those are the espn like oh who's the popular player in ES? who's trending on espn right now oh it's caleb williams so yeah let's go give him a deal that's that's what you get there whereas you know the 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 big uglies the guys that don't get those touchdowns the people that appreciate them are the peristylers i mean that's i i joked with 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 Devin Brooks, the offensive guard, 2024 uh, offensive guard from Clackamas, Oregon. And we were, I can't remember how we got on the subject, but I, he made some kind of comment about, you know, how, uh, you know, popular positions and guards or whatever, and, and something about taking a visit and feeling like he was a priority. I go, brother, I go, you know, I don't want to, I go, I don't, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. Like, I, I don't want to sound like a recruiting spiel here. I go, but trust me, I post your, 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 your interview and the guys and the gals on our board, the pair style, they want to know all about you. Like they love like us Trojan fans. And I don't know if this is true of every change. Fan base, but Trojan fans are all about the offensive lineman and defensive lineman. Like you guys, that's it. Can he play offensive tackle? <laughs> Can he play left tackle? Can he play left tackle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're another wide receiver, another five-star quarterback. Whatever. Tell us, tell us about this uh, this nose tackle here that uh, you know USC is recruiting. That's six five two thirty. Like that's three thirty, not two thirty. Two thirty, it's a problem. But that's if you're over six foot and three hundred pounds. You're a Parasite yes. favorite. Yes. Every porthole guy, these bums that are jumping out in the porthole, they have two knee surgeries and the bad back and whatever, and they're fifth year seniors, and it's like, we need to get on this guy right now. We need to get he played at Clemson. He has, you know, four years, he has seven tackles and one tackle for loss. <laughs> I guarantee you eighty percent of the Parasite members know who Jericho Johnson is <laughs> and follow yeah. him on social media. Yes. Yes. Whereas there's probably some receivers they don't have any idea or who they are. They don't care. This is Bilbas. True. Bubba's, I keep seeing your phrase. The inner Bubba's? The inner Bubba's the has inner become Bubba's. the new thing <laughs> on uh, uh, 
Ryan wants us to uh, uh, to embrace our inner Bubba by scarfing down on these cookies. Right. There you go. That is our reward for after a hard, long <laughs> uh, four hours of A streaming. hard, long cycle. This is the technically the end of the 2023 recruiting cycle, but it's not the end of season one because, as we've talked you about before, it out. it's April, man. We got we, we we can stretch it out in April. It's I mean it's all changed because of the portal, right? Or I like absolutely to say, the porthole. You 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 made the argument, and I was like, you're right. We're gonna wait until the springtime to officially chop off season one of the of the Pac twelve of the Pac twelve the composite two star <laughs> the podcast of champions the composite two star recruits season one is going a little bit longer, and we will switch over to season two in the spring. Uh, you don't really it doesn't nothing changes. I hope to have a uh, a some music and an intro for season two. Hopefully, add some cool things for season two. So we'll see. We'll see about that. Gerard, people are uh, maybe a little Marvin Gaye. People want uh, they want rumors, Gerard. They want rumors. they want unsubstantiated <laughs> rumors. There's just rumors. Hey, they're just you know things that could happen after the spring, and people figure out whether they've got quarterbacks that can get them the football and. Whether they, you know, want to join their friends that have transferred out of a particular college already. We just have to see how things shake out, you know. I mean, the second window, technically, there wasn't there weren't windows last year. You know, it was mm-hmm. basically you could jump in the, the portal anytime you wanted to. But now, with the second window, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, is there another Jordan Addison potentially there? There's definitely some talk. And I, I said before, the one thing that surprised me is that USC jumped on a running back and... Uh, Marshawn Lloyd didn't seem like he was before Christmas actually a guy that they were really after that hard. It, it really became like after Christmas. So I do wonder if something changed maybe with some other running backs that were potentially going to be out there that weren't out there. It's a weird it's a weird thing, the portal right now. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's like free agency, but you don't know who's going to be a free agent. It's 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 like musical chairs in a way, and, and it's like going into a dark room and you don't know who's in there until the lights come on. Yeah, and it's like, oh, grab him, and then musical chairs. Yeah, yeah, it's like no light on. There's going to be musical chairs, <laughs> and then you realize there's you know there's like three chairs. <laughs> there's 15 people. It's uh it's kind of wild. It's kind of wild, and you know, like I said, we're in the middle of it right now, and it's. It's fun, and then it's also frustrating, you know? It's and, and that's just kind of what we have to put up with and then what we have to deal with. I, I'd love to fast-forward it, you know, five, six years from now and go, okay, this is what's become of it, but we can't. We just don't know um, at this point uh, how things are going to shake out. But in the near future, as far as the second window goes, there definitely could be some heavy hitters in there, you know? They're just a bunch of names and uh, guys that uh, – you know, it, it. I think part of it's gonna it's gonna test the retention of these schools. Okay, again, and you're seeing that where a lot of schools they, they're keeping the guys they want. You know, there's not a lot of guys that are getting away. Texas A&M lost some guys that that they wanted to keep. That's one of the first times where we see one of the SEC schools actually lose a good amount of the talent that they wanted to keep. And uh, USC got one of those guys, and Anthony Lucas. We'll see if they're able to get any more. Um, it would be uh, one of those things where it'd be the best of both worlds. I kind of joke with Brian Peroni, who uh, runs our Texas A&M 24/7 site. He didn't think it was very funny, but I said, you know, it'd be great if uh, I said USC. All they need is really Texas A&M's defensive recruiting, and then they'd be right there with Georgia. You know, like boom, that that gets you there quick. Because if you see the way Texas A&M is recruited, they basically recruit everything that USC hasn't recruited, and then USC's basically recruited everything Texas A&M has recruited. Right. Quarterbacks, receivers, mm-hmm. and everything. Yeah. yeah. Just if they came together, yep, they would win a they'd, national title. Th- then they'd be Georgia. <laughs> That's how then good Georgia's Georgia. recruiting. Yeah, we haven't talked about this, but well, we have mentioned Walter Nolan, and then Walter Nolan caused a stir. He did when he posted on his Instagram. He was just trolling, though. Yeah, he he, he has mastered the art of trolling oh. with a with a post of the portal is looking. What, the portal is looking okay. good right now. Yeah, or something that like that. Something looking pretty good, or looking something. pretty good like that. I don't know if it was deleted. I don't know if he followed up on it. It was just it became a thing on social media, and obviously made its way to the board, the pair style. And people were like, "Gerard, you were right, Walter Nolan." 
And Walter he, Nolan, first of all, Walter Nolan, his name came up before that. I mean, he came up already. Uh, but, you know, there's guys like Xavier Worthy, too, that their names have come up. And they've come up for good reason. They're definitely behind the scenes seeing what's there. And Texas stepped up and said, hey, you know, we're going to we're going to keep this guy happy. And, and that's what they did. And, um, you know, so USC obviously went in another direction there with uh, Dorian Singer. And, and we'll see, you know, if, if there's anybody else out there, if uh, they they could potentially bring in another receiver, I think, you know, if you keep C.J. Williams and or Kyle Ford, Gary Bryant, you, you're able to keep two of those guys, and you're probably not taking another receiver. But, um, you know, they've got those guys that have decided to move on, and there's potential. They, there could even be more movement. Again, I think the second window becomes a lot about retention, and guys are going to see what happens in spring ball. That's the big thing that we're going to wait for. You know, it's going to be what happens in spring ball, and does anybody like Jordan Addison take a look at what's on the roster and realize, okay, I just lost a, lost a quarterback to the NFL. I was a good quarterback. I was a Blitnikoff winner. I got Keaton Slovis coming in now. Let's get on the phone. Let's get on the phone. <laughs> Start making some calls. <laughs> so, you know, we'll see if that happens. We'll see, uh, you know, how it shakes out. That's, that's all we can say is that we can see. Obviously, USC can't, you know, recruit these guys and talk to these guys until they're in the portal. And so um, – you know, we I don't want to stir things up with other fan bases, of course, you know. It's the players that do that. The players that do that? Uh, Walter Nolan's the one that has Instagram post, <laughs> not me. He put that thing out there. Someone posted, uh, Gabriel Dindy, Walter Nolan, LT, Overton, and Shamar Stewart would be amazing. I like how this is written as if USC would get all of like those guys. Any of the, yeah. <laughs> now they're all now they're all up for the hey Anthony Lucas, what is he not a part of that? I mean he's like, see how they're already they're already like okay, yeah, we these got are the this ones guy. still at A and M. Those yeah. are the ones that it's, are still with there. recruiting and recruit Nicks. Okay. This is how I know you're a recruit Nick. It's it's the okay, I got this guy. Okay, who's the next guy? Who's the next guy? Yeah, we got that five star guy. Yeah, he was yesterday. He's whatever. He's he doesn't have any stars anymore because He's committed, and he's going to be signed. What we need to know is the guy that's going to be the next five-star guy. We need that guy. We need that next guy. It's always about the next guy. You are the one, too, apparently is asking if we're still online. They had a business meeting, and they came back. Who? I, I don't, I'm curious to what part of the world you're in if you're having a business meeting <laughs> now. Are you in Norway? What time is it in Norway right now? Are you there? Uh, but yes, we are still on. We're still we're trying to get to this four hour mark, which we're very very close for. So we're I think is that what we're trying to? Look, I went four hours. We went four hours last time. Okay. I'm not going anything less than four hours this time. Oh wow, I didn't I didn't know that. I wasn't. Uh... So we're almost there. I thought you were like promoting we'd be on here for five hours. Actually, I don't. I don't know if we have enough. We do not have enough to talk about. This is the problem with the 24-hour stream. If we were to ever have a 24-hour stream, we would literally have to have something else going on that the fans They would need to get Gabriel Dindy, in. Walter Nolan, LT Overton, and Shamar Stewart. They would need to get all of that. For a 24-hour stream? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. Like, yeah. Can't have, uh, you know, one commitment that's not really going to play at USC next year be the only commitment that we could talk about. And, you know, and one that obviously got away. Um, yeah, you kind of have to have a little more going on. But USC, you know, like I said, it's a signing day. It's not just a USC thing. It's kind of a college football thing. We'll see if it changes. There's talk that they might get rid of the early signing period, which I think would be very, very good. I mean, God almighty, just get rid of having it two days before Christmas, please, because I actually like my family. <laughs> right. Same. Same, same. So as we approach, you know, the final stretch of our show, the final countdown, let's just do some rapid fire questions. If okay. you have some questions, please put question colon and then fire off. You know, I'm looking for kind of short ones because Gerard we're, here. We're looking for a, 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 a Trader Joe's. Um, what I know. What, what's the, we still haven't come to a conclusion on that. Fifty dollars for Trader Joe's tamales. Um <laughs> that know, can only be spent all, on $50 tamales. worth of tamales. 
Uh, what? I, I also appreciate that no one has uh, messed with me and asked me something in Spanish that <laughs> like made last... me read, like donated something where I had to read it in Spanish. Yeah, it's always enjoyable when I listen to Chris like, uh... try to decipher Spanish to me, and, and he's reading it, and it's like I can't even I can't understand. You what know language. what? You know what would be the uh, the worst thing would be someone to ask me a question in Spanish about a, a uh, uh, Polynesian recruit. <laughs> that would be like. The worst thing ever. Uh, Trunk asks, what's USC's plan at defensive tackle? <laughs> yes. That's a big overarching question. And That's a big question because, well, I mean, okay, Keon Bars, who's way up on Chris's list. So, <laughs> oh, come on now. Expectations come on high now. with him. Um, you know, he's coming in. He's kind of replacing that Kobe Pepe, uh, Brandon Peely position, right? You know, you've, you don't have any 300 pounders. On the defensive line, and that's a big issue. You know, if we're looking at what's been successful in college football and college football defenses, and what USC has, not the same. Now, are you trying to reinvent the wheel here? You know, is Alex Grinch saying, you know what, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to go out. We're going to get smaller guys. We're going to have like 270 pound guys that are going to be our interior defensive linemen, and we're going to make it work because we're going to run this kind of scheme. You know, I, I don't. Next year, we're going to figure out if that's the, the case or not, truthfully. Um, and, and if they don't get anybody you know, beyond Keon Bars as a 300-pounder, they're not giving themselves much of a choice but to do that. You know, you bring Colin Mobley back, and like Chris said, he, he's around that 300 mark. Uh, he was one of the only guys left on the defensive line around that 300-pound mark. So, yeah, we're, we're going to see if, if there's a, a sort of a preference in – how they use defensive tackles, but um, that's that's the two key stats I think that they got to improve on again: rush defense and yards per play. The big the big plays in the second half, particularly in the second half, you cannot have big plays like that in the second half. I you know you get up a couple touchdowns and all of a sudden you allow the opposing team to just to just score in a, in a minute forty or something like that, uh, and all of a sudden now you know it's a ten point game, it's a seven point game. That's that's. That's not that's not championship football. Like you gotta you gotta find those opportunities in games to blow team out and get your second team on the field. Get Caleb Williams out there, have him smiling on the sideline for the camera, wearing his beats, making money while he's on the sideline. Don't have him out there in the fourth quarter playing against Colorado, playing against you know whatever team is you know five and five at that point or you know whatever whatever the the the, the records are mediocre type of teams when you got to take that stretch in the in the schedule to blow those teams out and um yeah and that and that for usc i mean the beginning of the season starts with that too you know you've got san jose state and you've got uh, nevada and they need to dominate those teams they don't you don't want to be messing around playing with those teams in the third fourth quarter um and so i think uh yeah the the, the defense has to get better at the at those particular statistics. And I think having interior pass rush helps you a lot. Uh, even, you know, with the run, obviously, if you're bigger inside and you've got playmakers inside, you get some tackles for losses. That's going to help. Uh, but I think um, those third downs that, that teams were, were converting, you know, third and 19, you need to have a three technique that gets up in somebody's face that's six four six five and can make a play in the offensive backfield. Speaking of which, we had a – we answered this before on a past podcast, but Big T37, what are the chances we see Amos Talalele on defense? I think it's very slim. I don't think Josh Henson wants to give up that big body projection. That's when you know the fan base is desperate. When uh, the offensive linemen, they try to move over the defensive line. It should be the other way around. Yeah, we you talked about it should be the other way around. And I don't think we would see that like a Max Gibbs situation unless there was some real, real desperation for the middle of that defense. But I don't think that happens. Uh, another question. Chris Collins wants to know, thoughts on Dejan Lafatite's projection, Gerard? You saw him more than anyone. Yeah, I saw him a bunch. Uh, good player. He's going to take a little time, though. He's not going to come out of the box as uh, a guy that's an immediate impact player. You know, he's going to take some time. But he did play on the outside as well as the inside, which is good. And, um, you know, he and Sam Green kind of talked a little bit about, where you know, we're taking that Thule spot. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, Thule, Thule Pelotu is, is, I mean, athletically, he was a guy that was 260, 265 coming out of high school and played mostly stand-up rush end. Uh, so, you know, he, he 
Sam is, is really an interior defensive lineman whose quickness and speed allows him to sometimes play a little bit on the outside, but I think is an interior guy mostly. And Dejan is uh, certainly an interior guy at about 280, um, 285. He, he'll be a 300-pounder. He's quick, though. I mean, the one thing across the board with the high school defensive linemen that they got, even though they're guys that are going to take some time to get bigger, get stronger, and be able to, to, to contribute consistently, they're all quick. They all got a first step. Um, you know, Elijah Hughes is super quick. Elijah Hughes is probably the most athletic out of that group. Um, but, you know, even with Dejan Lafitte, he played some tight end and some, some fullback uh, for Colony High School in Ontario. And um, as a guy that's, that's a, a good athlete, he's also a, a good leader. Um, you know, they lost a couple games in that stretch. And, you know, he was one of the guys that stepped up and just was like, this is unacceptable and blah, blah, blah. And it's just, you know, and his team listened to him. It wasn't forced. It wasn't that BS kind of like some kids are – you know, trying to trying to be that guy, and, and they're just not that guy. You know, everybody looked at him and was like, all right, you know, we know Dijon's out there, and he's playing hard, and, and he's playing for us, so we got to step up and play for him. So I think that dynamic is really good, um, bringing that to, to the football team in, in the locker room. Um, and, you know, again, hopefully these guys, they, they, they take the time to develop, you know, and they're not impatient, and it's like, okay, I want to I wanna go back home because, you know, I didn't play as a true freshman. Thank you to Trunks with a $2 donation. We just answered this question. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. I had a quick question here for from Tim Prangley. I hope I said that right. For entertainment purposes only, which 2023 Target miss is most likely to be a 2024 Portal edition? <laughs> Interesting. I'm just going to go out of the box a little bit. I'm going to say Lucas Simmons. Ooh. Lucas is a guy we didn't talk about. He was a part of the Golden Hour as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and... Uh, Man, does Lucas leave Florida State that quickly? Also, four-hour crew, hit me if you're there. Hashtag four-hour crew. Man, that's a long list of dudes. Let's see who. Um, trying to think like Warren Roberson. Warren Roberson, <laughs> he's not even there yet. I, you know, oh man, Braxton Myers is interesting going to Ole Miss. You know, I don't know if I'm I'm feeling Ole Miss for him. That was kind of an interesting move. He made, um, you know, Anthony Hill went to Texas A&M. They, they don't necessarily have uh, the best, uh, <laughs> the best uh, track record right now of keeping their, their, top, their top guys. Um, I'm looking at just, like, who officially visited as, you know, guys instead of just going off of, like, the complete target list. Uh, Francis Mamagoa. You figured, like, as bad as Miami was this year, if Francis Mamagoa was just going to flip in a year, he would have flipped, you know, before he even got there. Man. He's thinking about it. Eddie, who was getting an EKG, is back. Eddie, I hope everything is okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure, dude. Trey Wilson. He's really thinking about this. I am. I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to really think. Like, I'm gonna say Braxton Myers for some reason. Braxton doesn't strike me as an Oxford kid. He's he's not a. He's a. He kind of L.A. He's a little L.A. kid that I, I'm surprised that doesn't feel right for me. So I'm just gonna say Braxton Myers. Okay, there there we go. He goes with the Braxton Myers. I have to go back down because I lost all my questions because there's a lot of four hour. Cruise going on. We got to figure out Trader Joe's. Chris Yoshinis. Yoshinoya? Uh, has the O line regressed or gotten better since last year? Now, I don't know if that means from the 2022 line to this upcoming line like last or from year, 2021 December to 31st. 2022. <laughs> I'm going to say either way, the offensive line got better from yeah. 2021 to 2022. Yeah. And as we talked about, I believe the last show, we think the 2023 line is going to be better than the 2022 line, which is weird to say because they're losing two All-Americans, but we think overall across the board, they will be a stronger, better unit. So both, whatever, whichever way you were asking, we think they've gotten better since last year. Uh, Zombie asks, will USC rec recruit more defense than offense in 2024? You know, I have to look at 
the board in terms of who is leaving? I mean, who's potentially leaving? Obviously, there's always that, you know, are they going to go or are they going to to stay, you know, junior year? And that's a, especially hard to, to figure out with transfers because, I mean, Austin Jones is a guy that you go, okay, he's leaving Stanford to go to USC, so he's one and done, right? Well, and he came back. Um, so sometimes these guys, uh, it's it's kind of difficult to project actually where they're going. I mean, they got more guys on offense that are probably going to be moving on just at face value uh, than defense, potentially. You know, um, some of these guys are on COVID years, though. So that also kind of pushes back in terms of their eligibility. But. I mean, at face value right now, you're losing you're losing Austin Jones for sure, John Jackson, Malcolm Epps, Justin Dietrich will finally be gone. Tyrone Telele uh, is on defense. Solomon Tuilaputu is on uh, on defense. Solomon Bird will have gone. I feel like they're going to need to hit linebacker and defensive line pretty hard this cycle. Twenty four. Yeah, twenty four. Yeah, Eric Gentry will be gone. Shane Lee will be gone. Mason Cobb will probably be gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you only signed one linebacker, or I guess an inside linebacker. That we we'll, we'll see how it looks with PV and Shelby, but yeah, defensive line is definitely. I mean, it looks it defensive line now doesn't look great. You know, coming away from twenty three, unless they bring in somebody that's a transfer portal guy. So, you know, that's just sort of been the way it is. It's. Uh, yeah, but, they, but the offensive line looked like that for a while. <laughs> and uh, they were able to get some guys like Gino Quinones and, um, you know, Jonah Monheim and some other guys that were three stars, and they, they got them playing pretty well. So, you know, player development, I mean, that's where it's at, player development. And, and they've, as I said before, they've gotten some of that out of Sean Nua. Like, you know, Stanley Ta'afu'u and uh, to Tyrone Telele. Those aren't like household names as defensive tackles, right? Um, Talele didn't do anything at K-State, and he actually played pretty well for USD last year. So you've got just guys that are, you know, their ceilings are pretty low, but they're they're bumping their heads up against them pretty hard. So Even Solomon Tuliapupu made some plays in the backfield this he, year. He played, and that was his first year playing defensive line, you know, moving over from inside linebacker. So, yeah, I, but I agree with you. Like, there's going to be some linebackers that they're going to lose. Uh, I know Romelo Height wants to get out of here. You know, Solomon Bird will be gone. We don't know what's going to happen with Corey Foreman. So uh, it could be a pretty balanced class next year. Just, again, just kind of like browsing over it, looking at it. Haven't really a- analyzed it very much. Um, and and the, the, the other issue is, you know, we talk about not really knowing what's available talent pool-wise in the portal. We also don't know who's going to jump into the portal, too. <laughs> you lose guys sometimes mm-hmm. that you think, oh, wow, I didn't, you know, we didn't think we were going to lose him. Uh Again, that's I think where the sort of the retention part of NIL comes in, and you got to have uh, your boosters and your people in line to help keep people uh, together. You know, keep keep teams together and keep the second team happy uh, with whatever. I mean, we've seen that with Alabama and Georgia. I mean, I know Alabama lost a lot of guys, and I'm sure maybe there was a couple guys in the the, the however many they lost. I don't, I don't know that number off the top of my head. Was it like nine or ten uh, transfers out? Chris, do you know off the top of your head? Portal? I can jump into the I can jump into the I'll jump into the portal right now. For uh I USC? To, I have to contact Ryan first though by for by written letter. For USC right now? No, I'm going into uh no, not for USC, for Alabama. Uh, I was gonna see how many guys that they lost. I, I'm not a fan of the way our portal is uh, set up here. It's, sometimes it's a little hard to get the information you want, but okay. While you look that up, I'm going to throw another question up from Millionaire Mindset. Wants to know, who do you think will be wide receiver one? Rice, Mario, Branch, Lemon, or Washington? I mean, I would say Dorian Singer would be the number one option for next season. He has the most experience, the most production. And, yeah, I think he's the big, bigger receiver, six foot one. We talked about it a little bit. I just think... He would be the number one with Taj up there, Rice up there. I think it'll take a little bit of time for Branch and Lemon to, to get up to speed, but they should be catching balls no problem early in the season. So, But I still think it's Dorian Singer or Bust for the number one position. Have you found out? Yeah, it's 19. 
19 guys. So uh, there's going to be some guys out of here, I'm sure. They've had 19 kids leave? Yes. Yeah. Who? Give me some names. They just lost Demoy Kennedy. Uh, he's going name. to Colorado. He was uh, four oh, star. Oh, yeah. I saw that. Okay. Yeah. I'm a little confused as to. Um, Tremez Marshall, another guy, high four star, 95 ranking, uh, rating out of high school. Um, Aaron Anderson is going to LSU. Uh, he's a wide receiver. JoJo Earl, who who I think is a guy that they would have liked to kept around a little bit, going to TCU. Uh, Christian Leary is another wide receiver going to Georgia Tech. Uh, Tommy Brockenmeyer, who didn't perform very well for them. I mean, he didn't play a lot. He was, a, he was I think, number one rated offensive tackle at one point for 24-7 sports. And so he's going to TCU. Uh, Damian George is, is going to uh, Florida. He was a somewhat highly ranked uh, guy coming out of high school. Um, he played, I know, for Alabama. I think he started some games for them. I know Javian Cohen was a guy that they lost that a lot of people liked. Um, he lost some time, had some issues going on, kind of interesting. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you there's guys like Treshawn Holden. There's a few guys on here, Kyrie Jackson, Trey Sanders, that they weren't losing sleep over. Like, there are uh, quite a few guys there. And, and Alabama has been, you know – doing a good job of keeping on the guys that they like. And and um, I think maybe offensively there's some frustration there and some guys that, you know, at the skill positions like Jojo Earl, they probably would have liked to kept around. But, yeah, I, I think the, the schools that are like Georgia and and the, the, the contenders, Ohio State, you're not seeing a bunch of transfers out, not, not usually of, of good players. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with Marvin Harrison Jr. We don't know. Wait, where did that come from? What? Oh my goodness! <laughs> You're just I just thought about all up to the frenzy. I just thought about Ohio State, and I, I was thinking about players that uh, you wouldn't want to lose. But I mean, re again, retention—it's just a big—it's just a big part of NIL. Like we all think about the recruiting aspect of it, but if look at Texas A&M, does that work? Is that a good working system? You you sign a historic class in 2022, and you have—I don't even know. I, there are countless amount of guys. That left uh, Texas A&M as, uh, as transfers out. I mean, not even a year into the program. That's That don't work. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33 players. 33 players uh, just browsing over now some of these guys you know there's a couple there's a kicker there's a punter uh but 20 i mean 33 guys yikes i don't know how many of that are from that 2022 class but uh oh you know what wait 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 time out time out okay chat i apologize i'm over here telling lies i'm counting the number of in and out here <laughs> these are some of these guys are. This is the list for guys. I thought I had the guys that the list of uh, the guys that are just leaving, but some of these are the guys that are actually uh, that are that are coming in as well. So that's an inaccurate number. That's that's more than I thought it was too. So. Well, I, I'm glad that you owned up to it and you. Uh... Well, I just realized it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that seems like a lot of uh, guys to to. To throw out there. What is the actual number? He's counting. He's counting. I'm gonna throw up another question. Twenty seven. So 27. it's still pretty so, freaking well, high. That's not even <laughs> super Yeah, it's still pretty high. It's uh That's it, still twenty five plus. They've only brought in a couple guys. I mean they did get uh, uh Tony Grimes, which we know USC was kind of involved with a little bit, um, that they were looking at, but uh yeah, they've they've lost a lot of good players, man. Kind of, you know, Devin Harris or Denver Harris, and like Anthony Lucas, um, you know, a couple other cornerbacks. Like, yeah, they've 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 lost a lot of dudes, and so you know, again, retention. It's uh, one of those things. Like, you can sign a really good recruiting class, but if you can't keep those guys on campus for more than a year, you know, that's not going to help your football team very much. Um, that's going to be very detrimental. So, you know, USC is trying to. Uh, trying to get themselves into a position where you, you, you know, it works itself out for the guys that are not contributing, that you don't have a lot of um, optimism for playing, 
and uh, the guys that you want that are just not playing a lot because you have depth at the position, you keep those guys happy. However it is, you keep those guys happy. But USC up to number two in the transfer rankings, so they're doing another good job. This might be our final question. We'll yep. see. If you bring – this is from Andrew. If you bring Riola in, could Nelson take that the wrong way? Ignorantly, if I came in ig- – Ignorantly, if I came in an immediate, if I came in as an immediate five star with recruited right after me, uh, I might be uncomfortable with that. Admittedly, I think would be more <laughs> than ignorantly, but um, you can't worry about that if you're USC. You stack. Yeah, you stack them. You stack them up. We talked about that with you know making excuses for not being able to sign Dylan Williams because you got Tackett Curtis. Okay, Tackett Curtis may be all world doesn't matter. Like, if you're playing for national championships, you got guys behind other guys. You know, you got to have players that can play and step up. And look at, you know, you've got injuries. And, and you get a guy like Eric Gentry that goes down. You don't have anybody who can come in and, you know, play at that level. You see the fall off and the performance. So, yeah, I think that that's, that's just of no concern. Like, Malachi Nelson is on campus now. Uh, recover. You know, get your get your shoulder right. And get ready to, to, to go out there and compete in 2024. Learn as much as you can from Caleb Williams. And you should be confident that with a whole year ahead of you, uh, or excuse me, ahead of the, the player that's coming in for the 2024 class, you win that job outright. You have no problem. No, 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 no issues. Uh, the, the only issue I would have uh, from that standpoint, uh, if I was Malachi Nelson, if USC had uh, a guy come in as a senior, that was like an all, you know, all American potential first round pick from another school. And then he comes in and you recruit over him. Then I could see some argument for, well, you know, you brought somebody in that, you know, has already been established and a starter at another school that's a really good player. And I haven't had my chance to get on the field and show what I could do in a the game. Then there's an argument. But for me, if you, you bring in Dylan Riola or DJ Lagway and they beat out uh, Mikhail Nelson, M- 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 Malachi, Malachi Nelson. Nelson. Uh, in 2024, that's that's on Nelson. That's not, you know, or or the same thing with Miller Moss. You know, if if Malachi comes in and beats out Miller Moss, well, you know, Miller Moss has had plenty of time to learn the offense and and, and impress the court, uh, the coaches. So, yeah, you can't think like that whatsoever as a coaching staff. You know, you have to continue to try to find a guy in the class that's, you know, after to be better than the guys that you got the class before. Like you're always trying to out recruit yourself, if you will. And with that, I think we're going to wrap up the second iteration of the 24 seven or the composite two star recruits Mm. live stream. I still have this Trader Joe's gift card to give away. We can give it away on the pod, the regular podcast too, right? I mean, do we have like to give it away? Well, here's what I was thinking. Just hear me out. I was thinking of giving it to Eddie. Eddie. Oh, who was <laughs> That's what I thought. You know, watching us from a emergency room hospital getting an EKG. Wait, 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 wait. That's our, that's that's which Eddie is that? Uh no, there's like three Eddies oh, okay. that listen to our show. <laughs> I thought you meant I thought you meant uh call in Eddie because he always calls in. Uh I'm talking about Eddie Rania Eddie who March. was uh you know, getting an EKG today. Watching us from the emergency room. Yep. Okay. I, I think you know just uh, I can I I've been in an emergency room you know late night and it freaking sucks. Yeah. So maybe just a little bit of a good fortune his way. I hope he's still in the chat. He was. He came back. But Eddie, please come back if you're here and I can claim <laughs> this to you. Otherwise, I'm just gonna scroll down the comments and Gerard's gonna. I'm gonna say, say Stop. no. Wait. I'm gonna say it goes to Eddie in orange because. He's been the OG of the podcast with his Collins. I think that's reasonable, right? I also think that's reasonable. But it has so to it's go a battle to Eddie. of Eddie's. It has to go to somebody named Eddie. <laughs> well, I'm waiting here for Eddie Reyna to uh, claim it. Otherwise, we'll fall back on the second Eddie, which sounds so bad to say out loud, to go to the second Eddie. But for the most part, I just want to thank everyone that tuned in. We held very strong at 600. And then 400 for the rest of the night. Thank you so much for staying up late with us. Yeah. Uh, it was a, on a Wednesday. Another, on a Wednesday, <laughs> another great show. 
Uh, I had a lot of fun. Thank you to all the donations that came in. Over three hundred dollars in donations. Thank you very much. Uh, guys. Money bags, Manford, just out here killing it uh, once again. Again, uh, almost five hour crew. Yeah, almost five hour crew. Wait, Eddie Reina equals Eddie from Orange. Is that true? Uh oh. Is that true? <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily trust chat on that. I don't know that they know it that well. Big T 37, I'm the real Eddie Rania. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. This will get figured out. This will get figured out at some point. Uh, I got to get one to Moneybags Manford. And I have these shirts if anyone wants one of these shirts. It's an extra L. Don't say you have these shirts. Anybody wants one of them like you have 50 shirts there. I have this shirt. <laughs> I said I would give this shirt away. I don't care. It's a shirt, not yeah. plural. A shirts. <laughs> a shirts. Come on, man. It's uh, it's uh, almost 11 o'clock. We've been going for Yeah, hours. and I got a nice drive home. You got a so. nice drive home. <laughs> we want to eat these cookies. Hashtag, I want to eat the cookie. They say 25 each for the Eddies. <laughs> so I cut it in half. <laughs> I was split. I can't. Up. I cut it in half. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that. I think it's a gift card, so I don't think you can. I don't think it's... It's not cash, guys. Okay. Eddie Rainier is not here anymore. I don't oh, see no. him. So we might have to hold it for the podcast to figure it out. Is Eddie R? Did Eddie R even show up? Do you have a 5XL? No, I don't think I have a 5XL. I don't think so. I'm going through the. I'm disappointed. Eddie can just drop VMs, and then he just like doesn't even watch the live stream. He doesn't uh, see our reaction live. He, he's on the he's on the parasol. I know he I know he's one of the few guys that is like I have a size XL here. Yeah, someone. I mean, if you if you really want this. What do you mean if you really want it? Of course you really want it. You are the one too. Early here early, went to his business meeting, he's back again. <laughs> if you really want this, you are the one too. I got this one's got your name on it. Not really, but this black one? Under Armour? Swivel.com. Don't use it to pose to get into events or whatever. <laughs> yeah, really. Can't do that. Can't do that. Find me on Twitter. You are the one too. Because I don't know how to contact anyone through YouTube. How do, how do I do that? <laughs> I don't know what this is. Oh, this is Gundam on the oh. parasol. Oh, okay. Eric? Did you just dox him? <laughs> <laughs> You yell at he's, me for he's like a old school guy. We all know who Gunnam is. Uh, will any will any of you? Where, be, wait, oh, you better ask what country that dude is in right now, because he you never know with him. He could be in freaking Somalia right now, or you are the one too. What country are you in? Right <laughs> yeah, now? He hitchhiked across uh, New Zealand. So, will any of you be at the seven on seven in Fontana this weekend? Quite a few USC targets. Maybe. Gerard has not had a great time with seven on seven in Fontana. <laughs> no, no, it's not true. Not Fon hey, Fontana. Don't he says it's yes, Eric. Don't say bad things about Fontana now. Uh, no, no, it's just uh, it's early in the year, man. It's early in the year, <laughs> and seven on is, um, you know, it's seven on. It's not real football. He's in Japan. Yep, that's what I thought. Well, so I have to shift it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I thought he was still in Japan, so. Ah, for Gunnam, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Or if you want the gold one, uh, I will wash it. Unless you don't want me to wash it, then I, <laughs> I can have some 10K. Is he the one that wanted you to sign He has it? a domestic address. Okay, oh, so okay. We'll, we'll, fig we'll figure this out. A domestic address. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> I guess it's like. You were the one, too, is the one who put the Trader Joe's card thing out there. So he should at least get something. So he's going to get a nice shirt. Uh, there you go. Eddie Rainia never got back, so I guess maybe it's going to. And Eddie R is not even Eddie from in, Orange, but he's not even in the chat. Uh, Renee Cortez, also XL. Renee Cortez, I have. You can have one of these two as well. Sure. Uh, question: So got love for Coach Gerard? <laughs> I got love for Coach. It's officially 18k. Okay, Renee, find me on Twitter if you're on the Peristyle. Are you, DM me. Are you on 18K now? Yeah, I'm on 18K. Wow. It makes sense now. Where are you at? Who knows? <laughs> Not on Twitter. 
Okay. We're wrapping it up. Let's I want to eat this delicious cookie. Again, if you're interested in the shirts, DM me on social media, Twitter. Find me. Find me. <laughs> and I'll sort out with this second gift card, I guess. We'll figure it out. Uh, but thank you again to everyone that joined the, the stream. Hashtag shout out, especially to the four-hour crew, everyone that was here for the four-plus hours, plus the delay we had at the beginning. No shame on Gerard. It's okay. <laughs> Traffic from the IE. I get it. I get it. We've Literally all been there. The 91 freeway. We've all been there. So Hashtag I hope we can do this again. Freeway. I don't know when the next time we'll do it again, but we should do another live stream at some point. Will it be four hours? I don't know. But we'll Could do it be an- four golden hours for the four golden hours of... June? If there's a big official visit weekend, that, that the only problem with that is I gotta like get on the phone and like call dudes and <laughs> try to actually have updates, which you know is kind of precedes doing the show. But you know, someone said we should start streaming on Twitch. We gotta have some other form of entertainment and not us just talking. If we maybe if they come out with the NCAA football game or whatever, that's the show. That's the show. We do the podcast where we play each other in NCAA. Football. I would re- I would like to just run like what I used to do. I'm gonna show you what a nerd I am. As I used to build the Army All American teams and the Under Armour teams, and I would just sim them against each other Damn. to just see how the attributes played out and like who like who stood out. And it was it was interesting. You sometimes had guys. I, I remember Giovanni Bernard from UNC who went down to play for the Bengals. I believe ended up being such a good player. And he was only a three-star out of, I think, St. Thomas Aquinas and was one of those guys that um, in the sim always did well. Like, he was always standing out. I'm like, dang. And and, in hindsight, he ended up being very good. So I was like, hmm, maybe the the computer knew something that, you know, the the national analyst didn't know. Uh, Krogi92 says, drive safe, Gmart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. We are going to get out of here, Millionaire Mindset. What game are you guys looking forward to the most? Probably Oregon game. Never been to Autzen. And I've never been to Notre Dame, so getting to see that game will be fun. So those are probably the two on my list. USC got to beat Oregon. Got to beat Oregon. Got to beat Oregon. Beat them on the field before you beat them in recruiting. As Gmart says. So I am Chris. That is Hurricane. Damn it. I, I fucked it up. That is Hurricane. We have been Composite Two Star Recruits live We will catch you next time. Uh, And as always...